Chapter One of Find the Woman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Find the Woman by Gillette Burgess. Chapter One Prologue in which is explained how an architectural draughtsman came to possess three sets of names before he was twenty-one and how a portrait disturbed him who was belle charmion if you really care to know as john fenton did you must go with him on his quest hither and yon over new york into strange houses and through side streets at midnight a shuttle in the secret loom of fate weaving in and out through many coloured threads until the pattern of the mystery is made clear for the warp of his strange adventurous career love and beauty and diamonds for the woof some few cross currents of crime and misery there in brief is the web of his drama so if you ask for such diversion the narrative must perforce begin with a prelude that you may make acquaintance with the hero and see what manner of youth and temperament sped him on his way to explain why an engineer's draughtsman of no especial talent should at twenty-one have already had three sets of names the review of his history should be divided into five epochs the first a prehistoric era that of his babyhood was in his memory a mere blur of confused faded pictures amongst which stood out one vivid sharp recollection a scene on a ferry-boat swept by keen brisk winds cool under a watery spring sun he was playing on deck with a little yellow-haired girl under the careless supervision of two indefinite elders with a small boy's insistence he was teasing his companion clutching at a gold heart-shaped locket with a white star which hung about her neck she pulled away from him the chain broke and she ran crying to her guardian leaving the locket in his hands the second epoch that of his childhood between the ages of four and eight was somewhat more clear in his mind although there were many gaps he could never account for he was living in south boston and now his name was michael o'shea his scarlet hair had gained for him amongst the children of his street the easy soubriquet of ready and at first he had not consented to the name without many savage protests living with an uncle and an aunt the o'sheas hard by the blind asylum his life was a street urchin's career of conflict and roving with intermittent enforced sessions at the primary school he roamed from the point to the dover street bridge he knew the docks to the last pile from the land and from the water he felt too often the missile of an opponent gang a snowball enclosing a rock of his lineage he heard only that his mother had been a mill-hand in fitchburg and that his father had died at sea this information embroidered by diverse details which little by little he perceived as lies was always told him with winks and smiles as if concealed within their falsehoods was some consummate joke he grew tired of questioning finally and brooded sullenly over the puzzle of his birth when he was eight years old the o'sheas with a shiny black valise and a paper-covered trunk moved to new york they took two rooms in a tenement on the east side a place of multitudinous fire escapes waving blankets screaming children and dented ash barrels but in that place ready o'shea was not to stay long the day after moving in while mrs o'shea was unpacking the trunk and mangus o'shea was shaving at a broken triangle of mirror stuck in the window the boy's eyes caught a shiny something in an open cardboard box in wonder with a queer sickish feeling of recognition he stooped down and took it a little golden heart with a star of white stones on the cover strange memories as if of a long-forgotten dream stirred him uneasily as he handled it 
the next moment he was knocked down by a violent cuff on the ear and mangus o'shea stood over him his small reddish eyes blazing ugly with anger his snarling lips parted revealing a broken row of little black teeth horribly distinct in the middle of his lathered face look at what you've done now he exclaimed to his wife after four years av hidin and pullin the wool over his eyes it'll be your fault now if he begins to prick up his ears why didn't she lock it up from him he turned to the boy and shook a great scarred hairy fist if i catch you snoopin round after things again i'll break every rib in your body and mind ye that he struck ready again viciously to enforce the warning and returned to his shaving no sooner had he turned his back than the boy slipped out ran down the narrow dirty stairs of the tenement and was out on the street he hurried down town as fast as his legs would carry him there followed two days of wandering starvation cold he crossed the brooklyn bridge and lost himself in a wilderness of narrow streets with rows of dreary-looking houses when dr hopbottom found him he was only half conscious the third epoch that of his adolescence was the wretchedest of all a household drudge enslaved by mrs hopbottom for domestic assistance washing dishes sweeping cooking a hundred other degradingly feminine tasks which went even to sewing and darning the doctor's woollen socks joe hopbottom as he was now called almost forgot that he was a boy he lived in squalor gnawing scraps in the kitchen scolded by mrs hopbottom continually and continually preached at by the doctor a hoary old hypocrite whose face joe loathed the doctor's favorite occupation was to lecture the boy on the simple life plain living and high thinking joe he would say his cheeks bulging with mince pie or suet pudding don't make your belly your god as he shoveled in loaded knife folds of hot pork the doctor's face was greasy with exuding fat his hands were pudgy manners make the man joe not clothes he often said to his miserable ragged ward as he strung a heavy gold watch chain across his embroidered waistcoat i think that suit of yours will do another year with a little brushing and so it went the doctor did not drink or swear he had all the virtues of the pharisees including a goat's beard but for every worldly vice he had an efficient substitute instead of alcohol he used coffee with an equally stimulating effect injecting it under his skin till he was as yellow as a moor in the place of profanity he made use of highly original but perfectly adequate diction composed of scientific terms to poor terrified joe this jargon seemed worse than any oaths sanctified by custom you toxo leucocyte he would exclaim to the boy what do you want to make a fennel tri brom propionic hypotenuse of yourself for to such mysterious apostrophes joe could make no answer only once did he see mangus o'shea that was when he went to new york with a doctor to attend the meeting of a committee investigating the white slave traffic they were walking up the bowery the doctor absorbed in the theatrical posters when the irishman passed them he stopped and stared joe turning around fearfully to see if he had been observed caught o'shea's eager red eyes upon him he clung to the doctor's hands and urged him forward dr hopbottom reluctantly resumed his journey at the next stand bearing the picture of pulchritude's picherino burlesquers the boy turned round and saw that o'shea had followed at canal street he was lost in the crowd joe dreamed of him for seven nights running but then a new interest diverted his thoughts rummaging in the dusty attic one day while mrs hopbottom was at her sewing circle 
joe discovered some old numbers of the studio left by a lodger and between his washings and his darnings he pored over wonderful photographs of paintings and sculpture hiding the book under the eaves when he went back to work at night when he had a few moments to himself he copied the pictures with pencil patiently lovingly abominably the hop bottoms did at least permit him an education and he had almost finished his course at the high school before the crash came the studio and a boy in his own class brought on the crisis his friend was a member of a private life class which rented a studio on tuesday and thursday evenings hired an inexpressibly ugly model and drew therefrom in charcoal the class was composed mainly of architects ambitious draughtsmen and with his friend's influence joe was permitted to join finding money for paper and charcoal and board seemed at first impossible but the sale of old rags and bottles filched from the hop bottom cellar at last sufficed for the purchase of his material and the men allowed him to attend for a while gratis the boy was already a personable good-natured youth and soon became popular his explanation of his absence was that he was attending a bible class at the y m c a his industry was great if not his talent by the time he was sixteen years old a fat roll of terrible studies from the nude was hidden away in the attic joe had become so enthusiastic in the pursuit of art that he had almost forgotten the chaste point of view of the philistines dr hopbottom still preached asceticism for others gesticulating with his pie and still his fat increased still he preached the simple life the renunciation of the flesh the temptation of the senses one night joe and his friend left a vaudeville theatre in shocked disgust at the row of vulgar half-clad females who were performing a suggestive burlesque as he went out he saw dr hopbottom's unctuous grinning face in the audience his eyes devouring the charms of the actresses it was the next morning the explosion came mrs hopbottom climbing upstairs for a spring cleaning discovered joe's charcoal studies from the nude there was a hysterical tumult lightnings of her flashing eye thunder of her expostulation a storm of tattered charcoal drawings joe put his head through the doorway to find the cause of her temper with his ear in one hand and the sole survivor of his sketches as a sample of sin in her other the lady stalked into the doctor's study his wrath was sublime moral precepts sermonettes warnings prayers reproaches quotations from the bible timothy four twelve leviticus twenty six twenty seven to twenty nine he invoked pictures of future torment and made a closer inspection of the drawing he put it away carefully in his desk waving his wife's itching fingers aside and invoked heaven raising his eyebrows joe could stand it no longer told pithily of the previous evening's vaudeville horrors it was prayer-meeting night then left the doctor and his blazing spouse to fight it out together he packed a few clothes with deliberation and walked calmly happily back across the brooklyn bridge he was free a great peace was in his soul halfway across he wafted a gorgeous resolution forth upon the breeze the loathly name of hopbottom sailed from his body never to return stealing a new one from the first theatrical billboard he passed he entered new york as john fenton so began his youth we may pass lightly over the next five years of his life he had been trained to take hard knocks he had industry and a savor of humor he made his way some of his draughtsman friends busied themselves for him and he soon found a position as an office-boy for a firm of architects 
between his petty duties he practised lettering copied the orders made blueprints and tracings what he lacked in genius he made up in determination and at the age of twenty-one he earned eighteen dollars a week and by frugality and a cheap harlem lodging-house saved the half of it the red of his hair had toned to a deep auburn gymnasium work long walks and simple living had improved his looks till many a girl's eyes gave him a second glance as he passed he had even in his obscurity the habits of a gentleman and a way of wearing his ready-made clothes that took off the curse of cheapness his landlady was wont to gossip over his charms and his aristocratic manners she let many a room on the strength of them once five or six years after he had escaped from brooklyn he came upon dr hopbottom in a penny arcade the doctor was looking into a moving picture machine bearing the legend the story of an artist's model he was turning the crank slowly very slowly something arrested his attention he looked up with a guilty face good morning said john affably wondering why he had ever feared the senile old fool you correlated dimorphic appendix you what are you doing some blastodermic corollarious mischief i suppose the doctor tried to look dignified oh i'm going in for architecture i see you're at your old game though said john and giving him a withering smile passed on and so at last we come to the picture which inaugurated john fenton's fifth epoch lucky for men that all have not the same tastes lucky for men that each chooses his own type of beauty lucky that no one woman can please all men else every woman might be a helen of troy and war would rage amongst men over her everlastingly unlucky for melton's magazine however that there were not more john fentons to mob the newsstands and buy up a certain edition of that periodical comparatively few men perhaps would call the girl's face pretty most at least would turn the page with small regret but to john fenton the sight of that face was the starting of many emotions in that glance he achieved maturity his youth ended on page two hundred twelve manhood began at page two hundred thirteen he came across the magazine in a friend's studio and not daring to confess how much the picture affected him he sought a chance cut out the page and concealed it under his coat it showed the face of a girl of perhaps twenty years with soft parted hair rolling away from her forehead eyes wide apart under level brows and a smiling mouth at once demure and whimsical so much for the outward aspect beauty however is subjective in john fenton's mind something responded as to a message the secret call of a subconscious desire potent as a magic charm to win that girl he would have ploughed across arctic snows fought his way through tropical jungles chanced peril war or pestilence so much he resolved at first glance when he got the page safely home he smoothed out its wrinkles and studied it perturbed and trembling by a sorry trick of chance some one cutting a paragraph from the opposite side of the page had deleted the name of the girl not till he had had the portrait on his wall for a week not till a new element had begun to creep into its attraction for him did he realize that he had been a fool not to look at the magazine and see its name and date that he might procure an undisfigured copy it was now impossible to trace it and the girl must remain unnamed as he studied it day by day its charm grew more potent something more than the girl's mere physical attraction moved him the romance and mystery of the face became more and more magnetic at first vague and troublesome it at last absorbed him 
it seemed to promise some hidden meaning for him alone the talk of a theosophical fellow-worker at his office began to simmer in his brain had he perchance known this girl in some previous life were their destinies linked had they made karma together in such wise he mused at times the strain on his imagination grew so tense that he would put the picture away and busy himself with prosaic projects some competition for courthouse or pergola but the lady did not long hide her face back she came to his wall again now as expensively framed as a dry point a le etching and again john fenton's thoughts roved on the wings of romance end of chapter one chapter two of find the woman this librivox recording is in the public domain find the woman by gillette burgess chapter two the house of the fortune teller how john fenton went down town without an object and became involved in a picturesque adventure with a certain strange lady john fenton returned from the office one april evening and as usual gazed long at the picture he went out with the spell still upon him it charmed him even in the heated sordid commonplace atmosphere of the cheap restaurant where he habitually dined aforetimes he had held interrupted jocose intercourse with milly his favorite waitress but of late milly's charms had faded he had begun to notice that her hands and ears were large after his small squat cup of adulterated boiled coffee he took a subway express to times square and as was his wont wandered down broadway into the splendor of modern babylon new york was waking up to its perfervid night life the electric signs blazed convulsively throwing spasms of red and white and green against the darkling sky the taxicabs grew nervous hurried searching here and there like roaches in a dirty kitchen the women of the shadow began to emerge into the glare overtly stalking their prey john fenton still wrapped in his dream walked on unregarding like a machine at the opera house he waked up enough to take his accustomed place in a shy corner to watch the influx of wealth and fashion he had a new measure for their grace and beauty now and as they entered one by one they failed once he had a sudden clutching gasp of surprise as a girl passed him cool and imperious in her long cloak of chinchilla he stared at first he wildly thought his time had come and she was the girl of the picture but she turned full upon him and he saw her mouth was selfish cruel false he turned and walked downtown trembling and after a while passed still dreaming into a side street to escape the crowd he had not gone far when his idly roving eyes encountered a sign on a door reading madame oswald palmist and medium he stopped and stared at it curiously why not for once seek that vulgar shrine consult the oracle and illumine his fate life of late while seeming duller of fact had to his fancy become suddenly stimulated that fancy must be fed a mere portrait could no longer satisfy him he was in a mood for romance and here was one of romance's immemorial priestesses he slowly ascended the steps rang the bell waited a negro servant opened to him and led him into a front parlor lighted by a single lamp on a table he sat down already embarrassed upon an uncomfortable red plush sofa and gazed fascinated at a huge painted panel on the opposite wall whereon some audacious amateur had copied some wearied professional's conception of francesca da rimini and her lover the black eyes of the heroine held him till madame oswald appeared massive blonde swathed in a purple gown there were the usual preliminaries madame's quick close scrutiny appraising him at a glance an attempt to secure a full life reading at double the ordinary price the production of a velvet pad upon which his hand should rest and the drone of prophecy began 
she prodded his palm with a little ivory pointer noted extraordinary lines stars and mounts and brought forth her three inevitable themes the gentleman was of a strangely sensitive nature and was much misunderstood he was worried over something and didn't know quite what to do he had intuition psychic power mediumship but it was undeveloped a course of developing seances now at five dollars a week would bring out unexpected powers no well then let him ask a question she leaned back and closed her eyes fenton watched her bulky satin chest heave heavily as she breathed her large placid face with its one hairy mole fascinated him then the picture came into his mind and he asked in a whisper who is she who is she she repeated as if to some spirit guide her voluminous bust expanded in a gasp she quivered rolled her head and finally answered i see the letters b c she opened her eyes suddenly and shot at him ain't that right darned if i know he replied at that she plucked up courage and went on without hesitation b c she repeated it's bell or blanche or bessie i ain't sure which but she's in your life current and she's attracting you her way yes yes you're going to marry her and marry with money too i ain't sure if it's hers or yourn but look out for one thing and that's a man with a split ear don't you trust him is they anything else you wanted to know fifty cents please fenton never paid the fee for no sooner had she spoken than with a terrified expression she jumped up and ran to the window she turned back to him a large white anguished face my god the police they're a goin to pull me she began to pluck at her breast and moan fenton rose beginning to be frightened himself what the devil's the matter he grabbed up his hat and his coat oh i knew they was a roundin up the mediums and palmists this week she cried but i come across with my tax to the captain all right only last tuesday and he swore they'd never touch me this means a hundred dollars out for me and i ain't got ten say kid you get out quick or they'll hold you for a witness i don't want no more evidence than i can help hurry for god's sake get out through the back parlor there even as she spoke the front door bell rang and the handle was rattled to enforce the summons fenton did not stay to see the issue but ran in between the folding doors to a room cluttered by feminine garments in scandalous disorder he opened a door into the hall but on the instant heard the officers entering he could not escape that way if he could not find some other exit he would be caught like a rat in a trap he darted to the window and saw a fire escape landing out he climbed the back yard showed no feasible route of egress he ran up the iron ladder peered into a window tried it and found it locked then hurried up to the next floor here the window was opened and the room lighted he glanced in and gave a suppressed cry of surprise stooping down to the floor a woman dressed in russian sables was gathering into a travelling bag by handfuls a profusion of gems that scattered upon the carpet made the place a miracle by the vivid flashes of red blue yellow and green that dazzled his eyes there must have been in all some two hundred precious stones set and unset rings bracelets necklaces pins and pendants where there was not the prismatic fire of precious stones there was the dull sheen of gold for the most part the jewels lay in a puddle of gorgeous colour but spattered from this all over the floor single sparks of radiant light twinkled as if a rainbow had exploded in the room and lay in splendid fragments as he stood there transfixed the woman turned caught sight of his white face and screamed with a sudden movement she threw herself full length upon the floor like a hen trying to protect her chicks at the approach of a hawk fenton was too astonished to think of his own peril too astonished even to speak it was the woman who broke the silence who are you for god's sake she moaned still fenton stared aghast inarticulate are you a burglar his tongue loosened at last 
The house is raided. The police are downstairs. They've got Madame Oswald. What in heaven's name does all this mean? She paled. She faltered. Then, with a shocked face, arose and stood with her hand to her head as if panic-stricken. Fenton got a good look at her now and saw that she was beautiful, with a piquant, eager face, exquisite scarlet lips, and deep brown eyes suffused with tears. Her skin had an olive cast, and her hair was dark. Altogether she was unlike any woman he had ever seen, an exotic type with a sensuous prettiness made delicate, refined by great intelligence. Was she oriental? There was at least something tropical about her beauty. It was too vivid, too moving for an Anglo-Saxon. She had stood staring at him, thinking intently. Now she darted to the window and laid a gracile hand upon his arm. As she looked sharply into his face, she spoke under her breath. You look honest and brave. Will you help me? I have not a moment to lose if the police are in the house. Quick! Without waiting an answer, she dragged him over the window sill into the room. Before he had collected his wits, she was scrabbling the jewels from the floor and loading them into his pockets. I swear I am innocent of any crime, she exclaimed passionately, as she gathered a handful of diamonds, rubies, and emeralds from the floor and dropped them into his overcoat pocket. You've got to help me out. There is no one else to save me, and the honor of a great family. She ran to the door, listened, and returned with compressed lips to stoop for more jewels. They dripped from her fingers as she rose, great drops of iridescent color, the hues of blood and poison, to be gathered again in her little hands. All I want is that these things should be restored to their rightful owner. Why, if the police find them here, it will be awful. I can never explain. A terrible scandal will come out. Again she scraped up her hands full, chains of fire opals, brooches of carved emeralds, topazes and sapphires, a tiny enameled watch, a half-dozen rings, dazzling with rubies. Already his inside pockets were full, the stones pressed hard against his sides. She opened the flaps of his outside pockets and thrust in more gems. Don't ask any questions. There's no time. I hope to God you can get away safe. You must do your best. I am being followed, but they won't suspect you. Now then, be quick. By this time the last jewel was concealed, and Fenton, his coat bulging with the treasure, stood before her, pale and trembling with excitement. Just then there came a noise from the stairway, a bang upon the hall door. Out the window, she hissed. Get away somehow, for heaven's sake, and meet me at Sheffel Hall and wait till I come. In another instant she had hustled him out on to the fire escape, shut the window behind him, and turned off the gas. As he climbed the next flight of iron steps out of sight, he heard the pounding on the door grow louder. Someone was shouting for her to open. End of chapter 2「Find the Woman」by Gillette Burgess. Chapter 3. Sheffel Hall. How our hero, in the pursuit of his adventure, met at his rendezvous a friend of his youth, and heard a tale of jewels and horror. So up Fenton went with his heart pumping, obstructed by his overcoat, gained the next landing, and looked about for a means of escape. Three or four feet away from him the roof of an L stood, its flat roof level with his landing. With no definite plan of escape he jumped across the opening, landed upon the gravel roof and hurried along, dodging under telephone wires to where another roof rose a few feet higher. Up this he scrambled and looked about. There was a trap door a few yards away. He made his way to it, tried it, and found it unlocked. Lifting it, he gazed down into a black hole. At first he could see nothing, but as his eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, he made out a ladder leading down. With terror in his soul, he cautiously groped his way to the foot, bumped his head, felt about for a door, opened one, and found himself, to his immense relief, in the upper hallway of an apartment house. 
Here he paused for a moment to regain his breath and his courage. There was nothing for it but to descend boldly and trust his luck not to be observed. He got down the first flight in safety, meeting no one, but at the next landing was suddenly confronted by a young girl coming up. She started in surprise, eyed him keenly, but said nothing. He felt her eyes upon him as he went down. In the lowest hall a negro lad was dozing at a telephone desk. He did not move. Fenton opened the front door. The boy waked, caught sight of him, and shouted something. Fenton hurried out, not daring to run, got down the front steps with his pulse quickened to fever speed, and turned toward Broadway. One glance over his shoulder showed the patrol wagon still standing at the door of Madame Oswald's a few houses away, and by the opposite curb was a shabby coupé with its driver on the box watching the excitement. Men were running up to the scene of the raid. One large, pompous-looking man jostled Fenton and nearly knocked him down. But at last he was free of the crowd and walked south, his hands in his pockets, his fingers burrowing in the diamonds. Judging the lights of Broadway safer than dark side streets, he kept down to the Flatiron building, and then, looking suspiciously to right and left, crossing the street whenever he saw a pedestrian approaching, he zigzagged to Fourth Avenue and gained Eighteenth Street. Once a bedizened woman accosted him with a wheedling voice. Once a shabby loafer hailed him, requesting money for a cup of coffee. Up against it, sir. Can't get work. Nothing to eat for two days. Fenton did not reply. The burden of his treasure was a horror and a menace. It seemed as if he would never reach the restaurant. But at last he entered the swinging doors and sat down at a table with a sigh of relief. Here was respite for a while, till the woman should arrive, if she ever did arrive. What if she did not? He ordered beer and pretzels and took up a copy of the Fliegende Blätter to distract his thoughts. The German letters danced on the page. The pictures had no meaning. Then, seeing a ragged copy of Melton's on the table, he took it up. It was a tired-looking old magazine, half the pages torn, spotted with eggs and gravy, having evidently been left in the restaurant by some patron, and read to death by subsequent guests. He turned the pages listlessly, his mind on other things than storiettes or descriptive articles. But when he came to the pages of Fair Women he stopped suddenly at a half-page. It was the desecrated portrait of the girl his wonderful girl with the whimsical smile and the level eyebrows. His heart stopped, then he glanced at the caption under the half-tone. Half of it was gone. What remained read as follows. Miss Bell C. H., one of the season's most. Bell C. H., it was maddening. Then in a flash he recalled the fortune-teller's prediction. What was it Madame Oswald had said? B. C., Bell or Blanche or Bessie. She's in your life current. You're going to marry her, and marry with money. Strange how the girl pursued him. Would fate indeed bring them together? He cut out the half-page and put it in his pocket. There was no time to muse upon this fancy. His present situation was too compelling. He resumed his lookout for the mysterious woman who had promised to meet him. He had been there a scant half-hour when he saw her enter the door and give a quick glance about the room. Seeing Fenton, she walked smiling toward his table. "'Thank God you got here all right,' she said as she sat down. "'I had a narrow escape myself. The police came in, but found no evidence to hold me. I told them I was rooming in the house and knew nothing. All the same, I have been followed, and I daren't take the gems. You will have to help me further.' see here said fenton i've had enough of this it's a little too suspicious for me and i don't care to get into trouble with the police it's not the police you have to fear most she exclaimed who is it then he demanded nervously won't you help me she shot a languishing look at him surely she was beautiful but her beauty had a savage note in it it was the beauty of a tigress there was strange electric force in her glance in her mysterious smile I won't help you till you tell me what it all means, was his answer. 
She kept her gaze on him steadily, and spoke as if to herself. I hardly know how to tell you. It's such a great responsibility. A family's good name is in your power. But I must have help. Still she stared at him. Fenton turned away his head, embarrassed. He was upon the point of refusing her outright, handing over the jewels and making his escape back into the peace of commonplace things. There was something sinister about it all. It was too dangerous. As he looked abstractedly toward the door, it opened and a man entered. Fenton felt his blood run cold. Who was the man? At first he did not know, and yet there was something familiar about him in his furtive walk rather than his face which stirred vague memories the man passed gave a blank stare at fenton and fenton recognized him it was mangus o'shea with whom he had lived in south boston whom he had always been told was his own uncle the man had grown old but by the small reddish eyes and the broken black teeth fenton knew him indubitably as the Irishman passed, it was as if a chill wind had swept after him, making Fenton shiver with apprehension. At this look at O'Shea, the first for so many years, Fenton saw him as a cruel and an evil thing, a man to shun and dread. It was as if his own subconscious mind had been for years pondering a problem and needed but this encounter to fan hidden coals of thought into a fierce flaming idea. He was sure now that O'Shea was not his uncle, sure that the Irishman knew the secret of his birth, had done him some fearful wrong, perhaps. His look was criminal. Fenton, with his pockets sagging with precious stones, felt his peril increase every minute. If the woman opposite him had noticed the episode, she did not show it. Her eyes were still on him, but her thoughts seemed far away. Now she appeared to awake and cast some horrid apprehension from her. She leaned forward and touched his hand. Listen, she said, I'm going to tell you why and how much I need you. If you have any chivalry in your nature, you cannot refuse me. With this preamble she began her story, The Dead Fair. I am going to make you my confidant in two secrets. One, my lovers, I hope never to divulge. The other is my own. I hoped to keep that forever also, but it doesn't matter now. I have negro blood in my veins. I am an octoroon. Will that kill your sympathy? I hope not, but I have to tell you. It will explain everything. Perhaps you have noticed it already. Have you suspected me under my powder, under my wig, this horrible thing that I've worn so long? Well, my lover never suspected it. I know. Perhaps he wouldn't have cared if he had. I like to think so, for he loved me. Gordon Brewster rescued me from hell. Do you know what it means to have negro blood in your veins mixed with white? To have sensibility, refinement? Surely I have that, and to be forever outside the pale? I can mingle freely with neither my own people nor yours. One sort is too low, the other too high for me. I have a college education. I studied for four years at Tuskegee Institute. After that I tried to teach. Then for three years I was alone in New York, seeing almost no one. I write special stories for the papers, never going near the offices, and supporting myself fairly well. I have a little apartment on East 33rd Street with a colored maid. I am afraid of any other. It doesn't matter how I met Gordon Brewster. There is no need of your knowing. That part of my life is sacred. But in spite of everything, we fell in love. Can you imagine what that meant to me? A man like him, a gentleman? It was a dream come true. It was a fairy tale. Can you see how I hid my secret, my shame? I think that my soul is as white as... Well, never mind. I couldn't tell Gordon. How could I risk it? I was so happy. I was sure of his love, but I was afraid of something stronger than himself, some instinct, some inevitable revulsion of race feeling. I didn't know how it would end. I didn't care, only that I resolved never to marry him, unless... I wonder if I could have told him. Well, it's too late now. All I have now is his honor to protect and cherish. The happiness of knowing him 
was all I ever had. We walked all that three years on the edge of a precipice that he never saw. I saw it always. He had plenty of money, at first. It was all I could do to prevent his spending it all on me. No one ever knew, no one ever talked about us, no one at least except an intimate friend of his, Harry Hay. Mr. Brewster had a string of race horses, no other business, the family is old and rich. He put all his money into his stable and lost steadily. If I had known of it in time, I might have saved him, but it was not to be. Last evening, at about half-past seven o'clock, when I was dressing for the evening, the doorbell rang, and Eliza, my maid, came in to tell me that Mr. Brewster had come. It was so early I had not expected him for some time yet. I told Eliza to show him into my little parlor while I completed my toilet. As she helped me with my dressing, I heard him tramping up and down the room and wondered at it. Before I had finished, he knocked on my door and called out to me to hurry. His voice was so harsh and excited that it alarmed me. I threw my things on hurriedly and ran in. He was terribly excited. He told me to get rid of Eliza. He wanted to talk to me alone. So I sent her away, and he walked nervously up and down till she had left. Then he came up to me and took both my hands in his. Get your things packed up at once, he said enough to travel with at least. I am going to marry you right away. We are going to take the train to New Orleans tonight, and then by a fruit steamer for Central America. I am dished. No, I didn't cry. It was too critical a situation. I thought then that the time had come when I would have to tell him my secret. Oh, he had asked me to marry him scores of times. I had always been able to put him off with an indefinite answer. I couldn't bear to lose him, but I was determined not to be his wife until I had confessed what I was. But now I saw he was as determined as I. I said, What has happened, Gordon? Then he told me, told me what I dread to tell you, only, of course, you see, then I didn't understand how awful it was. He was ruined. His favorite filly had cost him every cent he had in the world, and he owed money everywhere. He had even... I don't think I need tell you all of it. Perhaps that can be covered up, too. At any rate, he was desperate. Nothing would do but for us to be married that night and get away before he was arrested. Think of it. The temptation to be alone with him, his wife, sure of one friend forever. But the cost. I couldn't do it. How could I think of his losing his honor, his good name? I don't know what I said, but I refused. I told him that he couldn't marry me, that he must stay and face his trouble, stay and make a fight for it. Then, when he was square with the world, if he chose, I would be his wife. Wasn't I right? I loved him too much. I never had time to finish. You see, he had brought two pieces of luggage with him. One was a suitcase, the other a smallish traveling bag. Before I had ended my talk, he was fumbling in the bag. I didn't realize what he was doing till he had pulled out a revolver. His look was horrible. He could hardly speak through his passion, but he cried out, Well, if I can't have you, I'll end it all now. Then he pulled the trigger, shot himself in the temple. I fainted on the floor beside him. The next thing I knew, the bell was ringing. I don't know how long it had been ringing. It was some time before I could get up, and it kept ringing persistently, horribly. It wouldn't stop ringing. I shut my ears to it, hoping whoever was there would go away. But the bell kept on ringing. Can you hear it? Gordon, dead on my parlor floor, and the bell ringing. God, I can hear it yet. Ringing. I managed to open the door part way, a crack, and saw Harry Hay, Gordon's best friend, the only one who knew of our friendship. For God's sake, he said, is Gordon here? He pushed past me. I couldn't answer. He got into the parlor and saw. I sat down on the sofa and began to cry then. It was such a relief to have somebody there. I couldn't look. Gordon was dead, sure enough. There was no doubt about it. He felt of Gordon's heart and closed his eyes. Then he told me Gordon had been to see him yesterday to borrow money. Harry Hay didn't have it, and not knowing how serious it was, had refused. 
Then afterward, hearing a few things about Gordon's affairs, he had raised a few thousands in a hurry and had come to offer it to him, knowing Gordon would be at my place. Think of it. Ten minutes too late. Wasn't it ironic? Harry was a good friend, God knows. Harry Hay was wonderful. What I would have done alone, I don't know. Of course, the suicide itself was awful enough, but for Gordon to be found in my room, in the room of an octoroon, think of the scandal. It would be terrific. Then there were Gordon's debts, his dishonesty. It couldn't be. I pled with Harry to find some way out. Then we discovered the jewels, and we understood how far poor Gordon had fallen. They were in the traveling bag which she had opened to take the pistol from. It was half full. The Brewster jewels, thousands of dollars worth of them. Gordon had taken them from the family safe. He had the combination, and his parents were away from home, in Europe, or rather, they were expected back any day. Well, we talked it over. What could we do? I took a dose of strychnia, and it braced me up. Finally, Harry thought of a plan. There's a hack stand round the corner, he said. I'll go round there and see if I can jolly the driver into renting his carriage. If I can, perhaps we can make it. If not, the thing will have to come out. It's our only chance, anyway. So he left to try it. I locked the door behind him and went into my room and lay on my bed thinking. You can imagine how my mind worked. I could see Gordon lying on the floor as plainly as if I were in that room with him. Hours seemed to go by before Harry Hay rang the bell. When I opened the door, I didn't know him at first. I was terrified. He had on a cab driver's smelly coat and old high hat, borrowed, I don't know how. I believe he told the cabby it was a practical joke. He told me to get on my hat and coat and wait for him in my room. He went into the parlor. Once he came to my door and asked for warm water and towels. Then he returned for cotton wool. Oh, God, I didn't dare ask him what for. The third time he knocked, he told me that everything was ready. I gulped down a drink of brandy, clenched my teeth, and went in. I wish I could ever forget what I saw. Gordon was huddled on the sofa. His hat and gloves were on. He seemed to be asleep. His head was turned away. The hole in his temple was filled with cotton. I felt myself fainting again went to the bathroom and dashed my face with water, then returned. Harry had the hall door open. Well, we got the body downstairs somehow, one supporting each arm. I held Gordon while Harry looked out to see if there was anyone who might see. Then we carried him into the cab. We got the body on to the seat, and I followed and sat down and held it up. Then Harry ran upstairs for the suitcase and bag, threw them into the floor of the cab, got on the box, and we drove off. Was there ever such a drive, I wonder? Past the Waldorf Astoria, past Sherry's and Delmonico's, in and out through a stream of automobiles and carriages. The body lurched and swayed. Once it fell on the floor, I had to lift him up. Past the cathedral, the great hotels at the plaza, and then we plunged into the park. It was cool and dark, my last ride with Gordon Brewster, the last time I would touch his hand. It was the last service I would ever do for him, I thought. But there is still another. You must help me. Can you have the heart to refuse after this? Gordon had lived alone in the Brewster house on 72nd Street with nobody but an old caretaker. Flint, his name is. I didn't quite trust him, but he was our only hope. Would Flint consent to help us? That was the question. If he would, we could manage it. We stopped at the house, and Harry Hay left me alone and went in to break the news to the old man. He was gone some time. He must have paid Flint money, big money. Had that body been anyone's but Gordon's, I would have died or lost my senses right then. The suspense, you know. But how can you abhor the body of one you love? Our last ride together was over. Harry Hay came out at last with Flint, who was shivering with terror, expostulating. Harry Hay took one arm of the body, Flint the other, 
touched it that is and then ran back into the house sobbing terrified aren't men cowards i had to help the body was stiffened with the cold we had to fairly drag it into the house the boots scraped on the sidewalk at the basement entrance flint was white as ashes holding the door then into the shooting gallery where gordon had his bowling alley his foils and gloves and rifles we laid him on the floor harry hay took a target pistol from a case and asked the way to the coal cellar he went with flint through a little low door then i heard a shot my god it made me shriek my nerves were so on edge it was only harry shooting into the coal to empty the cartridge he came back and laid the pistol down beside the body then i turned away sick he was removing the cotton we were afraid the wound wouldn't bleed oh god it bled fast enough flint was told to wait fifteen minutes then telephone to the nearest police station he was to say he had heard a shot that gordon had let himself in alone while flint was upstairs that he probably was practicing as he often did you see he was a noted shot we hoped the death might perhaps pass as accidental that was the plan i think it worked all right but the police suspect something i think did you read the papers there was a notice there is to be an inquest the house is guarded we came out at last harry hay got up on the box and drove off i felt relieved so far as we knew nobody had seen us come i thought it was all over the strain of it the horror and my strength began to go i collapsed it had been too much i was roused out of a sort of stupor by finding myself slipping to the floor as we slewed round a corner when i tried to get up my feet struck something the suitcase and bag do you see we had been so worked up over the thing so excited so nervous we had forgotten to leave gordon's luggage at the house both of us had forgotten god knows we had enough else to think about it isn't strange we forgot well i thought it wouldn't matter much about the things only clothes i was too upset to remember what was in the small bag then as we passed an electric light i happened to look down at my feet the small bag had become unfastened in some way and the whole floor of the cab was covered with jewels you've seen them too on the floor you know how i must have felt thousands of dollars worth of jewels i gathered them up and stuffed them into the bag at the next street lamp i looked and found more in the corners and still more it seemed as if i'd never find them all first i thought i'd stop harry hay and tell him but i waited till we got to my house then i told him what were we to do we couldn't take them back it was too late then for the police had undoubtedly been notified there would be officers there and the coroner's men harry hay was getting nervous about the cab driver and anxious to return the carriage he told me that i would have to see about the jewels told me to telephone flint and see what could be done to return them safely so that no one would know they had been taken it was a tremendous responsibility for me but to save gordon's honor i consented to do it i got flint on the telephone after a while and told him he was awfully excited and said he had found the safe door open and had suspected the theft he proposed that i should carry the jewels up to his brother's house in harlem where as soon as he could get away he would meet me then he would return them to the safe and lock the combination no one would ever know but owing to the coroner he couldn't get away till late to-night i promised to come i tried to sleep to-day but how could i forget after i had concealed the suitcase my mind went over and over the horror of it all and i thought i should go mad the forenoon was bad enough but the afternoon was worse as i was trying to eat my dinner the bell rang eliza came back grinning to say a man wanted to speak to me i couldn't understand why she was laughing then when i saw him for a moment my heart stopped beating i thought it was harry hay in the cabman's coat and top hat again it was as if i had to go through that horrible ride again i couldn't believe my sight it was the cab-driver himself 
he had vicious cross eyes he began with a horrible sneering grin to tell me that my friend had damaged the cab i denied knowing anything about it but he said he had followed harry and had watched at the corner he had seen us coming out with gordon think of it for one moment i couldn't tell how much he knew and i was tempted to kill him then and there i almost wish i had then he spoke of my friend with the jag and i saw he didn't know the truth but he knew something queer had happened he said he wanted a hundred dollars i gave it to him and told him to go away wasn't i a fool of course it was a fatal thing to do the moment i had done it i was in despair he would be sure something wrong had happened he would come again and again he would find out i went wild i didn't dare stay at home any longer then and so putting all the jewels loose into a velvet work bag i hid that in a large mink muff and went out i didn't know where i decided to go to some restaurant or to a theatre anywhere to be in a crowd safe and wait until flint could take the things i had scarcely turned from thirty-third street into fourth avenue when i saw a cab driving up slowly behind me i was afraid it was the man but was not sure i walked hurriedly along he followed like a horrible creeping thing why didn't i take a car oh i don't know i was distracted and anyway he would have followed me i turned west at twenty-ninth street the cab crawled along after me down broadway i couldn't shake it off i turned into twenty-sixth and for a few minutes i thought i had lost him i crossed seventh avenue past little bake shops groceries cobblers cubby holes and sticky-faced children then halfway up the block came a cab jogging along toward me i was terrified i lost my head i turned and ran there was no doubt that it was the cross-eyed cabman i knew him now a quarter of a mile away i became confused fearing he would stop me discover the jewels i looked about for some escape saw a fortune-teller's sign and ran up the steps the front door was unlatched i went in and darted upstairs i had lost my reason now i was acting through blind instinct taking the first chance that occurred to me up two flights i came to a door ajar i went in and locked it then i looked about for a place to conceal the jewelry not a closet nor a cupboard nor a bed i knelt to rip up the carpet thinking i could stuff the things underneath when i heard a pounding downstairs i got up and grabbed the muff the jewels came flying out of the bag and scattered all over the floor then i looked up and saw your face god how you terrified me well you know the rest for some minutes neither spoke the girl as if relieved of some physical burden sighed and rested her head on her hand gazing at the young man fenton looked at her amazed at her story he understood now something of her strange beauty the sensuous charm of the octoroon spiritualized by love that beauty which had been tantalizing troublesome urgent disturbed him no more he looked through it to the woman whose character had been revealed with a quick toss of his head he reached over and held out his hand she took it without a word and smiled sadly what do you want me to do he asked take the jewels to flint's rendezvous five fifty five west one hundred and forty sixth street you think it is dangerous i am sure of it that cabman is still tracking me but you don't lack courage i know i think i'll try it said fenton calmly i'll do my best at any rate where can i find you to let you know the result i don't dare go home said the octoroon i'll take a room at the king william hotel and you can telephone me there call for miss green she rose cast a look about and added if there is anything i can ever do for you oh that's all right said fenton you'd better get away now while you can good night she bowed to him soberly gave him another long heartbroken look and then walked away fenton freed from the potent charm of her personality looked about almost wondering if she had indeed been there at all 
the german restaurant seemed to be the abode of the commonplace how could romance have entered all about were peaceful prosaic patrons intent upon their meal then he remembered o'shea was he still there he scanned the people at the tables one by one no fenton felt relieved his eyes fell idly upon a stout muscular-looking man leaning against a table near him he wore a shepherd's plaid suit a protuberance behind his hip looked as if it might be a concealed revolver fenton wondered if he were a detective but the time had come for him to act himself and he rose to go end of chapter three chapter four part one of find the woman this librivox recording is in the public domain find the woman by gillette burgess chapter four part one the liars club how our amateur adventurer fell a victim to his own inexperience was relieved of his treasure and fell in with a precious company fully convinced of the truth of this extraordinary woman's tale and with all the chivalry of a romantic youth aroused john fenton set out to restore the jewels with his overcoat pockets still clumsy with the treasure he left Sheffield hall and went out into a chilly misty night intent upon his adventurous errand what danger lay in wait he did not know nor care he was no longer a poor unknown draughtsman he was a knight-errant bent upon the rescue of imperilled honor the city had become of a sudden strange mysterious every shadow was a suggestion of malice so he walked hurriedly along eighteenth street to the subway entrance once he turned round and saw two men following him he increased his speed the lights of the glazed entrance promised a safe haven his haste however brought disaster at the entrance a step was raised a scant inch from the bricks of the sidewalk upon that low projection his toe caught and he fell sprawling hitting his forehead upon the iron plate and as he fell his overloaded pockets disgorged jewelry and precious stones all about him for a moment he lay there stunned only half conscious the next thing he knew two men were helping him to rise his head was buzzing blood was dripping from his face he would have fallen again but for their assistance in another moment he smelt the sickish odor of chloroform and he lost consciousness for a moment before he went off voices sounded strangely in his ears and his half-opened eyes caught sight of mangus o'shea supporting him he was too dazed even to realize his danger when he regained partial use of his senses he was walking still supported by the two men he could scarcely support his own weight and they held him up by sheer strength of arm he caught a few words there's a stable round the corner i'll get a cab and we'll take him to it was mangus o'shea who was speaking then as in a dream he walked on tottering it seemed to last for hours that horrible journey slowly began to revive and started to protest hist he's coming round again said another voice give him another whiff a damp handkerchief was held hard to his nostrils for a few seconds he struggled weakly and went back into oblivion so alternately walking and dozing off again trying to shake himself free as from some awful nightmare he was dragged on and on and on the next thing he knew he was in a cab this time he had wit enough not to show signs of reviving but sat huddled between two men listening his pockets were being deliberately rifled o'shea was filling his own with the spoil as he talked to peter stowe's loft he was saying peter won't be there to-night he'll be at the club telling his fool stories we can make a good getaway take his pants off and he'll stay a while we'll divvy up at the norcross and catch the first boat over the pond then an indiscreet movement of fenton's head attracted the notice of his captors the chloroform handkerchief was pressed firmly to his nose again and fenton knew no more he awoke he had no idea how long afterward with chilled legs to find himself lying on his back sick with nausea his trousers missing 
he was in some dark place and could see nothing except at one side a row of dim spots that were from time to time obliterated one by one and reappeared again like holes in the dark admitting the merest trace of light he was not out of doors though the floor he lay on felt as if covered with gravel there was a close unfamiliar smell in his nostrils and in his ears a confused noise like cooing a low persistent guttural sound he could not at first explain so soon as his brain cleared he made out by the fluttering of wings back and forth and the peep of chicks that he was in some sort of a large dovecote or pigeon house every little while he felt a sharp peck at his bare legs and feathers brushed his face he reached out his hand cautiously felt a bird slip away from him and his hand fell upon some small eggs still warm from the mother he lay there a while longer in wonderful discomfort trying to puzzle out his situation as the nausea wore off he arose and stumbling over pigeons and smashing eggs at every step groped his way toward the light the windows were too small for him to see anything outside he started to explore the garret bang he suddenly fell just escaping being precipitated into a hole in the floor square like the opening for a ladder though no ladder was there he thanked his lucky stars that he had only barked his shins and rubbed them till he found they were sticky whether with blood or broken eggs he could not in the darkness be sure no light came from the trap in the floor all he could see about him were vague forms that flitted to and fro all he could hear was the monotonous brooding murmur of doves there seemed no escape till some one came he shouted aloud shouted again and again waited and listened his overcoat was gone and the pockets of his coat had been rifled he found a single match lighting it he gave one glance about which revealed nothing more than his imagination had pictured hundreds of pigeons on the floor on the rafters flying hither and yon he was trying to devise some means of escape yelling with all his might meanwhile when a light flickered in the hole below him and a voice came up to him who's there fenton stuck his head through the trap and discerned a spectacled old man with scrawny beard holding a lantern and looking up at him mouth agape in wonder let me out for heaven's sake fenton cried who the devil are you anyway up in my pigeon coat come up and i'll explain i've been drugged and left here by robbers you're drunk said the old man holding the lantern above his head then chuckling inanely he walked off to return with a ladder which he lifted to the trap fenton protested volubly against the accusation and with exclamatory eloquence described what had taken place after having left the restaurant the old man still laughed as he climbed up fenton grew more vehement but his tale was incredible the old man sat down on the floor with his feet on the ladder and roared till he wept i say he shouted i know where you belong and there you go too and that's the liars club right away that story will get the prize to-night all right robbed eh pockets full of diamonds and rubies and truck fine say by the time we get down there you can touch that tail up a bit and make it hum never drunk in your life then say you certainly must have been up against some merry jags this evening well i like a practical joke as well as any one provided it ain't on me come on down and i'll have you initiated right away but i've got to hurry up to harlem fenton insisted i must give notice right away that the jewels have been stolen you're coming with me to the liars club first the old man repeated what the devil is that fenton wondered if he had to do with a crazy man oh just a crowd of good fellows that meet every night to swap yarns that's all we have to tell a tale apiece lies or truth it don't matter so long as the story's good only no one can peep about anything afterward that's the only rule that and no newspaper men because why some of our stories come pretty near being the truth not like this fairy tale of yours and he poked fenton in the ribs well i have no time for fooling around i don't care how much fun you have 
you must get me a hat and a pair of trousers somewhere and let me go not a bit of it don't you think of it the old man grew surly you come with me or you go out half naked whichever suits you best but if you're a good fellow and don't make trouble i'll see if i can't get you something to cover your legs and so saying he went down the ladder fenton had no desire to go abroad upon the street in his present condition a combination of blood and bird's eggs had streaked his shins with scarlet and yellow the droppings upon the floor of the garret had left his coat a sight for mirth moreover he found he had no hat and no money he picked his way down the ladder therefore in no jubilant frame of mind but determined to make the best of his situation perhaps some of the members of this extraordinary club would take his tale seriously but willy-nilly there was nothing to do but follow his chuckling guide peter stowe the pigeon fancier led the way down a flight of stairs and through a door in the rickety partition abruptly into the next stable loft a whoop of laughter greeted his entry as fenton found himself in a large room filled with tobacco smoke roughly fitted up with straw chairs and a long table about a keg of beer in the corner a group of men turned in amazement to see his ridiculous figure and came forward to make a hilarious inspection of him the pigeon fancier introduced him gents here's the prize live liar of the evening captured after a hard struggle in my pigeon loft making omelettes and murdering my squabs i say keep his story till the last cause why it's dead sure for the prize he turned to fenton and exhibited him as if he were a curiosity gentlemen i've been robbed fenton exclaimed angrily i appeal to you to give me assistance don't spoil the point of the story cried the old man i had a fortune of precious stones in my pockets i've been captured and drugged a heavy horsey-looking man with a square jaw in a striped sweater stepped forward and laid a massive hand on fenton's shoulder see here kiddo you follow instructions see they's enough of us here to handle you all right if you kick up a row you'll have your chance in good time sit down in that chair and have a mug of beer and a pipe now then boys we'll have another story seeing by the cynical faces that further objections would be useless fenton sat down and hid his bare legs under the table beer was set in front of him and tobacco offered it was evident now he had time to observe the crowd that the meeting had been interrupted by his advent so he decided to make the best of it and watch his chance for escape the man addressed as the next speaker was a merry-looking red-faced man of forty with a patch over one eye by his fat stomach and his tinted nose he had apparently once lived well and at the expense of others fenton labelled him as a second-rate gambler or confidence man now out of the running his voice was good-natured and easy he stuffed his hands in his pockets stared at the president with his good eye and proceeded to tell with winks and chuckles his story the time of his life my mother's cousin was in town last sunday seventy-two years old and never been in new york lives down on cape cod keeps a sort of tavern for summer boarders runs a general merchandise store lets cat-boats and horses the main henry b manager of the town of barnstable he came up to have the time of his life at seventy-two can you beat it i used to know uncle jerdon when i was a boy he was postmaster then in the days when there was so little mail that he could read off the names of all the letters morning and evening beginning with hulda hoxie and ending with jeremiah philpotts all done nowadays the whole town is full of summer folks and the natives pick em good and plenty while the weather lasts uncle jerdon was a deacon in the methodist church and always led the experience meetings with telling how big a sinner he used to be but lord everybody knew he'd never done anything worse than swear at his old blue mare when she wanted to stop at the watering trough go long thee darned old slut was his idea of profanity 
You see, his folks brought him up to be a Quaker, and early influence stuck. Well, those experiences he used to make up were the only outlet for as good a little streak of hellishness as any man ever had. They were the only chance he had to make good as a sport, and it kind of got on his nerves. I remember going down to Barnstable for a vacation, once, a couple of years after I'd moved to New York. Say, the old man's questions would have made you yelp. He knew no more about life than a Brooklyn baby, but he made it up in curiosity. I recall how he used to take me into a corner behind the shoe counter and ask me, Jared, did thee ever go on a bust? And what I hadn't done I had to invent, the same as him. Lord, I made myself out a red-hot hellion for his benefit. I liked the old man. Well, he talked with all the drummers that came along asked about the tenderloin and the theatres and masked balls. He took a particular fancy to masked balls, did the old man, and all the sporty eating houses in this old burg. The drummers must have strung him good and plenty. When I saw him next, he seemed to have an idea that millionaires skated down Broadway in dominoes and red masks and artists' models in scant attire rioted on the trolley cars. Madison Square Garden, to him, was something like the three-ringed palace of Nebuchadnezzar, or who's this that built the Tower of Babylon in Sodom, or was it Gomorrah? He was dying to see a real gambler. Well, leading such a confounded virtuous life in Barnstable that it got on his nerves, he figured it out that he'd just got to have one good fling at real life in the metropolis to get it out of his blood, and then settle down to the catboats and prayer meetings and clams and be good forever after. They's nothing for itching like scratching, and he'd never be satisfied till he'd had his time. So he started to sow his belated wild oats crop with the cunning of a bank cashier contemplating a trip to Morocco. He squared his insurance and his mortgage debts, laid in a good stock of doodads for the summer trade, bought his wife a new silk dress, and filled in details all along the line till they wasn't a duty undone nor a debt unpaid. Meanwhile, little by little, he began to salt away the coin for the trip to the great city. Boston wasn't half wicked enough for him, Lord, no. He was going to do it big and fling his hard-earned money into the great white way. So he scrimped and saved for pretty near three years, and in that time he scraped up a thousand dollars, which was what the drummers had told him a good spender would need for one week in Gotham. On top of that he had to collect enough for the trip back and forth, something like fifty dollars. Ain't that the beginning? of a bumper crop of adventure can you see that old hypocrite singing psalms every sunday and thursday night and reading the police gazette behind the counter in between times i say when i met him at the train i near laughed my head off if you can imagine a healthy sixteen months infant calling for cocktails and smoking a carolina perfecto at the hoffman house bar you'll understand how it struck me well, he wanted me to show him the sights, no limit, and him to pay all the expenses. If he didn't have the time of his life, I certainly was going to. Well, he blew in on a Saturday night, and feeling a little groggy myself, I induced him to turn in at the La Marquette Hotel, and said I'd call around next forenoon, and not to do anything rash till he saw me. It was all I could do to hold him in. He wanted to do Chinatown right away that night, see Chuck Connors do a roof garden and see somebody shot, and go on a joy ride with chorus girls. Finally I persuaded him to go in and take a long breath before he jumped into the gaiety of city life. But it'll be Sunday, says he. They ain't no such thing as Sunday in New York, I told him. They ain't had a Sunday for forty years and I believed it. A lot I knew about it, rounder as I was. Well, you don't always know how the other half lives. Live and learn. 
I slept late that night and didn't get round to the hotel till about one o'clock next day, Sunday. There he was in the lobby, with a big carpet bag and a face like a drowning horse. Buncoed? Well, yes, but you'll never guess how. This is what happened. He had got up at about six a.m., like all hayseeds, and went down to the newsstand in his slipper feet for a morning paper. Then who did he run into? Bang! But the Methodist minister who had preached at Barnstable four years before. A Reverend Willie it was, and Uncle Jerdon simply couldn't get away. He said he was on business, buying boats or something, but the Reverend insisted he'd got to go to church with him that morning. They was no visible way out of it, with Uncle Jerdon's pious reputation and so, cursing inside he pulled his sunday face and trotted along clean over to brooklyn wasn't that rubbing it in it was a clean red brick church they went to with a new minister who was crazy on foreign missions and at the end after the sermon just before the contribution the minister turned himself loose to persuade money out of stingy pockets just think of it he says one dollar will provide red calico enough to cover the nakedness of twelve of our heathen sisters. One dollar will buy toothbrushes enough for a whole savage tribe in the South Seas. One dollar will provide a Bible to convert a cannibal king, and one dollar will buy a marriage certificate for poor pagans, who have previously lived in sinful polygatude. He got the house misers who had never put in a dime before sweetened up the plate uncle jerdon had to make good it cost him a pang to spend a cent for the lord on this trip this was his time with his long-lost cousin the devil but he dipped into his pocket and thinking a dollar would make a good show threw a bill into the plate the deacon counted the contribution while the congregation sang from greenland's icy mountains to india's coral strand there was a hush while the audience rubbered then the treasurer of the church tiptoed up with them religious squeaky shoes to the pulpit and whispered behind his hand to the minister the minister got up coughed and rolled his eyes to heaven beloved brethren he said the lord hath moved us in wondrous manner this day and has shed his blessing upon our efforts. The sum collected at the contribution is one thousand and twenty-five dollars and thirty-one cents. The Lord be praised. Amen from the congregation, and everybody looked at everybody else to see if Carnegie or Rockefeller was there in disguise. Uncle Jerdon was as puzzled as anybody, till he put his hand into his vest pocket and felt for the unbroken thousand-dollar bill he had put aside to spend on the primrose path. It wasn't there. He had put it into the plate, thinking it was the one-dollar bill he had left from his traveling expenses. Can you beat it? And the man with the patch on his eye reached into his hip pocket for a well-gnawed plug of tobacco, and took a plenteous bite. The roars of laughter had not subsided before the big president rose with a surly face and pointed dramatically across the table to where a young man sat in the shadow of the lamp, his chair tilted back against the partition. He had a chubby face with a huge good-natured mouth, and had been puffing incessantly during the recital, as if he wished to conceal himself behind a cloud of smoke. A couple of boxes emptied of their Havana cigarettes, and the butts of some two dozen on the floor testified to his industry. Now everyone turned to look at him. He stared back at them without embarrassment. Who is that chap? demanded the president. I never saw him here before. Oh, this is Jack Richmond, said a thin cadaverous looking youth with a chauffeur's cap who had been coughing behind his hand. Friend of mine. He's all right, I guess. Met up with him at a moving picture show. Want to hear my yarn? He's a reporter, thundered the president. I can tell by the shape of his head. Whenever you see a chap with a long egg-shaped cocoa that hangs over behind, 
You can bet he writes for the papers. Rat, said the chauffeur. Richmond's all right, I guess. But before he had finished, the massive president strode over to the suspicious character, took hold of the lapel of his coat, and threw it open. With a quick movement, he snatched a card from the young man's vest. Look at that, he yelled. What did I tell you? The morning item. Reporter's card. Now get out of here. Against the bylaws to have newspaper men present. These stories don't get into print, if I know it. He shook his heavy hand in the young man's face. Will you leave easy or hard? I think, said the chubby young man, rising hastily and drawing on a soft hat, I'll say good-bye while the walking is good. I apologize for having that card. It was lent me by a friend to get inside the fire lines while my own house and family was burning up alive last night. But, of course, being a liar's club, I have no place here, and the plain unvarnished truth is at a discount. I'm a victim of circumstantial evidence. Good day, gents. St. Ananias guide thee, and he made his exit, two feet ahead of the toe of the president's brogan. Say, that's a shame, said the thin young chauffeur, scratching his head. We lost a peach of a good story when he threw him out, I'll bet. I'll have to hump myself if I want to make up for it. My turn next, ain't it? If you've got anything on your chest, the president announced affably, this here's the time to cough it off. My text is the psychological rule of three, said the chauffeur. Say, this ain't no browning club, objected the pigeon fancier. No browning sharp could ever explain the psychology of three consecutive coincidences, said the youth. It's a case for Henry James. Is he a member? asked the ex-gambler. I never heard of him. What is he, a chauffeur or what? He is a literary chauffeur, as you have guessed, and he always exceeds the speed limit. When he comes in next, I'm going to put it up to him straight. Why is it that no man can stand three strokes of lightning without expecting a fourth? I'll put it another way. When a man has three bad lucks running, he'll manufacture the fourth himself in trying to escape what he considers inevitable. Faster, kid, faster. Your act is flopping. Steer out of the tall word contest and harness on to your pet prevarication. I'll do it, said the thin one. Take it from me, the only living gasoline eater who never eloped with a rich man's wife. I'm telling you the unenameled truth. I've got a tail with a wallop. This is a song of my brother's submerged E-flat luck. I'm reminded of the trilogy of sad events by the announcement in today's papers of the death of a young swell named Brewster who blew his brains out yesterday on account of losing his wad backing a bandy-legged mule named Belcharmian. Fenton looked up in amazement. Surely the name of Brewster was familiar. Then the other name rang queerly in his ears. He thought of the picture in his pocket. Bell C. H. Could Charmian, by any streak of chance, be the name of his dream girl? He began to tremble. He could not take his eyes from the chauffeur's face as the thin young man, coughing between sentences, told to the circle about him his story. The Rule of Three my brother Bill had been running a hog ranch near Temple, Arizona. Despite the fact that this particular town is ten degrees hotter than the boiling lava of Vesuvius, he had prospered sufficiently to retire a year ago with a bankroll of eleven thousand dollars. With the wad and a hunger for something to eat better than canned peaches, cactus, and bull durum tobacco, he pulled up stakes for Chicago spent a couple of days in the annex bar and hit the trail for the big noise at the mouth of the hudson when it came time for him to quit the buffet car and hunt his mat he moseyed back through the train until he came to a sleeper named belcharmian in it he had lower berth number three a fact which may or may not be significant upon awakening in the morning he tried to negotiate some eight dollars worth of ham and eggs with a grapefruit on the side but was attacked with a violent nausea he retired to the observation car and remained there 
shivering and shaking with ague until the flyer rolled into new york then piling into a taxicab he told the driver to take him to the nearest hospital the doctors analyzed him hurriedly pronounced his trouble a sort of cross between typhoid and the bubonic plague clapped him into bed in ward number three and there he remained for three weeks three separate and distinct times he would have died but for the thought of the pink-haired nurse and his bankroll it's a pity he didn't take the count then and there he would have missed a lot of trouble on the third of may the doctors declared him graduated and with seventy four hundred dollar notes in his wallet he wobbled to the exit where he collided with a weak-eyed quick whose shaky legs and shop-worn appearance stamped him as a fellow convalescent just getting well says bill yep says the live dishrag where you bound for says bill again me for the race-track says the other leaning against the elevator shaft and panting for ozone the docks have all my coin but i'm good for a marker and before the last goat comes rompin home to the paddock my pants is goin to be lined with yellowbacks or it's me for a brodie into the brine bill hungered for excitement enough to hire a benzine buggy and together the two cripples went to the race-track in the first race bill backed a haggin horse named tatters and spilled a hundred in the second a skate named melon boy went to pieces in the stretch and stung my brother twelve hundred dollars bill was feeling blue but his friend was talking pert he was a couple of centuries ahead and together they walked into the paddock to take a squint at the ponies and jocks that were getting ready for the third race see that swell girl there with the black plumes the big eyes the parasol and the aristocratic ankles that's miss charmion a society pet says the little fellow who was so weak he could hardly stand they's a zebra in this race named after her bell charmion's the filly and young brewster the son of the millionaire owns the beast sufferin spanish mackerel thinks bill typhus fever in birth three of a sleeping car named bell charmion miss bell charmion on the third of may and a horse named bell charmion in the third race what's the answer the bell sounded and everybody started to run toward the grandstand or betting ring bill waited long enough to take another look at the filly then hustled for the ring as fast as his bum legs would carry him bell charmion was favored at three to five removing a single hundred dollar note from his roll and sticking it in an inside pocket bill handed the entire remainder five thousand two hundred dollars to a greasy-faced bookie got a card showing that he played the filly across the board and went out on the lawn to hold his breath they got away in a bunch and swung round the track so fast that bill couldn't see which was ahead coming into the stretch ten million people commenced to pound each other on the head and yell come on you bell charmion oh you bell charmion and bill knew his nag was in the lead a hundred yards from the finish just as the leaders were right in front of bill the filly stumbled turned a double somersault slid into the fence and killed her jockey my brother crumpled up on the grass when he came to somebody had frisked him for the hundred and he was flat broke in a strange land he hunted up his hospital friend who slipped him a wad of sympathy a five-case note and his address come round and sleep in my folding bed said he bill said he would the address was a hundred and twelve east twenty-sixth street and at six o'clock that night bill after a fifteen-cent meal at child's and a ride on the third avenue l finally located the place and half dead with weakness and a grouch made for the entrance his mind was so fussed that he didn't notice anything until his feet collided with a rubber doormat in the outer lobby on it in white letters appeared the name of the house bell charmion not for mine thinks bill nothing with that tag to it will ever make a hit with me i'm on to my luck this time 
If I enter this cursed shack, I'll be scun out of my clothes in a pinochle game, or be arrested for blackmail, or fall in love with a blonde chambermaid, or pitch down the elevator well, or something as fierce. That name Belcharmion is the wrong recipe for my health. I found that out. And so he turns out in a hurry, thanking his stars that he'd found sense at last. Just as he reached the sidewalk, somebody yelled, Look out! And wing! A forty-foot swing stage hit him on the top of the head for a ten weeks trip to the hospital again. What did I tell you? Moral! Don't dally with the rule of three. End of chapter four, part one. Chapter four, part two of Find the Woman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Find the Woman by Gillette Burgess. Chapter four, part two. The iteration of the name Belcharmion smote upon John Fenton's ears like the ringing of a bell far away in some secret chamber of his mind behind some locked door why should that name excite him he did not know it seemed to be vaguely familiar but he could place it nowhere in his memory he was puzzling over it when his attention was called to the next speaker of the evening then suddenly a new thought excited him the man addressed by the president was a cross-eyed coarse-faced individual who by the cut of his coat and the battered top hat on the back of his head was indubitably a cab driver immediately fenton's mind went back to the octoroon's story she had been pursued by a cross-eyed cabman could this be the man fenton listened eagerly to see if anything in his speech would confirm this surmise this is a perfectly true story the cabman was saying stop there the president thundered if a story is funny it's not true and if it's true it's not funny that principle has been proved in this club beyond peradventure cut out this i knew the man that died stuff we want no true stories here we want good ones wherever a good story travels there's always some fool who wants to tack it on to some maternal aunt of his and ten to one he actually believes what he says all good stories come from herodotus and the best we can do is to cut em over to a nineteen hundred and eleven model touch em up with rouge and powder and send em out as the latest no man can invent a good story but he can improve a poor one no true tale is fit to tell the naked truth must be adorned peter stow the pigeon fancier awoke from his doze well is this a browning club or not he asked sleepily why not play ball i second the motion said the chauffeur the president nodded and the cab driver shifted his cigar from one corner of his mouth to the other and began the sleepy bridegroom it was a funny story how young michael carnarvon got married i never heard of such a wedding in my life you see young carnarvon was really what you might call roped in the shoefelt girl was a manicure working in the hotel persimmon and from the day she laid eyes on him she began to wire things up to marry him i suppose all women do that one way or another she done it by listening instead of talking when he began to call on her she lived over on charles street with her mother she kept him talking about himself till he thought she was the cleverest girl in new york which in some ways she was what with playing the innocent sympathetic keeping her mother out of the way and padlocking her temper which was something savage she got him going till he popped the question she certainly managed it great carnarvon's folks was wild when they heard about the engagement but by this time he was deaf and blind to the fact that the shoefelt girl was only after his money and had the reputation around chelsea village of being a regular rocky mountain catamount when she got mad lord it must have been a strain for that girl to hold her tongue sometimes but she never boiled over till after the wedding you'd have thought she was half-witted almost she was so tame when carnarvon was around 
but lord how her mother used to catch it when he left the flat and her mother could put up a pretty good jaw fight too well three days before the wedding carnarvon had to work like a donkey engine to get his business straightened up so he could get off on his honeymoon he was at the office night and day working himself to a frazzle in that time he hadn't slept more than three or four hours all told and on the morning of his marriage he was about as near all in as a man can be and keep awake in fact he couldn't keep awake and that was the trouble they tell me that last forenoon he was practically walking and talking in his sleep black coffee didn't do no good at all for he'd been living on it for a week practically he dictated his letters staggering up and down the room and every time he sat down at the desk to sign his name to him the typewriter had to stick hat pins into him to wake him up he took snuff to make him sneeze he washed his face in cold water every ten minutes he kept the windows wide open everything he could think of to brace him up but he just naturally got drowsier and drowsier every minute they was things that simply had to be done if he was going to get off next day and so he kept to it till late in the afternoon so dopey he couldn't talk american blub blub was about all he could say it was something awful his clerks implored him to let them finish up but he didn't dare trust them so he stuck to the ship at six o'clock he was like a living corpse half blind with sleep yawning continually and having to be hauled up off the floor every five minutes he was living on sheer nerve blind staggers was nothing to it but he left to go home declining help from the boys and of course owing to ructions in his family not likely to get much assistance when he did get there well on the way home he dropped in at a drug store for a dose of something strychnia or some such stuff to brace him up through the ceremony after that he didn't care just so long as he made good with the minister how he asked for the dope i don't know he must have said something about sleeping i suppose but anyway the clerk thought he wanted a sleeping draught and he gave him what turned out to be a twenty per cent solution of morphine see there he was hardly able to see straight anyway with a double dose of dope on top of it he took a cab home and the driver had to pry him out of the seat when they got there he crawled upstairs wondering how he was ever going to make it that evening his medicine didn't seem to help much so he took another swig at it how he ever got his clothes on his man can't exactly explain it was a job for an undertaker not a valet but after a regular nightmare of it carnarvon started for the shoefelt flat he didn't dare take a cab this time for fear he'd be found asleep and they think he was drunk so he walked it must have been horrible most of the time he staggered along with his eyes shut hoping he'd run into somebody who'd punch him in the head or give him a good kick to wake him up no such luck well he got to the shoe felt flat somehow and just before going in he emptied the bottle in hopes it would carry him through the ceremony that last dose made him feel as if he was living inside a blanket soaked in molasses with his arms and legs tied lord that man was game he just got in and that was about all for he stumbled on the first rug fell feet down on the floor and began to snore mrs shufelt picked him up and she and nanny lugged him into a bedroom and tried to wake him up by this time he was just muttering to himself something like i don't give a dern for anything i'm tired of swimming through jelly blub 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 i want to lay down and die decent of course they thought he was drunk what else was they to think but so long as she was safely spliced to him nanny didn't care she was determined not to make a miss of it and as soon as she was mrs michael carnarvon she knew she'd give him a tongue lashing that would sober him up so they slapped wet towels at his face stepped on his toes tickled the soles of his feet used a few needles brushed up his hair backwards and dragged him in to greet the friends of the family wow he tried to crawl on his hands and knees but they wouldn't have it everybody thought it was a disgrace but he was rich and that always explains a lot 
After he was introduced to the minister, he melted down into a chair, shut his eyes, and opened his mouth. Nanny pinched him good. He got up in a kind of trance, fell into Mother Shufelt's sister's lap, stepped into the rubber plant, upset a table full of wedding presents, and then the old lady decided to hurry things and get the agony over. How she induced the minister to do the job I don't know. Perhaps it was the hundred-dollar bill Carnarvon had in his vest pocket did the trick. Anyway, they propped him up on each side and one behind, and the parson done his act. Everybody present swore afterwards that they heard him say, I will, and as soon as it was over he collapsed, and they laid him out on a sofa and covered him up with a tablecloth while Nanny changed her clothes. The guests went into the dining-room to feed and drink his health. Now whether it was the champagne young Carnarvon had paid for, or just the natural tendency of wedding guests to play the goat, I don't know. But anyway, they fixed up a joke on the happy pair. There was one cut up there, a rising young plumber he was, named O'Square. The first I knew of the thing, he come round to my stand and wanted to hire my hack. It was him what put me on to the whole thing. He was fairly busting with it. He offered me twenty dollars for the use of my cab and my hat and overcoat, and I surrendered. Naturally, I followed round the corner to see the fun. He sent away the taxicab Carnarvon had waiting, and went upstairs to see if all was ready. The rest of them had everything fixed. They got young Carnarvon downstairs, holding him up the way you do a drunk and they rammed him into the cab. Then they brought down Nanny, who was beginning to talk. Lord, you ought to have heard her remarks. They was something bloodthirsty. The guests only screamed and laughed at her. O Square got on the box. We all tied up the trunks with ribbons, and off they went, Nanny's language dripping out of that cab like a leaky watering cart. O Square brought back my cab toward one o'clock next morning. He didn't say nothing, but I heard afterward that he dumped em out. Carnarvon, dead asleep, Nanny fighting mad, and the trunks covered with old boots and white ribbons on a little crossroad in the middle of Van Cortland Park. That was his idea of a joke. What happened after that I don't know, except that a week afterward Michael Carnarvon brought suit for the annulment of his marriage, on the grounds that he was asleep during the ceremony. The cross-eyed cabman paused and felt in his inside coat pocket. If you don't believe it, he remarked, look at this thing here. I found it tucked into a nook in the seat cushion of my cab when I cleaned her out the next day. He held up a locket, heart-shaped, with a star of white stones. It flashed like a handful of sparks in that smoky, dusty room. I ain't sure it was Carnarvon's wedding present to his wife, he explained. It wasn't never advertised for, and so I never said nothing about it. You know, us cab drivers has got to have some perquisites. The suspicions which had arisen in Fenton's mind at first sight of the cross-eyed cab driver were confirmed long before the story was finished. As it progressed, Fenton was amazed at the man's audacity in weaving in point after point the facts of the octoroon's narrative the sleepy bridegroom could of course be none other than the dead fair gordon brewster the picture which the cabby had seen as he watched from a nearby corner was almost the identical one the octoroon had described the tragic truth disguised in this comedy recital as chorus after chorus of guffaws applauded the tale Fenton wondered at the cleverness of the man who was, no doubt, adapting some old narrative to fit the needs of his case. At sight of the locket, however, Fenton's thoughts took a new turn. The ornament had a mystery of its own connected in some incomprehensible way with his own life. He had but a glimpse of it as it was displayed, but he was sure there was no mistake. It was exactly the same as the one he recalled first during that half-forgotten scene on the ferry-boat when he was a mere child afterward in the o'shea's tenement after they had come to new york what did it mean how did the cabby really get it there was only one possible answer 
undoubtedly it was one of the brewster jewels spilled out of the travelling bag as the octoroon had said while the dead body was being driven to seventy-second street if so the cabby's suspicions of queer work must have gained ground he had perhaps already communicated with the police at any rate fenton now had a double reason for wanting to gain possession of it and he was determined that at the first opportunity he would attempt to get it he would watch his chance with all this flashing through his mind it did not take him long to perceive that he could not safely tell his own story before the driver once he was connected with the jewels the cabby would be on his track he determined therefore to invent some fantastic tale anything would do which might rescue him from his embarrassing dilemma the cabman's story suggested a plot it was vague but he relied upon inspiration for some amusing narrative his mind was already busy upon the fiction when he was called upon for his contribution to the evening's entertainment we have with us to-night said the president impressively hooray from the circle of auditors a newcomer to our glorious midst as an amateur liar we expect little and yet the gentleman's costume warrants some hope of amusement he turned to fenton now bare legs you can spiel your tale what's all this about being robbed of seventeen million dollars worth of diamonds anyway make it short for we're getting tired and don't spare the ginger we need to be waked up all ready fire away he sat down everyone looked at fenton and laughed again he did not in truth present a very dignified aspect the blood and egg yolk had dried upon his shins and he had brushed some of the dirt from his coat but there was excuse enough for mirth he looks like a bum highland scavenger was the chauffeur's comment fenton invoked the muse of comedy and rose to his feet of course that yarn about the stolen millions was all a bluff i wanted to get away quick and when you hear my lively tale you'll understand why i didn't care to explain just how many different kinds of a fool i was to our friend the aged pigeon charmer here it was bad enough as it was but i see you're all good fellows and perhaps if i throw myself wide open you may be moved to help me out the fact is also that the cabby's story is just enough like mine to encourage me to go ahead and tell the truth he was proud of himself already he had made an impression from the looks of the men he knew he had his audience and it inspired him he gave free rein to imagination therefore and warming gradually to his lie he began the story the three weddings i am going to be married to-night if you fellows will help me out that will explain why i touch lightly on parts of the narrative i haven't much time to lose if i'm to capture my blushing bride the pride of harlem a lady you'll excuse me for denominating miss daisy peach the name doesn't matter for i expect it to be howitch by twelve one to-morrow morning my name's claude kensington van Prule howitch age twenty one all right skip the love at first sight stuff skip the coy proposal and lovers quarrels skip the violets and confectionery most all men make love alike every chap thinks his chicken is a bird of paradise the only difference is i know mine is the story therefore boils down to a question of too much mother-in-law before marriage by too much i merely insinuate that she was too much for me why she wanted daisy to marry six foot of blond englishman with a decorated name call him the honourable algernon mudd that'll do fine daisy being foolish about me said nay nay and set the date for our nuptials in fact she named the day three times let's take em chronologically which being interpreted o oh, grave and reverend signors means each by one wedding number one parson ready four million guests of the bride arrived presents set out labelled and guarded by detectives in the billiard-room house decorated floral arch orange blossoms galore potted plants orchids 
little sisters in silk voile carrying baskets of rose leaves to walk on in short everything but the happy groom which was me who was fighting his way into an elephant's dress suit many miles away no wedding bells for her puzzle here's the answer wedding was to be at nine my best man thinking me sane sober and responsible had promised to call at eight with a taxi at six thirty as i thought i began to dress for the execution now though i may not look it in my present war paint i keep a valet or rather i share him with four other chaps up to date that valet had been an expert but at seven o'clock he began to go crazy one spilt a bottle of mucilage inside my union suit you know no man wants to wear another kind of skin two couldn't find a clean suit valet had to hike out and buy one red flannels was all he could find and me to be married at nine three upset the ink all over my king of broadway dress shirt found every other white shirt was three sizes too small never had been before again to the haberdashers haberdasher closed had to put on a soft silk arrangement like the leading man in a musical comedy four laid down my dress coat on some sticky fly paper we had there to catch early crop of mosquitoes five went to telephone and found the thing was struck deaf and dumb i was furious by this time paranoiac ready to chew glass and spit blood you may wonder why i didn't tumble before this and suspect my valet i suppose it was because i was dreaming of my beauteous bride anyway it wasn't till i sent him out to a friend to borrow a black suit that i began to think anything then i went out to the elevator boy and asked the time it was nine twenty five that blasted menial had put back my watch and all the clocks an hour and a half well by that time i was seeing red i went down the hall and pounded at every door begging for a dress suit nobody at home or only shocked females who barricaded the entrance at last i found a dutchman who let me in and offered me a suit he had owned for thirteen years i took it to my place and got into it i wrapped it around me so to speak i got lost in it fit it would have fitted a dinosaurus better it flapped and waved about me i looked like the last potato in the sack but it was my last hope and in that mass of black broadcloth i made my appearance at the mansion de peach to find every guest gone the old man swearing mad mother-in-law to be calm as an iceberg and my daisy in tears how i squared myself i don't know i sent miss peach all the violets in the world and we postponed the wedding for a week i promised to be careful when i got back i found my valet waiting as cool as a marble top table i promised not to murder him if he'd tell me exactly why he did it what do you think honorable mud had tipped him one hundred dollars to queer me for the festivity well it was worth knowing somewhere around the conspiracy i smelled my mother-in-law but i couldn't follow up the trail wedding number two no valet this time you bet my best man on guard buttoning me up and giving good advice telephoning to central for the time every ten minutes i was all ready to start at eight o'clock when the bell rang like an alarm clock we didn't hurry and bing the door was nearly blown in best man opens the door enter a hoity-toity chorus girl made up for leading ingenue and one big big bull-necked policeman that's him says tootsy footlights and the cop lays a fist like a ham on my shoulder what do you think tootsie sprang a song about my having stolen six hundred dollars and banged her eye at jack's two nights before said we were engaged but it was all off and arrest him mr officer he's handsome but he's false protests from yours affectionately heap big talk from best man no go officer mcugly shows a warrant for my arrest i'm properly identified and if i want to go to the station in a taxi i can otherwise he'll call for the patrol i tried to coax him with a fifty but it wouldn't work 
My best man flew loose on a search for bail, and I made the journey to jail. The sergeant winked when I told the marriage story. I telephoned. I'd arrive at the Peach Palace in a minute, but before we raised the hundred dollars bail, the wedding was a fizzle. Simultaneously, Tootsie Footlights wired in she'd found the ring inside one of her rats, and she wouldn't prosecute. Who was Tootsie? Hired by Honorable Mud, of course, like the valet. She came round afterward and told me all about it, giggling and tried to get me to take her out to dinner. She had a nerve like a frog. No? Yes? Well, such are the petted favorites of the mimic world. The next day I got a session of live-wire talk from Daisy Peach that gave me the shivers. See here, Claude, she says, I'm getting tired of getting married on the installment plan. I know that Ma and Mr. Mudd are trying to queer you, but if you can't beat a pink Englishman out on a game like this, I'll be darned if I don't marry the Briton, for he's the cleverest man of the two. I like you, Claude, and in times of peace you seem to make good. But the war is on, and I'm going to marry the victor. We'll get married on the 30th of April, and I'll give you this last chance. I am aware that Mr. Mudd may have cooked up a good one this time to put you out of business. But if you can't defend yourself after being warned, you're no good to me as a husband. I can't use that kind. So I'll give you till midnight to show up. When the clock strikes twelve, if you're not visible to the naked eye, I'll become Mrs. Mudd and begin to train for high society in Surrey and that townhouse in Park Lane. Goodbye, boyo. I'll always be a sister if he wins, but I do hope you won't be lost in the shuffle again. Wedding number three. All goes well till six p.m. of the fatal day. Today. I had laid in three dress suits, a small gent's furnishing shop, a couple of welterweight thugs from Casey's, and my best man and I each had a magazine pistol ready. At six the telephone bell rings and Ma Peach croons out her siren song. Daisy, she said, had cold toes over something. Would I come right over to see her, or else the match would be off? She had sent the limousine. See the game? Yes? No? What could I do? Disobey the summons of the queen of the solar system? My brave, sweet daisykins? Not so. I fell for it. Out I walked through my barricades, jumped into the limousine, the minute I was in, two large adult men jumped in after me, one on each side. I had no time to put up a fight before they got to my nose with chloroform, and, well, I woke up in our friend's pigeon ranch, with my trousers gone. A quick finish? By Juno, yes. Now, gents, I put it to you. Are you going to allow me to lose a twenty-six carat bride at the last moment? for want of five cents and a pair of trousers? Seriously, my friends, I'm in a hole. I ask you, man to man, help me out. I can make it yet. Are you willing to stand for me or not? If you ever were married, you know how nervous a man is. I believe, honest, I've a temperature of a hundred and four this blessed minute. For Cupid's sake, give me a lift. If I had a hat, I'd pass it around. I only need pants and a taxi. What do you say? Fenton paused and looked anxiously around at the members of the Liars Club. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Find the Woman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Find the Woman by Gillette Burgess. Chapter 5 The Reporter of the Item. How John Fenton achieved a pair of trousers and attempted assault and battery unsuccessfully, but was rescued by a chubby scribbler. There was an instant's hush when Fenton finished. His charm and personality had carried his hearers along with absorbed attention, but he had little practice in impromptu romances, and his tale could scarcely convince the crowd of men before him, who were used to all manner of picturesque narratives. So, as Fenton sat down, a gust of laughter applauded him. They had been well entertained by his freak of fancy, but not enough to contribute the funds he had hoped might be his reward. 
He made another tentative appeal, but a cynical laugh was his only answer, and the company began to break. Men rose and yawned, started to look for their hats, and began talking with one another. The president came forward and laid his massive hand on Fenton's shoulder. Very good, lad. You nearly got us going, and that's no joke for a beginner. We'll have to have you round again. Nothing like new blood. Well, good night, kid. Come round whenever you feel like hitting the pipe. But how the devil am I to get out of here? Fenton asked anxiously. I can't go this way. If I can't borrow any money, I might at least get a pair of trousers. Oh, I guess Garish will fix you up all right, said the president easily, and he turned away and began to turn out the lamps. The cab driver had already come and joined them. I got an old pair of overalls, if that'll do you any good, he suggested. Fenton jumped at the proposal, for, indeed, it would enable him to kill two birds with one stone. If he could get the cab driver alone, he was determined to gain the locket, and when he might restore it to its owner, and then discover, if possible, the secret of his old memories of the trinket. He accepted Garish's offer, therefore, and after farewells to those of the club who had not already gone, he left and went down a flight of stairs with the cabby. He had already measured his man with his eye. Garish was a gin-soaked, obese wreck, and Fenton felt sure of being able to overcome him in a fair fight. He watched carefully, and knew that the driver had slipped the locket into a lower vest pocket. It should be easy to gain possession of it. First, however, the overalls must be secured. They went down into a stable next door, now tenanted only by a few sorry nags and two disreputable-looking cabs. It was lit by an oil lamp on a bracket. Garish went to a locker in the rear, beside a small door in the wall, and drew out the garment. The overalls were of brown denim, streaked with oil and spotted with dirt, but they would at least cover his bare shins. Fenton drew them on, watching the man sharply. When he was clad, he maneuvered toward a wagon stave that was lying on the floor, seized it, and whirled suddenly upon the cab driver. Now then, he exclaimed harshly, give me that locket. It's mine. Garish looked up at him through bleary eyes. Well, you son of a plumber, he ejaculated, and then, with remarkable agility and force, his foot shot out, caught his opponent in the diaphragm, and Fenton dropped, doubled up, with the wind knocked out of him. Before he could recover, the cabby had fallen on him and was throttling him. He began to punch with fervor. Fenton saw stars, then everything went black. He opened his eyes to find Richmond, the chubby reporter who had been ejected from the club, sitting on a keg, watching him curiously. Fenton sat up on the floor and looked groggily about. The cabman was lying a few feet from him, supine, with his eyes shut, evidently knocked out. The reporter smiled. Coup de savat, he said. That cabby must have come from Paris. Dirty low trick. How do you feel? Fenton rose, stretched his arms and legs, and then, recollecting his object, turned to the cabman, and felt quickly in his greasy vest pockets. In one was a large nickel watch, the other was empty. I've got it, remarked the reporter. Fenton sized him up and took a step forward. Give it to me. What? The locket, of course. You say you've got it. Fenton realized now how foolish he had ever been to speak of the robbery. He resolved to humor the reporter till he could get rid of him. That story about the stolen jewels was all a joke, he added. It was no joke, son. I'm not a fool. But what about the locket? That locket, said Fenton, has something queer to do with me. I don't know just what. There's something mysterious about it, and I want it. I don't know who it belongs to, but I know I have a better right to it than you have. As for the robbery, if you want to believe in it, you may but I won't tell you anything about it. In which case, I keep the locket, said the reporter. And now what are you going to do in that rig? I'm going to borrow a quarter from you to get up town with. Right, all right, but you'll have to earn it. Now, I'll tell you what I'll do. I've got to fool around for a half hour or so, looking for a girl a few blocks from here. Now, I don't care to hang round in the slums alone, and if you'll stay with me, I'll give you a dollar for car fare and the locket to boot when the deed is did. All I want is your name and address. Otherwise, I follow you till I find out for myself. All right. My name is John Fenton, 
and I live at 69 West 127th Street. We'll see. If you don't mind, I'll corroborate that. Have you anything to prove it? Fenton pulled a letter from his pocket which showed the truth of his confession. Looks all right to me, said Richmond, and he wrote it down on his cuff. Then he looked at the cabby. I see our cross-eyed friend is stirring in his sleep. Let's get out of here pronto and go where we can talk. Don't do anything foolish like running away, though. And remember that I used to be the featherweight champion of the Rosebud Social and Outing Club. By this time they were walking rapidly away from the stable, proceeding toward Canal Street. To emphasize his warning, the reporter had taken Fenton by the arm. Now see here, son, he went on. You're already somewhat in my debt. That pirate would have gouged your eyes out in another minute if I hadn't been in ambush. You've got a story, and I want it. Give up what you know, and I'll return the jewelry, or else there's nothing doing. He stopped under a lamp post and looked Fenton over deliberately. His words were coercive, but his eyes twinkled with good nature. You'll have to keep it, then, unless I can get it away from you, said Fenton gloomily. I don't see that the story's any of your business. All news is my business. I represent the people of New York who have a right to know what's going on, especially when it's as queer as you hinted at. When I saw you up there, they all thought that yarn about a jewel robbery was a bluff. I knew well enough it wasn't. I don't know what story you told, finally, but I'll bet it wasn't the right one. So when they bounced me, I hung around to see what you'd do. Murder was the last thing I expected. And even now, if you've lost seven million worth of diamonds, more or less, I failed to see how it is worth your while to jump this cabby just to get back one gold locket set with rhinestones. To the casual debutante it doesn't seem to be worth the risk. Hence this request. Put me on to the story. At present I'm out on another assignment, but I may be able to work em both. What are you afraid of? If you want honestly to get your fortune back, I may be able to help you. If you know anything, you know that a good reporter can beat any detective in the central office, and I'm the star of the morning item. The fact is, said Fenton, I've given my word of honor not to tell. Ah, said the reporter, compounding a felony. All right, then, I'll tell you what I'll do. One last proposition. Going, going, gone. I've got to hang round Eldridge Street to catch a girl who ought to be due there pretty soon, according to my tip. My paper wants her, and also I have some important news to give her. I've got to break a sad tale. We reporters get queer jobs. Now, if you'll come along with me, decent, while I wait for her, I'll stake you to a cab afterward, and you can get up town for your pants. Meanwhile, I keep this locket as an evidence of good faith. It's your bail till I get ready to go after you professionally. That's the best I can do. While we wait, I'll enliven the vigil by as pretty a little tale of middle-class life as you ever heard in the papers. Fenton reluctantly consented. He was not anxious to become conspicuous by attacking the reporter, much as he wanted the locket, and Richmond's proposition seemed the easiest way of getting up town. They walked along Canal Street, therefore, and turned into Eldridge Street. In the middle of the block, Richmond turned Fenton up to a pair of tenement house steps that commanded a view of both sidewalks. They sat down, perched a little above the dirty pavement where the submerged tenth traded, played, or promenaded in front of them. Keeping his quick eye alert upon the passers-by, Richmond produced a roll of Havana cigarettes, and lighting one from the other, smoked them in a chain as he narrated his tale. The Middle-Class Girl Take it from me, old top. The bromidic center of New York City is situated at the corner of Broadway and 90th Street. That's where Mr. Middle Class lives. Call him a bromide, a philistine, or a man in the street. He's bound to have his nine-room apartment and bath somewhere thereabouts. Mr. Average Man is a broker. He owns an $1,800 motor car and hunts in the Adirondacks or up in Maine two weeks every fall. His wife is a good-looking middle-aged woman in black satin, with the gray spots in her hair, modestly touched up. She plays bridge and has a manicure masseuse come in every Friday or so. There's one son who seldom leaves Broadway at night, and who is putting up margins during his lunch hour, and always getting stung. 
such was the baker menage business and theatres and bridge and an occasional dance but miss baker bessie baker was the lovely duckling in this family of male and female hens at thirteen bessie changed her name to elizabeth did up her hair lengthened her skirts and began to open her eyes to the fact that she was hopelessly middle class and doomed to marry an insurance agent if she didn't look sharp thence to a small flat on a hundred and twenty-sixth street a baby and a gossiping life across the dumbwaiter of the next apartment elizabeth had aspirations and began to make plans for bryn mawr she went through high school pa was strong for the public schools and no nonsense about swell seminary life and was just about to try for the entrance examinations when a flurry in p d and q put father baker in a hole and zip the university education was out of the game for poor elizabeth did the old man care not so he never took much to the idea of making highbrow of bessie he thought it would spoil her chances for matrimony you know the old idea but the girl was really terribly cut up middle-class society was beginning to get on her nerves all she heard talked was bridge and business theatres and teas from morning till night in her world romance was unknown nobody ever eloped nobody ever did anything great or criminal girls grew up had children and died without ever knowing an adventure men had mysterious vices she knew of them as shameful sordid acts that could never attract her but to her vision gents were always well dressed gloved and caned paying silly compliments talking bosh and sending violets what was over the other side of the wall which surrounded her that was what she wanted to know she knew no millionaires and no paupers not even a suffragette no friend of hers ever got into the papers no girl had a secret she could not and did not babble to all her friends in her world the fairyland of science was unknown the charm of philosophy unheard of literature was confined to the fifteen-cent magazines and art to the thirty-five and there was a great big world outside her door a world brilliant with blood brutality crime poverty suffering private yachts divorces and luxury she had never been south of twenty-third street she had never seen the water except from riverside drive oh for a man who could explain nietzsche to her oh for a man who knew the difference between de maupassant and balzac can you tell why mendel has superseded darwin no more could bessie what was pragmatism who were these new post-impressionists she read of in skimpy paragraphs in scribner's how could intelligent men and women perceive charm in debussy's discords yes she had been abroad with her mother and baedeker but they had to stay indoors every night in paris they had never seen an anarchist or a slum or a tea-taster or a live poet now a girl who had something to do with the delancey street settlement house happened to meet bessie at a toy tea one day and when the two got together for four minutes bessie's horizon moved north south east and west ten degrees the little middle-class girl discovered that while she and her ilk wandered through the desert of culture far from both the upper and the lower strata of society the prince and the pauper foregathered at wonderful houses in the purlieus and communed with each other at close range she heard of university extension courses of celebrated men who lectured to shop girls of artists who made music of socialist millionaires who married working girls exhibitions of paintings and books and classes and clubs and political economy and sometimes w and y and bessie dreamed a dream how she made the break and got away i don't know she didn't tell me but from what i saw of her i knew that her will was stronger than the old man's and her mother merely fainted away when bessie packed her suitcase was it the socialist millionaire story that reconciled them finally all i know is that bessie baker moved down to rivington street and got a job rolling cigars in a little tobacco factory at six dollars a week she roomed with two jew girls 
over a delicatessen shop and spent every night making hay with the social advantages presented by the delancey street social settlement nobody knew that she wasn't a poor girl and so she was allowed to mix with millionaires and philosophers and high society ladies and visiting who's who's to her heart's content perhaps you think i'm exaggerating but if i could describe one week of her new existence you'd see how much fussy her life was on the east side than in philistia there were automobile rides to the residences of wealthy patrons on long island there were boxes at the opera for the sweatshop girls they were even taken to the horse show that first week bessie met paderewski she held the basin while he dipped his twenty five thousand dollar hands into warm water before doing his stunt and her eyes were within four feet of his facile fingers while he played his own minuet henry james when he called and gave a talk on the metaphysics of rhetoric she almost ate him alive she was one of thirteen women wage workers who dined with the prince of bulgaria then studying american sociology and she got to know the swami getchachabanda so well he told her his real name say you ought to have seen bessie dancing with president roosevelt at a shirtwaist ball and meanwhile she was learning to speak in double negatives and rubbing burnt matches into her fingernails for local color building out her pompadour and wearing brass rings so as not to be caught as a middle-class impostor in that ineffable mixture of extremes nobody ever suspected that she worked because she liked it by means of a few choice solecisms she had butted into the most exclusive circles of brains and fashion and wealth she was clever all right i'm for bessie strong meanwhile she was working and working plenty she made cigars so much faster than the yiddish girls in the factory that she got into trouble and the foreman had to rescue her for the first time in her life she saw a man knocked down the foreman did it to a chap who called her a scab and then she realized that her blood was as red as a squaw's the foreman took a fancy to her after that and used to sit on the steps of the tenement where she lived and talk to her till midnight he was a russian and had been in the fighting organization of the revolutionists all through the campaign of aught five he explained the theory of the terror he told of shooting behind barricades of the manufacture of bombs of plots conspiracies heroes and martyrs of fifteen spies and assassinations and gore till she gripped his wrist and gasped for breath he had killed men he had seen men hanged he had worked in the siberian mines and had had five escapes from prison life was opening up big for poor little elizabeth of west ninetieth street meanwhile she rolled stogies by day and by night she put on a hand-washed shirtwaist and did high society at the settlement celebrities came and went lectures and musicales exemplified to her all that was finest and best in modern culture just watch elizabeth the president of a club of eighty women who did things they fought for a public playground and got it they shut up thirteen saloons they established a self-supporting day nursery they gave a fair and mrs ralph waldo billion was on the same committee as elizabeth baker didn't this beat life as lived at the corner of ninetieth and broadway elizabeth drank the intellectual life to the dregs and listened spellbound to the foreman's prophecies of the great social revolution then just like in the yellow papers came the millionaire socialist he lectured he spent his money on bronze photographs bari lions and trips to the metropolitan museum of art he started equality leagues and cooperative consumer federations he contributed to the settlement magazine fraternized with the working class and at last he met bessie baker fate rang the bell her time had come when mrs baker up at ninetieth street anxiously waiting for news from the front heard of it she was measured for a forty dollar tailor-made corset and an acreage hat and began to make a study how the mother-in-law of a millionaire ought to eat asparagus 
She cut a few old outworn friends and began to study restaurant French. She at last realized that Bessie had made good. The socialist millionaire was a rather effeminate youth who wore soft collars and black Windsor ties, glib spoken and so frightfully anxious to be a working man that he laid bricks in overalls on his country place. The wall had to be pulled down and rebuilt, but Tolstoy's precepts had been obeyed. From the moment he set eyes on Elizabeth Baker, any woman could have seen what was coming. He haunted her, discussed propaganda, the materialistic conception of history, the child labor law, and the adulteration of milk. He made love, sterilized with philosophy, and for a month or so they engineered a precarious courtship in the committee rooms of the settlement house, in the subway, and in chilly art galleries. And then he proposed. I'd like to have heard it. The man was dead in earnest. He was quite fond of Bessie, but marriage was mainly an opportunity for cooperatively managing a higher life for the welfare of the race. He believed in eugenics. Well, Bessie had about forgotten her high school English by this time. She made a wild effort to atavize back to the idiom of 90th Street, but her fascinating life in a cigar shop had accustomed her to the speech of those who really live. She was actually human at last. I'm sorry, Mr. Seymour, she said. It's tough on you to throw you down. But when I marry my husband, he's got to be something more than a mere theory. I've seen all kinds now. Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, and I know what's good. Me and the foreman Petrovsky's going to hitch up and have a cigar factory of our own after Christmas. Take it from me, he's the only white man in the world. The reporter rose, yawned, and pulled out his watch. Ten fifteen. Yes, fate moves in a mysterious way her wonders to perform, etc., etc., it just shows that water will reach its own level. Elizabeth Petrovsky is going to be the Joan of Arc of the labor movement. No, Mrs. Baker didn't show up at the wedding. I hear the family has moved to Philadelphia to live down the disgrace. But you ought to have seen Bessie, the pride of the ghetto, in cotton lace and silkaline, as happy as a queen at last. It was she gave me the tip about this Belle Charmian affair. Belle Charmian? Fenton was on his feet at a bound. Would you mind telling me who the devil Belle Charmian is? I've been hearing about her all the evening. You have? It was the reporter now who was eager. What have you heard about her? There was little enough for Fenton to tell, except that the name had come to him, repeated time after time, often enough to arouse his curiosity. He mentioned the fortune-teller's prediction, the chauffeur's story, and the magazine mention he had found. The reporter was disappointed. I thought I told you she was the girl I was trailing, he explained. There's a big story broken tonight, and she's wanted. Bad. But what is Belle Charmian doing down in this part of town? Fenton asked, puzzled. Oh, she's got the sociological bug or something, too. Why, it was Miss Charmian told Elizabeth Baker about how the other half lives and all that. I knew she was interested in settlements and so on, and so I hiked down here and chased up the social uplifters. I got a tip that she was living along here somewhere under an assumed name, and gets home about half-past ten. That's why I wanted to wait. If she doesn't show up by eleven, you can have my best breeches. He suddenly darted back into the doorway, pulling Fenton with him. By Jove, I believe that's her now, he whispered. Fenton saw a young lady approaching, walking briskly toward them. She was quietly clad in grey, and neither her carriage nor her costume were those of a working girl. There was a street lamp in front of the entrance to the tenement house, and as she approached it, she was more and more clearly illuminated. Something about her face struck him clearly, as if he half recognized it. Then just before the shadow of the lamp blotted it out, his heart suddenly stopped beating. It was the girl of the photograph. It was the girl of his dream. It was the girl with the level eyebrows, the whimsical smile. It is Miss Charmian, by Jiminy, the reporter exclaimed, and he advanced toward her. 
the girl appeared to catch the words for she turned with a quick glance at the two young men her eyes fell upon fenton and rested there for a moment with an expression of surprised interest her glance met his and in that instant a flash almost of recognition seemed to pass between them then richmond approached and accosted her she answered without stopping and still speaking to her he walked along by her side in another minute the two conversing with animation miss charmion showing eager interest had turned the corner and were gone end of chapter five chapter six of find the woman this librivox recording is in the public domain find the woman by gillette burgess chapter six the suite at the plaza how john fenton encountered a friendly gentleman and was given the possession of his home and of the lady who appeared there in tears there he was therefore alone without a cent in his pockets without a hat without anything to pawn for his fare up town in dirty brown overalls he had not even the locket to gain which he had taken so desperate a risk but worse far worse than all that he had lost his only chance of finding the girl whose picture had for four months exercised so potent an effect upon his heart he knew now from that one glance at her face that he was in love with her all that he had read into her features during his lonely hours of communion with the portrait he had seen living and charming and piquant and kissable as she paused under the lamp and now she was gone again into the night into the mystery their paths had crossed once would they cross again when he wandered along with this thought up to the bowery where at the curb beside a taxicab he saw a large well-dressed man in a shaggy overcoat and silk hat lighting a cigar instantly fenton awoke to his mission and the necessity for getting up town the octoroon and the caretaker should be notified as soon as possible of the loss of the diamonds he walked up and touched the gentleman's arm just as he was about to enter the cab before fenton could speak the man threw him an angry look see here said fenton i'm not a beggar i've just had an accident that's all and i want to get up town i haven't a cent on me the man looked him up and down through his eyeglasses then began to laugh well he said that's a new story on me what's the little game as i said fenton insisted i've got to get up to harlem where i can get some money and a hat and a pair of trousers will you give me a lift or not again the gentleman looked him over pulling his long black moustache the while his face was handsome and genial a type of the affable experienced man about town finally he laughed and said well i'll take a chance i'm only going up as far as the plaza but you can come along if you want to jump in they entered the cab and it started off up town the stranger still eyed fenton interestedly buncoed he asked finally by this time fenton had learned discretion oh no a rather poor practical joke that's all a lot of my fool friends got me drunk my wedding day you know that's why i'm in a joyous hurry the explanation went as it had gone before and again the stranger laughed oh if that's the case he said i guess i can fix you up come up to my place and i'll give you a hat and a pair of trousers anyway make it a whole suit if you like that coat of yours is hardly fit for a marriage ceremony fenton played his part thanked the man effusively and the trip was made up town with considerable friendly conversation the man's name he learned was spruel he was married but his wife was out of town and not expected home till tomorrow spruel had just finished up a big business deal and was off for a three months trip on another as soon as he could pack his grip at the plaza and get away he had an easy good nature a facile manner and had evidently seen much of the world but in spite of his jokes and glib stories fenton noticed that mr spruel had something serious on his mind was it his intended trip to south america on business why then should he keep such a sharp lookout to right and left as the cab drove rapidly up fifth avenue 
Once, when the cab was forced to stop because of a block near 34th Street, Sproul grew visibly nervous and cursed under his breath. At the Plaza Hotel he jumped out, gave a quick look around, told the chauffeur to wait, and motioned to Fenton to follow. As he entered the elevator, Fenton caught in the tail of his eye a man coming into the hotel. Where had he seen him before? As the elevator stopped at the tenth floor, he placed him. The man in the shepherd's plaid suit he had noticed at Sheffield Hall. It was queer. On the Fifth Avenue side, Sproul opened a door with a key he took from his pocket. Fenton entered with him. They found themselves in the private hall of the suite, already lighted, and Sproul led the way to a small bedroom, opened a closet, and took out a suit of gray tweeds and a derby hat. Here you are, he said. Get into these, and you can return them when you have time. No hurry about it. They belong to my man, and I think they'll fit you well enough. Not much of a wedding suit, but I guess the blushing bride won't care. Now, excuse me a minute. That confounded telephone bell's ringing. He left Fenton and walked to the end of the hall and into a parlor. Here his voice could be heard speaking, though the words could not be distinguished. Fenton began to take off his overalls, looking about the room with curiosity. It seemed to have been used by Sproul's valet. A few flashy pictures had been pinned to the walls. Photographs of racehorses, actresses, and flying machines were stuck about the mirror. Fenton, getting into the tweed trousers, walked to the glass. Upon the dresser was a business card reading, Nallery Mining and Investment Company, St. Paul Building, New York. He was half-dressed when Sproul came in, looking anxious. See here, he said, I've had an important call, and I've got to get downtown in a hurry. Do you mind if I leave you here? You can just shut the door when you're dressed. I guess I can trust you. Fenton stared at him in amazement. What? Leave me here all alone in your apartment? A stranger? Sure, said Sproul. You're all right. I know faces pretty well, and I'll take a chance that you're honest. Anyway, I got to go right away. I can be ready in a minute, said Fenton. I can't wait a minute. It'll be all right. Good-bye. And cramming on his top hat and lighting a cigar, Sproul waved his hand and disappeared. Fenton, left alone, stood for a while in wonder, then slowly finished dressing and finally looked about. As he had entered the private hall, the suite showed by its furnishings evidences of wealth, luxury, taste. How could the proprietor trust him there alone? It was too much for him. At any rate, he would leave as soon as possible, before anything happened. Perhaps it was some clever trick to accuse him of theft, or worse. It looked bad. He had just opened the door of the chamber to make his exit, when he heard a key turn in the door to the corridor. Instantly he drew back, almost closed the door, and listened. Somebody came in. Then he heard sobbing, a woman's heart-broken voice. She passed into the parlor at the end of the hall. The electric lights were turned on. The weeping kept on continuously, now rising in hysterical bursts of agony, now falling into low convulsive sobs. What was he to do? Leave silently, unperceived? But he might be caught in the act. For a while he hesitated, then he sat down on a chair to think. Suddenly he sprang up. Steps were coming down the hall. He heard the clack of heels upon the parquetry. Then before he could think what to do, his door was slowly opened, and a woman came in, still weeping, caught sight of him, and stood still staring, her lips parted, her blue eyes dewy with tears. She was a lady of some thirty years, tall and beautiful, blonde with masses of fluffy yellow hair, under an enormous white beaver hat, picturesque with white plumes. Her mouth was curved in a tremulous bow, and little white teeth sparkled deliciously. As she stood there, framed in the opening of the door, all in white broadcloth, touched at the neck and wrists with white fur, she looked like some sudden delightful apparition come to haunt him. But great as was his surprise, hers was evidently greater, forbidding, for a moment, her speech. 
She stood with a smallish black leather case in her hand, looking at him. I beg your pardon, Fenton began, in embarrassment. But Mr. Sproule left me here to put on these clothes he lent me. Who? she stammered. Why, Mr. Sproule, your husband, I presume, is he not? My name is Mrs. Elkhurst. I don't see what you're doing here. I don't understand. And she backed into the hall, still staring as if frightened of him. He said he lived here. A large gentleman with a black moustache and a red face. He wore glasses. Oh! She gave a little cry and covered her face with her hands. The package she had been holding dropped to the floor. He lent me this suit, as by an accident I had injured mine. She was sobbing again. He said his wife wouldn't be back till tomorrow. Where has he gone? she demanded, turning to him, her face suddenly set, hard and stern. He was called away on urgent business. He had a telephone call. I don't know from whom. Without replying, the lady turned, ran into an adjoining chamber, and Fenton could hear her pulling open drawers, opening and shutting doors, searching here and there. He waited a few minutes, uncertain what to do, when, looking down, he saw on the floor the package she had dropped. The case had opened, and half in and half out of it lay a string of brilliant red stones, shining like hot coals of fire. He bent down and was picking up the necklace when she burst out of the room. Disregarding Fenton, she walked unsteadily to the end of the hall and into the parlor. He followed her, awkwardly enough, the necklace dangling from his hand, to find her with her head on her arms, sitting at a Boole secretary. Fenton approached her with misgivings. Here's something you dropped, he said, and placed the jewels upon the table. Then, distressed at her emotion, he added, Can't you tell me what the matter is? Of course I am a stranger to you, but fate seems to have led me here, and perhaps it was that I might help you. I wish I might do something, if you could trust me. She threw up her head and dashed away the tears, then looked at him with her brows knitted. Fenton saw that she held, crushed between her fingers, a letter. Who are you? she asked. For a moment Fenton hesitated. At first his impulse was to confide in her, but the events of the night had made him cautious. He told him, therefore, only his name and business, and of his meeting with Sproule on the Bowery. The mention of the man renewed her distress. She rose, walked up and down a moment, then returned to him as if decided upon something. It is good of you to offer to help me, she said, but I am afraid my trouble is past mending. You look kind and honest. I believe that you have told me the truth. You must believe the same of me, for I am going to tell you my story. You will see that I have good enough cause for tears. She took the ruby necklace and sat down on a huge couch. As she told her story, she fingered the jewels nervously, pausing to control herself from time to time as her emotions swept over her like a storm. The Twenty-Seven Drops of Blood We have to pay for everything in this world everything. Even when we think we've paid, there's more, and still more. I thought I had paid for this necklace, paid in blood and tears, but I've had to pay again and again, and still it isn't paid for. I wonder when it will be over, and the score crossed off. You have heard of kleptomania? No doubt you've often smiled and thought it a polite name for common theft. It isn't. Oh, believe me, it isn't. It isn't a mere habit, either. It's a disease. It's one of the hardest things in the world to cure. Ask any alienist. All the same, I have cured myself. But God, what a fight! Night and day, day and night for years, before I won. It cost me years of struggle. My sufferings have been indescribable. But I persisted against all kinds of temptation. But even then I knew I would never have won but for my love for a man. And now, but let me begin at the beginning. I want you to understand. My family is one of the best known and most highly respected in Philadelphia. I have had everything. Youth, beauty, wealth, education, social position. You wouldn't think it possible for such a girl to go wrong, would you? And yet somehow it is usually just such persons who have this disease. Why is it? I don't know. Some subtle perversity in human nature some complex reaction to environment. 
Well, it doesn't matter. Psychologists seem to know little about this abnormal condition. I've talked to all the authorities on nervous disorders. Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Prince, everybody of any fame. I've tried Mall and the English authorities, the Salpetriere people in Paris, hypnotists, even theosophists and Christian scientists. They simply don't know anything about it. My own theory is that it's a form of dissociated personality, a sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde duality struggling in one for the mastery. Perhaps it's a form of insanity. I don't know. Nobody knows. It's a curious thing, kleptomania. Oh, it's interesting enough to one outside of it. I can talk about it now. One of its peculiar features is that one becomes so extraordinarily sly. There seems to be a sympathetic intellectual stimulus that sharpens one's faculties wonderfully. One's mind has, while one has the obsession, a touch of genius. It is like degeneracy. We can scarcely tell cause from effect. There is a vicious circle. One can't tell whether mental keenness produces the desire to steal, or the desire to steal educates one's wits. The point is, one becomes clever at it. I know now, positively, how great criminals think, how they plot and contrive, how they stake their brains against law and order. I know how they develop, how they progress. Their first amateurish schemes are intricate and complicated. It isn't till later in life that they achieve the more daringly simple crimes which succeed by their very audacity. Have you read Poe's purloined letter? You know, the man who hid a valuable letter in plain sight? That's the sort of acumen we have, the best of us, those who have developed a special sense for it, a craft, a refined cunning. You hear of the arrest of ordinary shoplifters every day, but my kind is seldom caught. They can't be detected. They are inspired by something too sapient, shrewd, acute. Well, the first time, let's see, I was about eighteen. I was visiting an old school friend in the south. She had a Scotch cairngorm, one of those common brooches, with coloured stones you can buy in any shop in Edinburgh for ten shillings. Somehow it attracted my fancy. You see, it seems to be characteristic of our mania to be fascinated by objects without regard to their intrinsic value. I've stolen things I'd never think of using. Burnt matches, old newspapers, toothbrushes even. When the fatal impulse comes, one has to steal, that's all. I've risked my reputation for a birch bark napkin ring. That's the way we are. The Cairngorm lay on Ethel's dressing table. She and I were in the room with a colored maid. When neither was looking, I took the brooch and hid it in my dress. I waited till the maid had gone, and then I asked for it. The maid was accused, and when she denied all knowledge of it, poor girl, was dismissed. She had been with the family all her life. Wasn't it awful? But it was curious how little it affected me. There's some sort of moral opium it distills. One doesn't care what wretchedness or injustice one inflicts. Oh, it's hideous. So it went on, year after year, the stealing sometimes in shops, sometimes in the houses of my friends, in public buildings, anywhere the fit seized me. I took everything my mania fancied. Often I threw the things away as soon as I had secured them. Sometimes I replaced them. You have no idea what queer vagaries one has, how one will wait for days, weeks, for a chance to act. The obsession is, for the time being, the most important thing in one's life. But there's one thing you must understand and believe. It was only one particular detail that was wrong with my moral sense, not a general perversion. It's like paranoia. It seems to have nothing to do with other parts of one's morality. One can be kind, pure, temperate, unselfish in everything else, in everything that doesn't bear on this special act. You're a man and you must perceive how such a thing can be. Haven't you known dissipated men who are generous and loyal? If a man is selfish, he's usually bad all over. 
but if he is a drunkard he can still be affectionate so i hope you won't think of me then as wholly vile i stole in this freakish way because i was irresistibly impelled to but otherwise i think i was as good as any woman could be indeed knowing my fault i tried the harder to make my life better in other ways have you ever heard that sometimes when a man's shot they don't remove the bullet if it lodges in a part where there's no danger or inconvenience they let it stay and a cyst is formed around it so that it is completely surrounded and it can't poison the system well this thing seemed like that with me it seemed to be apart from my normal moral sense but a moral sore can't really heal like that i suppose it's always malignant it has to be cut out or it grows well this trait did grow i took more and more i became more cunning i have never been caught or even suspected to this day i grew bolder with every success bolder but never reckless every move was thought out like a game of chess then came the necklace affair that was the climax a year ago i was in paris with my mother we had many acquaintances in the best circles in the sorbonne in the academy in the deputies in the old noblesse of the faubourg saint germain one of my best friends was the contessa de scarpi a roman lady of an old italian family she had a little necklace of rubies here it is pretty isn't it yet i always think of it as twenty-seven drops of blood that necklace i had to have i knew i should try for it knew i should get it knew i should not be discovered in the theft i did succeed here it is have you examined it the stones are small but flawless it is exquisitely designed seventeenth century workmanship it is worth i should say about forty thousand dollars but i have never worn it scarcely even looked at it since i got it all my pleasure was in the winning of it it cost me nothing i thought nothing god the cost was terrific listen because of my theft two sisters became estranged an ambitious and talented young naval lieutenant shot himself oh he was so handsome so splendid a half-dozen family servants lost their places and could never find other employment all this i knew but i didn't care can you imagine it i didn't care it was as if i were drugged all i thought was the necklace is mine you must loathe me now but you must hear me out i want you to know to what degradation i had fallen how lost i was how hopeless how pitiful i want you to see what i had to climb out of i got out of the country with it all sorts of rewards were offered for it numberless detectives put on the search and i sailed for home when i passed through the custom house i hid it in my hair you should have seen me look that young inspector in the eye i had a sort of insolence i was so sure of myself i'm sure all great criminals must feel that sense of power it's wonderful exhilarating it's like the courage of a brave soldier under fire nothing could possibly harm me i was sure it was as if i dealt in potent magic so i got home with my mother poor mother if she only knew strange one can never tell the most important things in our lives to one's best friends one lies only to those one loves then i met a man the man of all the world for me the only human being who could ever change me love has a strange alchemy one can't explain why try to explain it one is attracted or one is repelled in spite of oneself schopenhauer calls it the spirit of the race seeking reincarnation i prefer the poetic interpretation for me romance never mind anyway i fell in love immediately desperately love is a terrible thing it took hold of me to me herbert was perfect all that was best and finest of manhood i thought of him almost as one thinks of the great heroes of history washington goethe alexander he was my bonny prince charlie my king could do no wrong and so as soon as i found my heart was gone 
I got my first real sight of my mania. I saw the horrible thing it had become. I felt as if I were a leper. If he had found me out, I would have died of shame. And later, when I saw that he actually loved me, it was wonderful. I spent night after night weeping at the impossibility of my ever marrying him. For to me he was as spotlessly pure and honorable as a god, and I was unworthy to be his wife. So when he proposed, I refused him. When he wanted to know my reason, I couldn't tell. Then he began to make love to me, so ardently, that I was alternately delirious with joy and tortured with horrible remorse. It was unbearable. One night he swept me off my feet, and I accepted him. Oh, in my heart I promised myself at the same time that I would never marry him till I had cast out the devil that was possessing me. It seemed so easy at the time. His strength seemed to make me strong. I felt that the inspiration of his love and trust would exalt my will. Wait, can you imagine a young man who has sown his wild oats, converted and taking holy orders, and feeling sure that nothing could ever tempt him again? That was how I felt. I felt that my love would change my whole character in a single day. Things aren't so easy as that in this world. We have to pay. Always we have to pay. We have to pay again and again. I suppose you have never taken morphine or opium or cocaine. I hope not. But you must have heard what a fight it is, how terribly difficult it is to stop the habit. It isn't impossible, though. Why, one time I took cocaine steadily, every day, for two months. I just had to see if my will was diseased, too, if I had any strength at all left in me. Shaw, I stopped in a day. I laughed at it. It was nothing. But this thing was different. It had grown like a monster in me. I was so in its power that to keep my fingers from anything I craved. Well, can you refrain from drinking when you're thirsty? It was like that. Worse. A thousand times worse. I fought it night and day, though. I was determined to win, for his sake. I fought it as one fights a terrible nightmare. For a long time I made no headway. I stole things, even while I was with him. Can you imagine anything more horrible? Remember how I loved him. It was damnable. Then one day I was nearly caught. I had slipped a red Morocco-bound book into my muff at a house where I was calling for the first time. I dropped my muff. By a queer chance it fell on end, and stood on the floor, curiously upright. He bent down to pick it up for me. I was just a second too quick for him. How my heart beat! He would certainly have seen the book. I couldn't have explained it, possibly. It would have ended everything. So I redoubled my efforts to cure myself by sheer will. I went scarcely anywhere, and never alone. I had pockets put in my coat, and kept my hands in them. I schooled myself to think every minute, to be on my guard incessantly. Well, I improved rapidly after that. When I had taken nothing for six months, I set the day for the wedding. That was a happy time. My only bugbear was the necklace. You've been wondering why I had not already returned it. It was impossible. Even had I been able to go abroad, I knew of no safe way of returning it. Had I sent it, it would surely have been traced. Think it over, as I did, through many a sleepless night and you'll see how difficult it would have been. There were the customs again, the post office authorities, to suspect and examine any package, the express company's invoice. There was the danger of theft. But the Scarpies were traveling in the Far East. I didn't even know their address. The only thing I could do was to wait for my chance. I had no one to trust, no one I dared tell. After we were married, I kept the necklace hidden in a secret compartment of my jewel chest. I dreamed of it all through my honeymoon, the most delicious honeymoon any bride ever spent, except for that. That was six months ago. Now it seems six years. Ah, well, when I first met Herbert, I thought he was a broker. Everyone thinks that now, except those few that know. But after I was married, he confessed to me that he was a detective. 
He told me he was employed by several big corporations, at a large salary, to work on especially difficult or delicate cases. His value depended upon people not knowing his real occupation. Passing as a broker, he could go into the best society, and no one suspected him. It was a shock to me at first, but I got used to it. Now that I had recovered from my mania, my spirits went up sky high. It was like getting my youth back again. I was like a young girl. How Herbert used to laugh at my spirits. I was free now, to love him, freely, as wildly as I wished. I let myself go. No woman was ever so proud of her husband. And I was proud of myself, too. Why shouldn't I be? I had conquered as desperate an evil as any woman ever fought. But there was still the necklace. Twenty-seven drops of blood. A detective is a dangerous person to attempt to hide a thing from. I was mortally afraid he would discover my secret. We went everywhere. I had a wide acquaintance. Baltimore, Washington, New York. Herbert went with me. He seemed to like the dinners, the musicales, dances, teas, bridge parties. I was proud of him. Everybody liked him. He was a social success. He never refused an invitation unless his duties called him away. Sometimes he had to be absent for a week or so at a time, and of course owing to the nature of his profession, he could tell me nothing of his affairs. Occasionally he was unexpectedly out all night. Except for these absences and the necklace, I was gloriously happy. Herbert was still a lover more than a husband. He gave me presents often. A week ago an old Vassar friend of mine came to me with such a pathetic story. It's her private affair, and I can't tell it to you. It doesn't matter, anyway, except that, for a particular reason, she was most anxious to make an impression at a dance in New Haven. Her whole future was at stake. She was awfully hard up. She had nothing, and asked me to help her. So I lent her a gown, gloves, and a few things like that. She was so pathetically grateful and happy that just before she left, I thought of the necklace, and carried away by my sympathy, I offered it to her for the dance. At first she didn't want the responsibility of it. She refused, but I could see that she was crazy to wear it. It was the finishing touch to her costume. So I insisted, and she took it away. I was glad, after all. The necklace had caused so much suffering that it seemed to me it was right to use it for once, to make someone happy. Last night, when my husband came home, I felt something was wrong. You know, a woman gets things. I didn't feel right near him. I can't express it in any other way. There was some constraint about him I had never felt before. I simply got something near him, and it made me fearfully nervous, depressed. But outwardly he was the same as ever, and my first impression wore off a little. Then, when he said he had a present for me, I was all right again, and hated myself for thinking anything sinister. The reaction carried me into high spirits. I loved him more than ever. I thought him the purest and the best. Oh, how I tried to make up for my momentary injustice. A present. He had such an adorable way of presenting things. It made them vastly more valuable. I buzzed round him like a hummingbird in my delight. He took a package out of his pocket and handed it to me, after I had paid him in kisses. I was as happily impatient as a child. I snapped the string, laughing, tore off the paper, opened the little leather case. This necklace was inside. My necklace, which I had lent my friend a few days before. Twenty-seven drops of blood. I suppose I must have thanked him, somehow. I may have kissed him again with that horrible thing in my hand. Women are strange creatures. The most ignorant woman can become a great actress under the stress of emotion. The ages have taught us to defend ourselves. Some maternal instinct inspires us. But what I did, or what I said, I don't know. It seems so long ago, and it was only last night. I think he suspected nothing. I remember that I pleaded a headache and got off to my room somehow, locked the door and went to bed. He knocked later and said, Good night, girlie. 
It comes back to me now, but at the time I hardly realized it. The ruby necklace, my brain whirled with it. It was the most horrible night I had ever spent. What did it mean? Oh, I went over and over it till I thought I should go mad. Had he discovered my secret? Had he had a similar necklace made? I thought of every explanation except the right one. This morning I found I couldn't stand it unless I learned the truth immediately. When he left, I told him I was going to visit a friend in Poughkeepsie overnight. He said he might be gone himself when I returned. We parted as we had never parted before. Something horrible was between us. I thought at the time that he felt it, too. Now I know he did. I took the first train to New Haven. On the way there, a fearful thought came to me. You know, I told you we used to visit together. Well, I recalled that soon after my marriage, we spent a weekend with some friends in Wilmington. A few days afterward, burglars entered the house and stole considerable jewelry and silverware. Nobody thought anything of it till another home was robbed in Richmond shortly after we had been there. Then they began to call me a hoodoo and laugh at me. It was a good joke for a while, especially as it happened once or twice later. I thought of it only as a queer coincidence. Now, as I recalled the facts, the idea grew like wildfire. It burned me up. I couldn't stand the suspense. It seemed as if I pushed the train all the way to New Haven. I found my little friend in tears. Oh, I suppose you have guessed what I never suspected. Her house had been robbed the day after the dance, and the necklace was gone. I was the wife of a burglar, or at least my husband was the associate of burglars. The man for whom I had fought my fight, for whom I had won, the man whose love inspired me, was a criminal. You can imagine my situation. I had to comfort my friend who was almost distracted at the loss of the necklace, and I had it in my purse all the time. I had to tell her I was sure it would be found. I had to leave her with that burden on her conscience, knowing that she would probably work her fingers off trying to make up the loss to me. How could I tell her the truth? What could I say? I could only hope some time to arrange it so that the thing might seem to be recovered. I left her with a broken heart. Well, mine was breaking, too. Then, on the way back to New York, I began to see things more plainly. My love pleaded for him. After all, was he much worse than I? He was a thief, but had not I been a thief myself for ten years? I had fought for my own salvation and won. Couldn't I fight for his and win also? My love came back in a great flood. I determined to save him. I almost rejoiced at the opportunity it would give me of showing how much I loved him. Wasn't it my duty, what a wife should do? The thought uplifted me. None the less, when I entered the door here and saw all the old familiar sights, the place where I had been so happy, I couldn't help breaking down and crying. I thought it was all over forever. The secrecy, the pain, the struggle, the danger. But I nerved myself and determined to go on through with that and worse if necessary for herbert's sake and god willing i would win him back as i had won myself well you must have heard me crying do you know what stopped my tears what was too deep oh far too deep for tears on my dressing-table i found a note saying that he had left me forever john fenton confronted a second time that night with a woman's broken heart knew not what to say. Mrs. Elkers arose deliberately, with a hard, set face, and replaced the ruby necklace in the case. Then she shrugged her shoulders and turned to him. You understand now why I think of those stones as drops of blood. Well, what shall I do? That's the question. Of course I can arrange to have the necklace found. To say it is, without publicity or else my friend's life will be ruined also. But what about my husband? I can't think of him as a burglar, Fenton said. It seems impossible. He was so good-natured, so refined. He had so much charm. Oh, it was precisely that which made him useful, said Mrs. Elkhurst. Of course he did none of the actual work himself. He didn't have that kind of skill. I've been thinking it over, 
and I have come to the conclusion that he must have merely located the jewels, or whatever they were after. Don't you see? That's why he was so willing to visit at my friend's houses. I can remember now that he used sometimes to excuse himself when we were all downstairs and run up for a handkerchief or something like that for an excuse. He was looking about. I have no doubt that he watched outside, too, while the house was being entered. Do you know any others of the gang? Fenton asked. I suspect only one, an Irishman. He came once or twice here to see Herbert, but my husband always managed to keep me away from him. An Irishman, Fenton immediately thought of Mangus O'Shea, a rough, ugly-looking man with little reddish eyes and black broken teeth. I think his name was Nallery. Fenton jumped up and ran back to the room where he had changed his clothes, returning with the business card he had seen on the valet's bureau. He handed it to Mrs. Elkhurst. Do you know anything about that? he asked. She looked at it and knit her brows. Look in the telephone book, she said finally, and see what the number is. I think it's, let's see, a queer number, something like Wall 9991. I heard my husband call it up. Fenton picked up the telephone directory and found it. Wall 9191, he read. Yes, I think that's it. And now I remember overhearing Herbert talking about some diamonds once or twice. Perhaps it is the headquarters of his gang. I believe it will pay investigating, at any rate. Fenton arose as if to go. Investigating? What do you mean? said Mrs. Elkhurst. Are you? You're not a detective. She grew pale. Fenton narrated the incidents that had made that night for him one long, extravagant adventure. The tale was so incredible that he was almost ashamed to tell it, but the lady's interest was keen and deep. When he came to the Mangus O'Shea part of his story, she frowned and nodded. Ah, she said, when he had finished, that settles it. I can see now what happened. Herbert and Nallery, or O'Shea as you call him, have undoubtedly been on the track of the jewels, watching their chance. How they ever suspected the octoroon had them, I can't see, but the rest is easy. Once having followed her, and seen you, they suspected that she had given them to you for safe keeping. I would eliminate the cross-eyed cabman entirely. He probably stumbled on to a part of the thing accidentally, and was only trying for blackmail. Still, the gang may have got hold of him, too. When they took you to the pigeon loft, Herbert stayed outside on the watch and perhaps he was given a few of the smaller stones to raise ready money upon at some pawn-shop. It's the more likely, because of late my husband has been complaining of being hard up. I remember he said he had bought the ruby necklace on credit. At the time I was too excited to wonder at that. What can we do? If I cannot reform my husband, I can at least try to prevent his crime from being successful. It seems to me I must do that. There is nothing you can do that I see, said Fenton. But as for me, I am determined to follow them up right away. I doubt if I can do anything against them, for the gang must be clever and desperate. But I can at least try. Now I am into this plot, I am going to do what I can. The first thing is to get hold of the octoroon and report. He took up the telephone and called up the King William Hotel. No Miss Green was registered there. That puzzled and worried him but he got, after much talk with information, the number of the Flint flat at 146th Street, though there was no answer to the phone. He hung up the receiver in disgust. Well, he said, I must get downtown immediately. What shall you do? I am going to my mother in Philadelphia the first thing in the morning, she said. I am going to tell her everything. I hope it will not break her heart, but, oh, I am so lonely. After Fenton had pressed her hand, bid her good-bye, and walked to the door. He turned back to look at her. She was sitting at the table, with her head bowed in her hands, sobbing. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Find the Woman This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Find the Woman by Gillette Burgess Chapter 7. The Caxton Dining Room. 
how fenton met belle charmion a second time was entertained by two professional beauties became a hero and secured his carfare john fenton did not forbear casting a glance at himself in the narrow mirror as he descended the elevator the grey tweed suit fitted him miraculously and it bore the cut of a good tailor the change of costume excited him deliciously he felt ready now for a new adventure ready to play a courageous part he fingered the fine soft wool with surreptitious delight he set the brown derby hat at a careless angle on the back of his head he flattered himself that he knew how to wear clothes and was not averse to showing himself in this spotless well-pressed costume in the lobby of the hotel mrs elkhurst's narrative had steadied him but he was still young and full of the joy of life the touch of vanity in him only gave him a trace of boyishness he plunged into the aromatic maze of feathers silks and furs that thronged the lobby with his head erect he was as good as anybody he wove jauntily in and out between the ladies and gentlemen in evening dress that crowded the corridors caught glimpses of merry diners kindled to the strains of an orchestra drinking in the atmosphere of wealth and pleasure then round a corner came belle charmion it was as sudden as that she gave him a quick look and paused he got as an impression of her only two soft hazel eyes glancing humorously at him and the smooth shadows of black lynx furs he came to a stop to gaze at her and she suddenly turned i beg pardon she said but aren't you then she blushed vividly oh i beg your pardon she added hastily i thought you were someone else she cast down her eyes confused and walked hurriedly away john fenton turned and stared after her his heart beating what new mystery was this that brought his dream girl to him face to face that made her pause speak only to hasten away for a moment he was inclined to start after her but already she was lost in the crowd he had a second time let his opportunity slip away from him who was she for whom had she taken him what had she wished to say belle charmion too much excited by the encounter to enjoy the scene any longer he went out the revolving door and turned west at fifty-ninth street toward columbus circle making for the subway he was halfway across seventh avenue before his mind wandering from belcharmion for an instant lit upon the subject of car fare eagerly he went through the pockets of the grey tweed suit not a dime nickel or penny did he find nothing save a quill toothpick and a leaf from the wrapper of a wheeling stogie he had dallied too long at the plaza already the lady of the ruby necklace must have left for the train to philadelphia from fifty-ninth street to wall street is five hard weary miles to walk it would take an hour and a half at least if he could not think of some way to raise at least five cents his adventure would conclude in nothing more exciting than a midnight tramp to a lonely bed there to vanish in misty dreams of what might have been he turned down seventh avenue therefore his wits working at the problem keeping his eyes open the while for any possible answer to it which might casually approach him but seventh avenue was almost free of wayfarers a policeman regarded him with an icy eye he passed a flushed youth saying good-bye to a pretty girl with an eighty-five dollar hat he passed a small horde of waiting conductors and motormen at the car barns in none of these did he find the answer to his riddle past the blinking electric signs heralding the glad fact that h and l corsets make the female form divine past theatres just ready to belch forth their victims john fenton betweeded and anxious strolled he was thinking thinking not of belle charmion or mrs elkhurst now not of the octoroon or the liars but of the one elusive nickel he needed for carfare to carry him further on this arabian night's entertainment he came to the hotel caxton and paused here he was at the centre of new york's night-life 
the halfway station of gay rounders one of the lighthouses of long acre square one of the many palaces of oysters lobsters and champagne fenton was a sober enough youth he knew this aspect of the metropolis mainly through the newspapers but he was stimulated by feeling that he was now in the locus of lively things in a minute a rush of theatre-goers was upon him and he was swept along hardly knowing why he entered the caxton and stood in the lobby to devise some plan he wondered how confidence men worked their games he knew that in this part of the city clever wits were as good as ready money how could he work it but there was little need for fenton's solicitude fate had him in hand that night and there in the lobby of the hotel two lovely ladies had already marked him for their own they might have posed as night and day so brilliantly were they contrasted one was a sparkling brunette black of hair and eye red of cheek vivacious radiant most gorgeously alive the other was a super blonde her hair sportive in ringlets charmingly careless was shaded from gold to silver her eyes were violets she was the sunny languorous type passive yet more compelling than she of the dark darting eye fenton at his first glance at her knew that hundreds of men must have been inflamed by her beauty in it there was little subtlety it was a highwayman beauty it cried hands up the other the brunette was however something more than pretty one looked twice and found something new to admire her attraction had depths one longed to penetrate they stood these two attired in furs and feathers silks and lace waiting by the door of the dining-room and looked at him fenton felt something extraordinary in their glance it was suspiciously friendly when they smiled and nodded at him he felt uncomfortable their beauty was something too dangerous and he walked uneasily away in a moment however a hall-boy overtook him fenton was informed that the two ladies wished to speak with him so amazed at the honour and wondering what new trick was now to be turned he walked over to them and lifted the brown derby the brunette's black eyes sparkled and she showed her pretty teeth as she held out a white-gloved hand say kid you ain't going to cut an old friend are you don't do anything like that fenton mumbled a kind of blurred apology why i believe you don't remember me she complained the blonde's lip curled in a faint smile she shrugged her fur-clad shoulders and looked away where was it i saw you said fenton puzzled fishing for some hint that would give him his cue the brunette laughed merrily the last time i see you you was hanging to the ropes when jack ketchell was given the decision no wonder you forgot me the blonde looked dreamily off toward the theatre office desk she seemed to be in a world of her own fenton realized that the mistake was sincere he had evidently been taken for some pugilist with whom the brunette had had a passing acquaintance the question was who was he he searched his memory for the name of jack ketchell's unfortunate opponent no answer the only knowledge fenton had of current fistic events was derived from the smart talk of a precocious office boy at the drafting room still any port was good in a storm and fenton thought he might turn the mistake to his advantage in some way perhaps these two beauties would pilot him out of his straits he grinned his best therefore and shifted his feet so you was at the fight he asked then it occurred to him that the part of pugilist needed more color he emulated the tough office boy and his talk say he said getting into the swing of it say was you wise to the fact that i fit them last three rounds with a broke thumb look at there he held out his right hand and wiggled the thumb trickily the brunette felt of it daintily what you expect i could do with a pin like that he asked triumphantly i thought you was a little off your feed the brunette said i was overtrained too fine said fenton next time i'll get him and i'll get him good then hoping to discover his name by the ruse he asked 
Say, give me a knockdown to your friend, Miss Peach Alamelba. The blonde so designated turned her head and seemed to approach slowly from miles away. Her smile was but a shadow as she looked at him as if for the first time conscious of his presence. Miss Diamond, said the brunette, shake hands with Wack Harrison, ex-middleweight champion of the U.S. She turned to Fenton. Is that right, Wack? Fenton was thus much relieved. He at least knew his name. How long he could maintain the impersonation was another matter. It was a parlous role. The blonde, named Diamond, extended her fingers. Fenton thought it not out of character to squeeze them with a nutcracker grip. It might at least bring the yellow-haired girl to life. It did. Gee, she exclaimed, shaking her hand in pain. You must think you're shaking with Kilgore before a fight. That ain't no way to shake hands with a lady. She tossed up her head in scorn. That's right, said Fenton. But you see, when I do make connections with a wonder worker like you, it's hard work breaking away from the clinch. I guessed you hypnotized me for fair. I ain't used to gold queens much. Sort of takes my breath away, and I act foolish. The blonde could not help smiling, and the ice was broken. Fenton began to wonder what the brunette's name was, and how to find out when Miss Diamond herself supplied the information. She elevated her golden eyebrows and said, Say, Millie, how about the eats? I'm all in. That's right, said the brunette. Whack! We was just going in to dissect a lobster and do a little drown in the fizz. Won't you be among them present? Her black eyes tore through him. Fenton was conscious that everyone in the hotel lobby was staring at them. Sure thing, he said and then added commandingly that is if you eat on me nothing like that in my family said milly gaily i just drew my alimony i'm just padded with greenbacks none of that suffragette stuff said fenton sternly keenly conscious that he could not pay for a postage stamp don't you get gay boyo don't you know i invited you be good now and come on in well we'll settle it later said fenton and threw all responsibility to the winds, leading the way to a table. He threw out his chest and his elbows as he walked, strutting as nearly like the pictures he had seen in Puck as he could do it. Oh, if he had only listened more carefully to that office boy! As they sat down, everyone in the restaurant turned to look at the party. Was it on account of the miraculous blonde? She would have attracted attention in a herd of angels. Was it on account of the saucily pretty brunette, the dainty devil in petticoats with her flashing eyes? No, Fenton realized with a sudden pang of alarm that they had turned to stare at Wack Harrison, the ex-welterweight champion of America. The responsibility of his role almost overcame him. If he were to act the pugilist, there might be deeds as well as words required. Who could tell what turn of the wheel might force him to make good with his fists? Such hero-worship as that with which the two ladies flattered him might be a bit too dangerous. He had never had a real out-and-out -out fight in his life. Lo, he had swaggered into the hotel full of cheek and confidence. Already the admiration he had so vicariously received had made him three parts a coward. Would he have to make his exit in an ambulance? Say, whack, said Millie, leaning to him confidentially. Do you know why I wanted to see you so bad? I'll put you wise. There's a fresh little crab out there in the lobby that's been getting too gay with us girls all together. Do you mind going out there a minute and stroking him? Just one jab, for luck? Fenton's stomach flattened with fear. Miss Diamond turned her violet eyes upon him. He could scarcely bear to look at her. Hand him one for me, Mr. Harrison, she said dreamily, and smiled a bewitching smile. I won't have no appetite till I know he's good and lame. Who is he? Fenton inquired, trying to keep his knees from knocking together. That's him now, Milly pointed to a man standing in the narrow doorway. He had an evil face. Fenton estimated his weight at over two hundred pounds. It's Billy Presto, you know, Whack, Lightning O'Donnell's sparring partner. Lord, you can eat him up. 
don't be long and she sped him to his doom with a flashing smile fenton rose and walked out trembling all over his only coherent idea was to make a quick escape the cloak-room boy had taken his hat but he would forgo that he would escape out the side entrance he had indeed already hurriedly started that way when mr presto approached him and slapped a heavy hand upon his shoulder hello whack he said how goes it have a cigar fenton's wits buzzed say i was just looking for you presto he said they was a couple of swell skirts round here looking for you a half an hour ago oh is that so who were they presto was immediately intrigued in a limousine car they were a little one and a bigger one nectarines fenton improvised crazy to find you but wouldn't tell their names said if i see you to say they'd wait for you at the cafe martin important fenton gazed with a fine air of candor at billy presto but ready to jump away from his fist at the first sign of incredulity the scheme worked thanks old man bye bye i'll skip right down there and mr presto had gone fenton returned to the dining-room a little faint and wobbly well i threw a good scare into him he explained as he sat down i guess he won't try to do no more goo-goo work round here for one while what do you want to eat milly oh we've ordered milly looked at him admiringly say you're a whiz she commented now if that guy over at that table there don't try any cute business on me we can have supper where is he fenton demanded now milly we don't want no fuss here said miss diamond milly subsided but was pleased fenton's appetite was gone with every fond look his companions lavished upon him he became more craven well he must at least put on a front he cudgelled his brain for memories of the office boy's talk when are you going to meet jake kilgore again milly asked him next month i guess say you leave it to me this time i'm going to train on nitric acid and iron filings and live rats take it from me girl i'll make him think of home and mother before the first round is over when i unhook my right and connect with his dial he'll act like a ferry-boat with a boy captain in a smoky fog say did you ever see a mogul locomotive run over a pin that's me and kilgore i'm the choo-choo see why he'll be a royal stuart plaid all over when i finish at this moment the waiter pouring milly's champagne hit the chair with his elbow and the wine spilled in milly's lap she gave a cry of anger and began to mop her skirt with her napkin fenton turned pale must he kill the waiter he jumped up and looked wildly about him for an escape miss diamond put a fairy hand upon his arm oh don't make a fuss mr harrison she besought i'll smash him into a biscuit tortoni he roared milly laughed oh whack really it was my fault don't hurt him fenton heaved a sigh of relief sat down glowering and the waiter made bold to approach and tender his apologetic services it was a narrow escape if i'd unloosed that lariat wallop of mine said fenton deliberately glowering at the unfortunate waiter i'd have cut his head off just like slicing an apple but good lord what's the use of mutilating a swede it would muss me all up he turned modestly to his oysters my but you're savage murmured the blonde and she looked at him in a dreamy rhapsody that made fenton turn his eyes away for fear of being hypnotized yes she was too beautiful she made him feel weak a dozen admiring sentences rose to his lips but he knew so well she had heard them all before that he would not speak them he turned to milly better able to compete with her sprightly smile it stimulated him she plied him with questions she was curious as to everything connected with his supposititious profession between her catechism and miss diamond's ravishing smiles fenton found it hard to keep his head his fictions grew wilder he narrated impossible battles in the squared ring he professed to know every one they mentioned and indulged in fanciful flights of biography but all the while he was waiting for his bluff to be called his exposure was momentarily imminent 
he was aroused from these forebodings by the sight of a colossal man standing in the doorway looking over the throng he was a human mastodon with a sour and ugly look that made fenton's flesh creep on his bones the man's face was battered and crooked he had the jaw of a bulldog to fenton's horror he looked over at the ladies and scowled meaningly my god said milly it's jim what'll we do he'll be terrible jealous oh whack you will protect me won't you she laid her hand on fenton's with a quick convulsive grasp even miss diamond awakened from her dreamy pose he'll make a fuss sure oh mr harrison don't hit him we'd better get away quick her eyes shot blue sparks now she was wide awake and without coquetry fenton trembled he half arose to fly but was held by milly's eager hand the man stalked sullenly over to the table see here what the devil does this mean milly i thought you was a-goin to eat with me his voice thundered all eyes in the room turned to him milly was too frightened to speak so for that matter was fenton who is this little shrimp anyway the stranger demanded say young fellow you better light out before i kick you out fenton jumped up and looked about ready to dodge the first blow what's that you called me he demanded with what belligerency he could muster his heart was in his mouth for god's sake whack don't hit him don't make a scene it was the violet-eyed blonde who screamed hit me the big man ejaculated while i'll make mashed potatoes of him in three minutes if he don't get out of here milly shrieked don't you touch him jim he'll kill you if he turns himself loose why it's whack harrison you fool the big man stared at that minute a waiter came by with an armful of dishes looking the other way smash he charged full tilt into fenton's back fenton fell forward toward jim and put out his hands to save himself at the same instant a fat german with a napkin tucked into his collar who was stolidly cutting a dill pickle at the next table punctured the rind and the juice gushed forth the two accidents were exactly timed fenton's outstretched hands fell hard on the big man's chest and a stream of brine hit jim in the right eye he stumbled fell backward wildly waving his hands all over the room spectators shouted and rose to their feet to witness the fray the head waiter came running up fenton too had fallen and fallen upon his prostrate foe his companions mingled their shrieks with those of the crowd don't let him get at him he'll murder him the girls entreated if he gets mad he'll beat him to pieces he's whack harrison fenton hardly knew what had happened before three waiters pulled him off jim's supine body they raised him respectfully however anxiously protecting themselves from his rage the head waiter came up to him and tried to calm fenton down apologized promised no further annoyance protested his own regrets and then majestically ordered the stranger to be removed from the room angry as a trapped gorilla shouting out hideous oaths jim struggled against some seven or eight waiters and guests the war raged all the way to the door of the dining-room where the porters took a hand there the house detective had already telephoned for the police the lobby was filled with strugglers and profanity till the law arrived and two stalwart officers hustled the unfortunate man into the patrol wagon then the guests who had left their tables to watch the riot returned gossiping and laughing to the cafe men stared at fenton in awe ladies gazed at him and talked under their breaths it took some time for the confusion to simmer down in order to be restored all this while fenton sat proudly staring at vacancy with a forced smile upon his lips the talk around him buzzed of uppercuts and hooks punches wallops and knockouts the blonde timidly put the question that was agitating the whole room what was that punch you gave him mr harrison she inquired with the love-light in her melting violet eyes fenton considered it at leisure oh that smash that was a new one my own invention i call it the straight-arm double dill jab it's got the corkscrew to the solar plexus beaten to a whisper 
you work it like this and fenton illustrated a complicated evolution with his left fist directed against a champagne bottle what are you doing now fenton asked as the supper proceeded so far he knew little of his companions and if he was to get help from them he must make haste the girl in red said milly ain't you been to see the show yet fenton confessed his ignorance of the play i'm wearing twelve thousand dollars worth of costumes said miss diamond four changes you ought to come it was then fenton disclosed the full depths of his innocence what part do you play he asked the ladies screamed with mirth play a part that's good say whack do we look foolish enough to spend our time learning lines with our shape what's the use of being a perfect thirty-six forget it you can always get girls to work for a living we're clothes horses why kid do you really think we could keep motor cars and wear genuine blue fox if we had to bark mew and bray when a dub stage manager told us not on your mezzotint oh said fenton edified then you're showgirls professional beauties murmured miss diamond we're what men buy opera glasses for but i had no idea showgirls got such good salaries the girls looked at each other shook their heads and then smiled at their interlocutor milly patted fenton's hand say kid you may be all right with your ring tactics but you never ought to be caught thinking in public when they's ladies present eighteen a week is our regular pay the rest is perquisites oh i got a trade too ever travelled on the subway miss diamond added i'm the lady with after-dinner gumdrops on a three-sheet that's right also the p d slick overshoes and the oh i want some beer she yawned and tapped her red lips the while as if she were playing a tune i say milly did you read in the paper where janey davis had made a horrible punch in london sure she's starring what do you think of that why i knew her when she was an extra girl too she was a freak for fair did i ever tell you about her in mansfield miss diamond shook her head disinterestedly but as fenton politely professed a desire to hear milly took a final sip of champagne and began the story the girl who knew mansfield yes her real name was jane davis ain't that a scream for heaven's sake what's the use of going on the stage if you can't beat the label you had when you lived back in baraboo when i asked her about it she only said why that's my mother's name and i guess if it's good enough for her it's good enough for me then she looked at me with her big hungry brown eyes like a little kid on the corner watching a hokey-pokey cart she certainly was a queer one never had no use for men and not much for women either at least not them in the company she used to sit around in corners watching the rehearsals while the bunch was carrying on and having fun she used to talk queer too never was up to date at all couldn't jolly up for a cent remember how we used to guy her for saying not having had and were it not that why she couldn't understand our slang half the time sort of country you know talked like a reading book that was when we was in the sinfire company my name then was gloria moyle and i was just out of the bunch in the chorus trying to get solid with the stage manager jane davis was drawing twelve a week she had one line in the third act she lived with her mother in one room way over on east nineteenth street well say she was hard up all right believe me she used to walk all over new york barefoot do you know what i mean she had what looked like shoes but they want nothing really but a pair of uppers the soles were wore clear through and so was her stockings i give her an old pair of rubbers one day and she wore em regular after that the girls used to guy her about it something fierce hard up you bet didn't i tell you her mother had rheumatic fever that's right the landlady put her out of the house once she groaned so loud when she was took bad o course it cost jane about all she could hold out for doctors and medicines and all that twelve dollars don't go far nobody in the company ever thought jane was anything more than a fool 
You see, she was so queer, and she'd never make up to men or anything. She wasn't pretty, but, Lord, she could have grafted all the free eggs she wanted if she'd just thrown a grin or two round. Plenty of the boys would have staked her to an eat. But no, nothing doing with Janey. Strictly on the prim. She had straight black hair that she wore funny. Not a blessed rat in it. A freak style of her own. Say, it was a scream. She did have pretty hands, though. And that was a funny thing, too. She could almost talk with them. Her mouth was just like a baby's. Sort of trembly and changing all the time. Always different. You know how a kid's face works. No repose. All the same, when Janey Davis got mad, believe me, then she was a devil. She could just make the chills crawl up and down your back. But you'd never believe it to see her sitting in a corner reading a book. You could almost tell what the story was just by watching her face. Now what was I going to tell you? Oh yes, about Mansfield. Why, a gentleman friend of mine, Dusty McIntyre it was, him and me was pretty thick that year. He gave me a couple of seats for Mansfield at the New Amsterdam one day. He got em off one of the stage managers. You know how Mansfield used to carry around about twenty-seven different varieties of em. Of course, I, naturally, didn't go much on that highbrow stuff like Pier Gint, and I was sore the pass wasn't for the follies of 1907. But Janey was in the dressing room when I got a piece of a burnt match in my eye and she took it out for me after everybody else wouldn't do it. And so I asked her, did she want to go? Say, you ought to seen that girl. She was as excited as if Rockefeller had asked her to get married. So we went. Believe me, I near went to sleep in the theater. The show didn't have no ginger in it. Slow. Well, you take it from me. If that girl had just come into town from southwestern Missouri, she couldn't have acted more like a fool. She didn't hardly speak only just twice in the whole show. In the first act, you know, where Peer Gint comes on like a fourteen-year-old boy and lays down on the stage and kicks up his heels, Janey turned round and looks at me with her big brown eyes, and she whispers, Who's that? I says, Why, that's Mansfield, you little jay. Oh, she says, I thought he was a man. Lord, how she stared. Then in a minute, what does she do but begin to cry? Can you beat it? There he was, as funny as a kitten with a catnip ball, doing kid stunts so you'd split laughing, and Janey blubbering away for fair. Didn't I tell you she was queer? I never got another word out of the girl till the last act. You know, where they have that auction scene and Mansfield comes on as an old man. Then Janey asked me again, just like before, she says, Who's that? I says, ain't you got a program or what? That's Mansfield, of course. Who else would it be? Clyde Fitch? And then she begins to cry again, soft, to herself. I sat and watched the tears drip down her face like a leaky hot water bag. She certainly was a fool. Well, we blew into Rikers to have a pistache soda after the show, and I just asked her what she was crying at. She says, Oh, he made me see all sorts of things that want on the stage, at all. I thought I was somewheres else, she says. What do you think of that? What's a theater for, anyway? It's to show the act the author wants showed, and that's all. Ain't that right? But I couldn't make Janey see it that way. Would you think a yap like her could ever act? Well, next noon I run down to her room to get her to put a touch on a hat I'd just bought. I'd paid eighteen dollars for it, but it wa'n't quite right. Janey had a way of pulling ribbons round so you'd swear a hat was just imported. Clever she was, too, in a way. Ought really to have been a milliner. Her mother was in bed as usual, groaning away something fierce, and Janey was writing on an old brown paper bag, ironed out flat. I offered to give her some paper, but no, she wouldn't never take nothing from nobody. I asked her what it was, and she looked up kind of queer, and she said she was writing a letter to Mr. Mansfield. Can you beat it? Mashed. And him, getting his thousands a week. What are you writing to him, I says. She smiled awful queer, and she says, I'm telling him something I'll bet nobody has ever told him before, she says. 
I know a lot of things about him nobody knows, she says. Well, that got me mad. Didn't she have a nerve? Nothing but an extra girl, practically, at twelve a week, and him a star. I was paralyzed. If you know all that, I says, it's a wonder you ain't starring yourself. And she says, there's another day coming, she says, and I'll have my chance yet. She made me sick. Just one line was all she had in the production. Why, she never even had her name on the program. Mine was in with the butterflies and Patagonian peasants and the Merry Marys, three times in all. You may not believe it, but about a week after that, she come into our dressing room and says, See here, I want to show you something. What do you think? She sure had a photograph of Richard Mansfield, with his name and some writing on it, too. What is it, Latin, I says? No, says Janey, it's French. I asked her what did it say, and she smiled and said, You wouldn't understand, Moyle, but it's something like, Look inside. Well, I certainly didn't understand all right, nor I don't yet, and I doubt if she did. I suppose Mansfield only sent it to her just for a cod. Say, it was funny, though, when you come to think of it, want it. Why, Mansfield was a holy horror. Everybody knows that. Nobody could ever get along with him. Women or men. Why, his people used to leave him every week. He used to fire about twenty every night, and then take em back. What in the world do you figure he sent Janey that photo for? It beats me. Anyway, Janey was tickled to death with it. You'd think it was a doll. She used to carry it round with her all the time. One time Floridora Billingsgate found it and drawed a mustache on it with grease paint, and say, wasn't Janey mad? She snatched up a pair of scissors and went at Flo like a Rocky Mountain wildcat, and the girls had to pull her off. That was just before Janey was put into the cast. We never knew how she made that jump. Some said she had money left her and bought the part, but I know better. Janey never had a cent in them days. I expect she wasn't quite as country as she looked, after all, and worked the manager. She couldn't act, anyway. Lord, didn't I know her when she was an extra woman? The idea. I guess I know something about the stage. Why, Janey actually had an idea that it didn't matter where you put your feet or your hands. Now anybody who's ever been to a dramatic school knows when you put out your right hand, you have to put out your right foot and a lot of rules like that. And Janey couldn't read a line right to save herself. It sounded just like ordinary talking. It wasn't acting at all. And she knew no more about how to use her eyebrows than a cat. Oh, she paid for her promotion some way, you bet. That's always the way. Talent ain't no use whatever compared to influence. The day she was given the part of Alfalfa in Sinfire, I came across her back near the property room. She had Mansfield's photo in her hand, and she was a-kissing it. Ain't that the limit? I was kind of mad to see a gawk like her put ahead, and I says to her, If you got to kiss him, why the devil don't you kiss him on the mouth? She just give me one scared look, and she says, Oh, Moyle, she says, he's married. What do you know about that? Didn't I tell you she was a fool? She made me sick. What, are you stuck on him, I says? She says, If it hadn't been for him... I'd never have been promoted. Now you couldn't make me believe he had anything to do with it. I ain't so easy as all that. So I asked her what she meant. She was half laughing and half crying, and sort of silly. She says, I've learned how to look inside, she said. Can you beat it? She was foolish, just naturally foolish. Hadn't never seen him off the stage. Well, it was about three weeks after that Janey's mother died. Janey was all broke up. Anybody'd expect she'd be glad to have it over with. Wouldn't you think it would have got on her nerves to have the old lady mewing like a tomcat every time her shoulder blade ached? She sure was an awful bother. I didn't see Janey. A stagehand we called Violets told me. He had blue eyes and a broad grin. He must have been kind of stuck on her. He used to claim she could act. You know how those stagehands are. They think they know a lot. He had an awful nerve. But wait. He told me the funeral was going to be Sunday. But I'd just made a date with 
dusty McIntyre to motor down to Luna Park, and so of course I couldn't go. At least I had no idea I could at the time. Dusty looked too good to me. So I just dropped Janey a postcard telling her I was sorry and all that, and if I could do anything, to let me know. That was on a Friday. After the matinee, next afternoon, Janey come round to see me, and she asked me would I lend her a quarter to pay for a telegram. Of course I told her I'd send it for her. I felt kind of sorry for the little mouse, and she handed it over. Oh, her mother was at a little cheap undertaker's over on the east side. Well, when I read that wire, I nearly had a fit. Who do you think it was to? Richard Mansfield. He was down at his country place in New London. It only said, Mother died yesterday, Jane Davis. Wasn't she the crazy thing? She'd just got one photo out of him, and on the strength of that, she'd gone to work and took him right into the family. Of course, I never sent it. I knew it wouldn't do at all. He'd have been wild. I told Violets about it, though, and he said it was a nervy thing to do. I've often wondered since if he didn't send it himself, though, after all. We started out on Sunday, Dusty and me, about ten o'clock in his panard. I had one of them two-toned violet auto veils and a yellow silk coat on. Just as we was halfway over the Williamsburg Bridge, something happened to the car, and Dusty got out. I looked back and I seen a funeral coming and I got awful nervous. You know it's bad luck to have one overtake you. But I looked round. First come an open barouche, just crammed with flowers. I give you my word, if they was one dollar's worth, they was five hundred. They was fairly spilling into the road. After that was the tackiest hearse I ever see. Then come one solitary hack, that's all. Gee, it was the bummest funeral procession I ever seen. Just as the hack passed, I saw Janey through the window, with a man setting side of her. I couldn't catch his face. Then they went by and Dusty fixed his machine and got in. I told him about it, and I says to him, Dusty, you got to follow that funeral wherever they go. We can run down to Luna Park later. There's certainly something doing when Jane Davis has a hackload of flowers for her mother's funeral, and I want to see who's putting up for it, so we run along easy behind em. I thought, of course, it would be the potter's field for hers, cause Janey hadn't got any relations at all, only her mother. But no, where did they go but out to Greenwood Cemetery, and turned in up to a lot under a big elm tree. Of course we couldn't take the car in, but we stopped where we could see who was there. First a man got out of the hack with a silk hat on. I couldn't make him out at first. Then come Janey. Will you believe it? She didn't wear black, and it was her own mother's funeral, too. She had on the bum little blue suit she always wore. Wa'n't that disgraceful? She might have shown some respect, even if her mother had led her a life. Then the man turned round and my god i see it was richard mansfield say can you beat it richard mansfield in a prince albert coat and a top hat with his arm round janey davis like she was his own daughter and i give you my word he'd never seen her before that day well i just sat there and gasped wouldn't you think that a man like mansfield would be above being there at a little miserable two-cent funeral with a girl nobody had ever heard of too I should think he'd have been ashamed of himself. If a man don't respect himself, who is going to respect him anyway? Well, that was queer enough. But when I see they didn't have no minister, I nearly died. And what do you think? When they had the coffin on the ground, side of the grave, I couldn't see that Janey was crying a bit. Mansfield took a little black book out of his pocket and stood up straight at the head of the coffin and begun to read. His voice was so loud and clear, we could almost hear it from where we were. I was almost ashamed of the profession by that time. But then I always did think Mansfield was a good deal of a bluff. Then Dusty says to me, Glow, I ain't never seen Mansfield act. I'm going to sneak up near there and get a good look at him and hear him. This is where I get an orchestra seat free. Well, I let him go, and I waited there in the car. Well, Dusty walked up near the lot. 
I could see him standing there listening, and after a while he drew up nearer. When they begun to lower the coffin into the grave, Dusty come walking back slow. I called out to him to hurry, for I was terrible afraid Janey'd spot me rubbering. In that yellow coat, too. When he got a little nearer, I see the tears was just rolling down his cheeks. Dusty McIntyre was crying like a kid. Ain't that the limit? I asked him what in the world he was crying about, and he said it was something about his voice. Mansfield's voice. It got to him some way. I don't know. I guide him about it all the way to Luna Park. But somehow Dusty wa'n't like himself all day. That was in 1907. You know, Mansfield died about six months after that. In September it was. Well, I met Jane Davis at an agency the week after he died. And what do you think? She was all in black. When I said something to her about Mansfield, she broke right down and cried. Now what do you know about that? A girl who wouldn't put on mourning nor shed a tear for her own mother had the nerve to rig out in black for the swellest star in the business i call her a thoroughbred snob fenton looked at the girl now with a revulsion of feeling she no longer amused him and miss diamond seemed less beautiful already he had stayed too long and yet his object had not been accomplished miss diamond yawned again say milly i gotta get home she said let's go at that milly called the waiter hovering near and asked for the check he handed it to her fenton made a feeble protest but she waved it aside and tossed him a gold-linked purse across the tablecloth fenton glanced at the bill found it was nine forty and took out a crisp new ten-dollar bill the waiter fled there would be sixty cents change thought fenton part of that he must have and make his escape he watched the waiter to the cashier's desk and saw him returning. He calculated the time to a second, and just as the man was within six feet of him, he called out, pointing to the door. Gosh, there's your friend back already. The girls turned and gazed. Fenton took the dime from the proffered plate, slipped it into his pocket, and handed Millie her purse. It was a victory. The waiter stood and stared contemptuously. What did Fenton care? Not a whit now to get away. The cloakroom boy brought him his hat, and as he waited for a tip, Fenton eagerly collogued the blonde. The three walked to the hotel lobby. Obsequious head waiters gazed at them in admiration. A buzz went through the corridor when Fenton, alias Whack Harrison, appeared. He was the hero of the place. He glanced at the clock. Both hands stood at eleven. He must hurry. Say, you can take us home if you want, Whack. Millie's fond eyes shot sparks at him. All right, he said. Just wait till I get some cigarettes. He turned, walked to the cigar counter, and beyond. Once out of sight, he ran for the side door. End of chapter 7「ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャロット・ジャ and walked rapidly toward Times Square. His adventure had been like a dream. Like a dream, it had been silly, but splendid. What he had been through that evening, since first he approached Times Square, as he was approaching now. He had a dime in his pocket as he walked into the lobby of the Hotel Knickerbocker to collect his thoughts and lay his plans. Should he try again to get the octoroon on the telephone and leave it to chance to get back from downtown? He sat down at a table and looked at his dime thoughtfully, then grimly decided to leave it to fate. Fate evidently had him in mind that night, so let come what would. Heads for precaution, and the saving of five cents for his return. Tails for communication with the octoroon, and luck. He tossed up the coin, and it fell tails up. So mote it be. He walked to a drug store and rang up the King William Hotel. Miss Green had registered, said the clerk, but did not answer. Selah. The fates would provide, 
and with a smile on his lips like a desperate traveller who casts himself into a stream without a ford hoping to get to the other side safely fenton plunged into the subway and took a local train to the grand central station where he transferred to a downtown express he must get to the st paul building what he could accomplish there how he could possibly recover the jewels he had no idea but once launched upon this adventurous emprise he was determined to see it through and make what fight he could it worried him that he had to work in the dark with no help or guidance but he had no choice there were only two passengers in the car he entered one was a stout man-o-war jacky considerably under the influence of a joyous shore-leave the other a globular puffy gentleman with a piratical moustache which he seemed to be continually eating fenton sank into a reverie and his thoughts wandered like a homing dove to belcharmion who was she what had she intended to say to him what mysterious fate was bringing them continually together suddenly he awoke from his musing to find the train had stopped he waited for several minutes and it did not start local after local passed them by with the exasperating way that locals have of beating the express when the track is blocked he went forward to speak to the guard and found the door locked there was some trouble ahead the sailor began to swear his impatience grew more and more profane he would lose his ship he would be rebuked he didn't care so much for the money but to think that he had to be at the mercy of a landlubber's hole in the ground all this embellished with horrid adjectives fenton smiled and returned to his seat the puffy gentleman came over and asked what was the matter fenton didn't know well they had to make the best of it the man o war's man became more and more abusive again the man with the fierce whiskers remarked that one had to make the best of it nobody could hurry a subway train one couldn't put a burr under its tail to make it jump you know when he was not chewing his moustache he was wiping it off with the flat of his hand that jacky can sure swear some said fenton finally swear nonsense profanity is a fine art that illiterate chap knows only the merest rudiments well they're good anglo-saxon rudiments anyway fenton said smiling at his friend's serious tone hm anglo-saxon it takes an arab to really swear you can get a real sensation in semitic we're afraid to really use english to its greatest effect queer isn't it how we are the domination of language we have certain words that are arbitrarily considered vulgar and we so-called civilized people have come to the point when the only way we know to emphasize our sentiments is by spicing them with impropriety if that is the correct method why the spanish have done the best of all the english come next perhaps especially the elizabethan literature great power of invective they had look at john webster but lord think of the french and the germans child's play sir mere child's play how can an intelligent man consider he gains force by mentioning a pot of thunder or a sacred colour or calling upon the thunder and lightning oh the secret of it is sacrilege i fancy said fenton willing to humour him men like to defy higher powers it shows courage is thousand pots a higher power the stranger replied no sir the basis of all profanity is sound the appeal is not to the mind but to the ear i defy you to name a single oath modern or ancient that is not euphonious that doesn't have an oral magnificence wait a minute we will probably have to stay here a while i'll tell you a story to prove what i mean there's one man in brooklyn who has perfected profanity and made a science of it here we go now said fenton i guess that was only a fuse blown out i once knew a man he began the train had started but the little man had already started also and as station after station was slowly passed he narrated his story the affiliated non-cursers parade do you know brooklyn is one of the queerest places in the whole world all sorts of strange uncanny things happen when you once cross the bridge you're in a new world your brain changes you begin to see things pink i live in brooklyn myself in some ways it's as good as living abroad i imagine mars when they have an election on is something like the borough of brooklyn they call it the city of churches ha huh, i call it the city of brain kinks 
Nobody really knows anything definite about the town. Ask a cop how to get to Flatbush Park Terrace, and he doesn't know. Nobody knows. If you get there, you'll never find the way back. You wouldn't believe half the things that are true about Brooklyn. Ever hear of the King's County Croquet Club that meets at Prospect Park? I thought not. What did I tell you? What sane person would believe that there was a city in the United States that played croquet nowadays? Championship games, too. Ain't it awful? Why, there's a chess club that you can see working at the job in full daylight from the Brooklyn L. Believe me, some of these games last for years at a stretch, like a Chinese drama. Men grow old during a single gambit. Then there's the Flatbush Bride's Cooking Class. Can you beat that? Think of the biscuits like your wife used to make. Why, mister, I know human beings over there that sleep under violet glass all night to cure sore eyes. The banks fail regularly every year. They have a children's procession in May. Nobody knows what for. They sell real estate that's under water, and you have to get a glass-bottom boat to find your front yard. No, if you're a Brooklynite, when you come back from work at night, you have no idea what your wife's been elected to during the day. It's all one cooperative, coeducational madhouse. But the one craziest thing of all is the affiliated non-cursers. Ever heard of it? No? I thought not. Well, a lot of religious highbrows a few years ago formed this society to suppress swearing. Every member is pledged never to use a cuss word and to frown on all blasphemy and sundry. Oh, when the executive committee gets into a good fat row, it's worth being present. They have to mix Volapik and Esperanto. Well, the president of the society this year is old Dr. Hopbottom. What's the matter? Ever heard of him? An old yellow-skinned, goat-bearded quack doctor. One of these psalm-singing skinflints, you know. This year he proposed a parade of the affiliated non-cursers, and the idea caught on great. It was a big show, but Brooklyn thought nothing of it. Why, over there, when the circus comes to town, they have to paint the elephants in scotch plaids and put side whiskers on the zebras before anyone will turn round and look. People in Brooklyn see too much woosley stuff every day to be surprised at anything, so the parade didn't attract much attention at first. They had all the school children out, little girls in white muslin and blue ribbons, boys in pink sailor suits with little white flags, PDQYM, the social uplifters, the sons of Jehu, the ethical army, the ancient order of Gohevians, the mystic livers, the anti-dope fiends, the shupum pupum, and everything. Dr. Hopbottom certainly rounded up a good bunch of non-cursers. He had em in platoons with banners and badges and brass bands and decorated drays and marshals with batons, just like a regular procession of the native sons of the Golden West. He was at the head of the parade on a white horse with a tall hat tied round with white ribbons, like Napoleon crossing the Delaware, solemn as the archangel Gabriel. Pleased? By the doctor was one broad voluptuous grin, he took off his hat right and left, regular, every block. So far, so good. The parade was a great success, till it got to a given point down by the borough hall. Then came the big wind. There was an ex-sailor named Gil Hooligan driving up a side street on a dray loaded with railroad iron. Bingety, bang, slam, smash, rumble, rattle, zip, clattery, ding. You know how a load of steel rails can yelp when they're properly loaded on a truck. Gilhooligan had four big black Percherons, and he had an idea he was operating an ancient Roman chariot, and the whole world had to get out of his way. He tried to drive smack through the middle of the procession, but the non-swearing enthusiasts wouldn't have it. They sat tight. Then for a few minutes there was a sprightly duel of verbiage and diction. Gilhooligan went at them with a thousand frenetic figures of speech, and the white ribbon purists came back with a lot of sterilized and highly perfumed talk on the other side of the question. Gilhooligan got rather the best of it. Fiddlesticks and Oh Bother and Mercy Me had no show at all with the way he handled English. Why, he swung eighteen-syllabled oaths round by the tail 
hitting right and left, but still they didn t let him through. The little boys yelled, Oh, pickles, and the ladies attacked him with, Ain t he horrid? Of course they couldn t go farther, though for a little while several resignations from the society were momentarily expected. Gilhooligan talked to them the way an army driver pets a mule. Yes, the gift of tongues certainly descended upon Gilhooligan till the air was a deep, exquisite magenta for miles around. You could actually smell his language. At last the news travelled from one Sunday school to another, clear up to the head of the procession where Dr. Hopbottom was straddling his stately steed. When he found out what was doing, he turned that white horse and came back toward Burrow Hall at a wild bull gallop the white ribbons streaming out from his top hat and his whiskers flying it was like general sheridan twenty miles away it was like paul revere it was like the ride from ghent to aix you say you've heard of dr hopbottom well then you know what an ingenious old crank he is of course he doesn't swear it's wicked but he had long ago figured it out like i told you what was the psychological motive for curses brainstorms have just got to happen sometimes and what a man needs at such times is a good satisfactory bunch of exclamations to hurl into the mess being a scientific man he knew not only the cause but the remedy so it was easy he invented his own innocuous expletives whenever the time came well he came galloping down toward the row gilhooligan's profanity carried for about thirteen city blocks so that by the time the doctor got within range he had his fires lighted and steam up he reined up and let out a stream of talk something like this what the hypophenyl tribrompropionic hiatus is the purple matter here anyway why the syncopated senegambian highball don't you move on what a thousand voices answered a thousand trembling hands pointed angrily to gilhooligan the doctor two-stepped his horse up to the irishman you get the deoxidized dalmatian out of the way here you epigrammatic blastoderm do you hear gilhooligan broke loose again i can't really quote his speech aright shorn of its linguistic splendors it read something like move your blankety blank dashed line of unquotable objects open and let me get through you blank dash of an indescribable animal i want to get by the doctor then proceeded to get mad he shook his fist at gilhooligan and yelled see here you clavo deltoid compresbyterial gal ravaging gonopteryx do you think i'll take any of your panspermatic post eocene retromorphosed labefaction you inebriant heliometric holland shaker you you giscoderm you green gilled sesquipedalian if you get me any more of your cognominant gargaristic fumentatious benzaldehyde i'll have you pragmatically arrested i wish i could give gilhooligan's answer but i daren't if it were printed for use in the public schools it would have to be printed almost exclusively in dashes and asterisks but it made the doctor really angry the members of the league held their breaths and gathered round in a circle now knowing that the event of the evening was about to take place a hush the hop bottom mouth got ready to act the doctor shook his fist again and started in earnest his voice began with calmness and deliberation but soon rose high it swept forth in a majestic declamation full of all sorts of forte staccato and crescendo effects to the noble climax see here you slack-salted transubstantiated interdigital germarium you rantipole sacrosciatic rock barnacle you if you give me any of your caprantipoline paragastrular megalopteric jacitation i'll make a lamellibranchiate gymnomixine parabolic lepidopteroid out of you what diacritical right has a binomial oxypendactyle and valtrous holoblastic rhizopod like you got with your trinoctial eustilaginous westphalian holocaust 
blocking up the Teleostian way for anyway. If you give me any more of your lunarian snortomaniac hyperbolic pylorectomy, I'll skive you into a megalopteric diatomoriferous oxospore. You queasy Zoroastrian son of a helicopteric hypotrachelium, you. Shut your logarithmic epicycloidal mouth. You let this monopolitan macrocosmic helciform procession go by and wait right here in the anagological street and no more of your hedonistic primordial supervirescence you rectangular quillet eating vice presidential amoeboid either mr gilhooligan slowly descended from his dray approached dr hopbottom and took off his hat i beg your pardon sir he said weakly but would you mind repeating them last three remarks I didn't rightly hear. The doctor, with sweat dripping from his yellow cheeks, did it again, and then some. By the time he had finished, the dictionary was pretty well disemboweled. The crowd cheered. I beg your humble pardon, said Gilhooligan, when the doctor had finished. I had no idea it was as bad as that. I take off my hat to you. Man and boy, I have followed the sea for forty years. I have been a Mississippi river pilot. I have run a whaler. I have been the mate of a cockroach schooner, and I've blackbirded all along the west coast of Africa. I know mules, and I know niggers, and how to coax em. But I see a plain seafaring man has no show with a doctor when it comes to exhibiting language in public. I'll say this for you. They ain't your beat for square-rigged black-and-tan cursing in the seven seas. And I think that if this here society... What's running this here procession can turn out graduates of the noble art of profanity like you are. I want to say this. Give me the pledge, and I'll sign it. I need some of your talk in my business. The doctor led the way amidst awed thousands to a great white dray decorated with lilies. There, upon a black walnut reading desk, was exhibited the pledge book, a huge brass-bound tome covered with white vellum. Gilhooligan mounted the dray, and with great effort and much chewing of his tongue he signed his name. A chorus of hurrahs was given, followed by the Chautauqua salute of waving white handkerchiefs. Then, after tying white ribbons to the tails of Gilhooligan's black horses and pinning a pink satin badge two feet long on the breast of Gilhooligan's jumper, the procession parted in the middle. He drove his clanking truckload of railroad iron into the space, and Dr. Hopbottom, victorious, galloped proudly back to the head of the line. Twenty little blue-eyed girls in white muslin were lifted up beside Gilhooligan the convert, and as the procession slowly started they set up in their childish treble their marching song. Angry words, oh, let them never, from the tongue unbridled slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they soil the lip. Fenton laughed freely for the first time that eventful evening. His memory of Dr. Hopbottom was still fresh enough in his mind for him to picture the scene. What's the doctor up to lately? he inquired. Why, the last time I saw him, he told me he had some great scheme to make a thousand dollars easy, was the reply. It seems he's doing a little detective work on the side. The train now began to slow down, approaching a station. Fenton glanced out, saw the sign Wall Street, and rose to go. Detective work, he inquired hurriedly. What did he mean? He's looking after some lost boy, I believe. There's a big reward offered for him, and the train had already stopped. Fenton had no time to hear more, and the words bore no meaning for him. After he had run out, however, and had begun to ascend the stairs of the subway exit, the words came back like a retarded echo, a lost boy, a big reward, and he stopped suddenly and began to think, Dr. Hopbottom after a lost boy? Perhaps it was he himself, Fenton. The reappearance of Mangus O'Shea into his life had already stirred up conjectures. If it were himself, what could it mean? Well, there seemed to be no answer. Of all the strange questions he had put to himself concerning this night's adventures, nothing as yet had any answer for him. He seemed destined to go from one mystery to another, blindfold. 
of one thing however he was sure the one mystery he most desired to have solved was the riddle who is belcharmion end of chapter eight chapter nine of find the woman this librivox recording is in the public domain find the woman by gillette burgess chapter nine the st paul building wherein john fenton discovers a dead body regains possession of certain jewels and is besought to take the place of a titled impostor his mind was busy with her as he walked down broadway belle charmion surely she was worth conjecture belle charmion the two glimpses he had had of her the few words they had exchanged had fanned the flames of fancy which her portrait had first ignited her whimsical face her graceful expressive hands her lithe slim figure something in the quality of her warm fresh olive skin made him feel actually weak when he thought of her he confessed to himself that he was pretty far gone belle charmion belle charmion he wanted her more than anything on earth but meanwhile he had to go through what he had planned to do a wild goose chase no doubt but he would follow it to a finish he finally reached the entrance of the st paul building a twenty-one story pile of granite carved into romanesque shapes and had turned in to enter when he saw a man waiting in a doorway he had just passed fenton stopped and took a second look at him a muscular man in a brown derby hat and a shepherd's plaid suit there was no possible doubt of it it was the same man he had first seen in shuffle hall with the outline of a revolver bulging from his hip pocket it was the same man he had caught a quick glimpse of in the lobby of the hotel plaza here was another puzzle was he being followed and if so why a mad night indeed how would it end he went in struggling with this new problem looked at the directory table on the wall and found the name of nallery and company opposite was the number of the firm's office one three seven six only one of the three elevators was running in the car a negro boy was sitting on a stool reading middlemarch fenton entered thirteenth floor he said and the boy reluctantly closed his book slammed the door and pulled back the controller the elevator shot up round on the left said the boy as fenton emerged and the car descended fenton walked round a corner of the corridor and came point-blank to a door painted with the name of nallery and company mining brokers there he knocked he had no idea what he should do when the door was opened he had made no plan he would make up his mind what part to play as soon as the situation was found meanwhile as he waited he thought he heard a hurried sound of feet the soft click of a closed door he listened now more carefully still there was no answer he knocked again louder all was silence then angry at the delay wishing to bring matters to a crisis he turned the handle opened the door and walked in he found himself in a small office part of which was shut off by a wooden railing behind this were a couple of roll-top desks a letter-press a typewriter a filing cabinet and other ordinary pieces of cheap office furniture there was nobody there however and so seeing a door in one wall marked private fenton went through the gate strode up to it and knocked with determination still no answer he hesitated for a moment it was carrying things rather far to force himself in this way but he wanted to come to an end of the adventure as soon as possible he knocked again then impatient at the silence boldly opened the door he saw a carpeted room with a single roll-top desk and several chairs two of these were overturned and between them supine on the floor was the body of a man lying in a puddle of blood fenton stood for a moment in the doorway fascinated by the awfulness of it he was unable to move it seemed unreal impossible like a wild dream his first impulse was to stifle his exclamation of alarm shut the door and make his escape 
as quietly and quickly as possible. Next, despite his sick feeling of horror, despite a dominant fancy that this thing was not, could not be true, came the realization that he should go to the rescue of the man and give him aid if it was not already too late. He forced his will to move his body, stepped forward and knelt beside the form. One look into those open, staring eyeballs told him that the man was dead. But as he looked at the pale face more deliberately, the horror gave way to pathos. The dead man was wonderfully beautiful, picturesque, even poetic. By his crisp, curling hair, the finely molded features, the width of his forehead, the small, delicate moustache, the body might have been that of Edgar Allan Poe. The skin was as fair as a child's. The lips, sensitively parted, showed perfect teeth. The slender hands were like a woman's, gracefully expressive in their relaxed gesture. All this would have prevented the corpse seeming dreadful, had not that oozing red spot upon the shirt front told a tale of murder. Fenton drew down the lids over the glassy eyeballs, with scarcely a feeling of revulsion, and then slowly arose, still held by the potent fascination of death. Then his eyes wandered about the room, and stopped at a grey ooze-leather bag some little distance from the body. He walked over to it and picked it up. He pulled it open and received a new sensation. The bag was crammed with jewels. For the second time that night he was in possession of the Brewster collection. That fact decided him. Whatever had happened in this dreadful office, it was his plain duty to take the jewels and deliver them as he had promised. His own safety and theirs demanded that he make his escape without delay. There was no knowing when someone might come. It would be dangerous, disastrous, to be discovered there with the corpse. Buttoning the bag under his coat, therefore, he gave one swift look at the dead man and went into the outer office. Here he paused a moment to consider. It was improbable that any other exit than the front door of the building would, at this time of night, be open. The safest way, if indeed not the only way, would be to go boldly down the elevator as he had come up. He must take his chance at any rate. A glimpse into the mirror showed his face a deathly white. He took a towel from the washbowl and rubbed his cheeks violently till the color had returned. If he could only efface the horror in his heart as easily. The image in his eyes had faded so that now the door was closed. He could hardly believe that what he had seen was true, but a feeling of faintness warned him that the shock had gone deep. He waited a moment for his weakness to pass, then summoning all his resolution, left the office and rang the elevator bell. He scarcely dared look at the elevator boy as the car descended. The air seemed close and stifling. Without a glance to right or left, he walked unsteadily out the great doorway. On the sidewalk the night breeze revived him, and he started to walk briskly north along Broadway. At each step his courage and his relief increased. He shook off his obsession, pacified his conscience, with the thought that there was nothing he could have done, and turned his thoughts to planning his next move in the curious game of chance which he seemed destined to play that night. Here he was again with the Brewster treasure, but again without a cent in his pocket, and now still farther away than ever from his destination. As he walked along the canyon of high buildings, the clocks rang midnight. How was he to get up town? He had not gone many blocks, deliberating this question, when he heard a motor car coming his way behind him. It was proceeding slowly, a chauffeur driving, and a gentleman muffled up in a pepper-and-salt coat in the tonneau. He was a little blond man of forty, with a patient, resigned look, a man with a pale, careworn face and a lizard's chin. 
His mouth was slightly open. He had white eyebrows. Altogether his face betokened no great strength of will. He looked at Fenton anxiously as he passed, and turned to look again, almost as if he intended to speak, but didn't quite dare. Fenton grasped the possibility and hailed the car. Give me a lift up town? he asked. The man looked him up and down. How far do you want to go? he asked, almost whining. Harlem, said Fenton. For some moments the man in the car stared without speaking. Fenton grew embarrassed. He wondered if the bag concealed under his coat showed too plainly. But the man finally changed his expression. A wan smile spread over his face, followed by an expression of timid resolution. I'll tell you what I'll do, he said. If you'll do me a small favor, it won't take more than half an hour. I'll send you up to Harlem in this car afterward, anywhere you want to go. What is the favor? asked Fenton. Get in here, and I'll tell you. Fenton opened the door and entered. The man who had invited him was so mild that there could be no great danger to the jewels. Go on home, Carl, said the stranger, but go slowly. I want time to talk to this gentleman. Then he turned to Fenton, stared at him anxiously for a few moments, and then asked, Can you act? What do you mean? I'm not an actor, of course. What I want you to do is to impersonate a Hungarian count for about ten minutes. Fenton gasped. Me, a count? In spite of the tremor he was still in, he laughed. Count Capricorni, the stranger explained. I've got to produce him at my house this night and, oh, if you would do it. I'll fit you out with a dress suit and a red ribbon, and introduce you to a few guests. As soon as that's over, you can be taken sick. Cholera, infantum, gout, epilepsy, or housemaid's knee. Anything you like, and then you can go up to Harlem. What do you say? Will you, please? Are you talking in your sleep, or what? Fenton inquired. I'm trying to save my sister's reputation, that's all. Perhaps, if you're incredulous, I'd better give you a few details. The gentleman sighed. I think so, too, Fenton replied. This seems to be my night in Arabia, and I might as well do it good. I've already crowded about sixty ordinary years' experience into six hours of this evening. Romance seems to have it in for me tonight. Well, I guess I can stand a little more of it. What's your line? Comedy? Tragedy? Farce? Musical drama? Or burlesque? Say, you're not crazy, are you? The stranger seemed anxious. No, are you? Well, sometimes I think I am. I'm a fool, anyway. Perhaps I'd better tell you my story and let you decide. All right, said Fenton, leaning back in the cushions. The stranger folded his arms, scowling ludicrously, and began, My name is Stillwell Morgan. Fenton sat up and looked at him eagerly. Not the Stillwell Morgan, not the nephew of James Pierpont. No, not that one, the stranger replied sadly. And that's the whole story. It's a mighty short one, Fenton grunted. Oh, what I mean, said Morgan, is that that very natural mistake of yours is what's just got me into trouble. Everybody makes that mistake. And thereat he proceeded to tell his tale. Count Capricorni. I have a sister named Marguerite Maganel Morgan. She's part angel, part vassar, and part darned fool. Being her only brother, of course I adore her on six days of the week, and swear at her on the seventh. If you've ever had that kind of a sister, you know. Sisters either run you, or you run them. I'm not ashamed of admitting that Marg runs me. It saves a lot of trouble. Everybody seems to think I'm rich, because my name is Morgan, but I'm not. Oh, well, I make a fair income. Real estate. Wait, I'll give you my card. We live a plain, self-respecting life, uptown in an $85 apartment. That is, we did till a month ago. Ah, well, I wish we lived there now. We had a pretty good-sized bathroom where I could do my pulley weights and we had a view of the Hudson, only about an inch of it, but I was satisfied. We had a Swedish maid, too, and on Thursdays Marg made a Welsh rabbit, 
We're Welsh, you know, and I opened the beer. I never drink anything stronger than that. Doesn't agree with me. We were happy and contented. I was, anyway. All I want is to go to a good musical show once in a while and wear slippers when I'm home. I never had much use for style. I hate those stiff stand-up collars, for instance. I believe in comfort and bathrobes and things. You know, good American habits with no nonsense about them. Marg goes in for the latest thing, but then she's ambitious. So she made me a velvet smoking jacket. I smoke three cigars a day, one after each meal. Well, last month Marg began to fret. She wasn't a bit interested in real estate or musical shows. I'm reading Gibbon's Decline and Fall this winter, and even that seemed to bore her. You see, she's higher spirited than I am, somehow. She likes a crowd. So, to please her, I said we'd spend a week at Atlantic City, at a real swell hotel. She brightened up right away. I was glad of a week off, too. It would give me a chance to finish up the decline and fall, and perhaps I could start in on the anatomy of melancholy. I've never had time to read that. I took a small suite. At first they thought we were a bridal couple, and I nearly died of mortification. But it was worse than that when I found the bellboys thought that we were the Stillwell Morgans, the rich ones. I gave only dime tips, but that didn't seem to convince them. I suppose some rich people are stingy sometimes. Of course I told the clerk all about myself, but people stared at us so I dreaded to go into the dining room. The second day after we arrived at the Buckingham Hotel, I met a nice-looking fellow in the billiard room while I was watching a game of pool. I don't often speak to strangers, but I was so lonesome with no business to do that I offered him a ten-cent cigar, and afterwards we played a game of pool. Oh, not the regular game. I never tried that. It's a bit hard for a beginner. This was that game where you roll the balls from one corner. I beat the stranger two games. Nice fellow, I thought affable, you know, interested in things. I didn't care much for women, neither did he. We got on beautifully. After he left, I asked the clerk who he was, and the clerk switched round the visitor's book and pointed to a name. Well, I nearly fainted. Count Capricorni and Valet. Budapest. There I had been laughing and joking with a real live count. When I told Marg about it, she got awfully excited, sent for the manicure girl, and asked her all about the count. Then she interviewed the telephone girl and the chambermaid. Marg has a way of getting right at things. She's resourceful, by Jove. She told me I must invite the count to dinner, but I said I'd never dare in the world. Now I knew who he was. I'd never seen Marg with men much. I usually go into my room and read when they come. They're so silly. She was a revelation to me now, the way she went at it. She got into my lap and began to fool with my hair, and teased me to introduce her to the Count. I told her how the Count had made fun of American women, and I guess that made her mad. When Marg gets her blood up, she's great. She said that I'd simply have to have him to dinner. I tried to get out of it, and then she began to cry. What can you do when a woman cries? I agreed to let her have her own way. Not that I blamed Marg much. If you'd seen the Count, you would have been impressed. Anyone would. He looked just like a Count. Sort of distinguished looking. Poetical kind of chap he was. Wide forehead, crisp black curly hair, and a little bit of a mustache. Say, I'll tell you, he looked for all the world like Edgar Allan Poe at twenty-five. What's the matter? He did, really slender hands like a woman's, and he used them in a foreign sort of way when he talked. Then he wore a soft black tie with his evening dress, and a broad ribbon on his glasses, and some kind of a little red button in his buttonhole. I liked him when I got better acquainted. I don't mind admitting it. I really did. Marg had only twenty-four hours to get up a costume. She sent six or seven telegrams to Faustine on Fifth Avenue and had a hairdresser from Philadelphia. I had to buy a lot of orchids 
and we got mother's pearls out of the safe deposit. It cost about four hundred dollars in all, but Marg was happy. The only thing was, I didn't have a dress suit. Marg wanted me to hire one of a waiter, but I drew the line. I can be firm when I want to. I hate those hard shirts. The Count came up to our sitting room, and Marg came in smelling of some sort of cologne she bought for four dollars a bottle. That was the first time she had ever had her hand kissed in the European fashion, except in private theatricals, of course. But it didn't embarrass her one bit. She acted just as if they did it to her every day. Ain't women wonderful? We went down to dinner, with me behind, and when we walked into the dining room, there was a buzz that you could have heard to the boardwalk. You see, every girl in the hotel had been hot after the count for a week, and he had never paid any attention to any of them. I was proud of Marg then. Every woman there was hating her like mischief, and you know how that improves a woman's looks. The one they hate, I mean. The Count was languid and aristocratic, and talked to Marg all the time. I didn't have a chance to say much. Marg was awfully animated, though. When we went upstairs somehow I felt in the way, so I took my decline and fall, and went into my room to read. I heard them laughing afterward for an hour and a half. Then, when he left, Marg came in to see me. She told me that she was dead in love with Count Capricorni. And what were we going to do? If he ever discovered we weren't the Stillwell Morgans, she was afraid he'd cut us, and she'd pine away and die. That was how the trouble began. You see, Marg wanted to entertain him in New York, but how could we invite him to our little flat? He'd scorn it. Marg said we'd have to move, and move quick. When Marg decides on a thing, I give up the fight. Just then, Aunt Jane died and we knew that she'd surely leave us some money. Marg figured on a hundred thousand or so, but I doubted it. On the strength of it, however, Marg began to make her plans. She went up to the city next day and rented a suite at Witcherly Court. Ever seen Witcherly Court? It's on Riverside Drive, a French Renaissance pile, Marg calls it with an entrance hall that looks as if it was carved out of different kinds of colored soaps. There is a lot of plush and hall boys and bronze tables and fountains and things when you go in, and a marquee in front. You know the kind. One suite cost $15,000 a year. Marg spent a day in those antique furniture dens on 4th Avenue and got in a lot of Sheraton stuff and Turkish rugs to take the nouveau riche look off. I didn't mind the expense so much, although I was sailing pretty close to the wind by this time. It was the style we had put on that I hated. Of course, it wouldn't do for the Count Capricorni to find us living the bourgeois way we always had. So she got a lot of gowns. I thought they were awfully low-necked and she made me get into a dress suit when the clock struck six every night, whether we had company or not. I tried to learn to drink burgundy, but it's no use. I hate it. Then she got a butler. Ever tried to act natural with an English butler looking at you? You can't do it, unless you're a woman. Women love it. It really seems to stiffen em up. But I always felt shriveled when he was in the room. The Count didn't like ordinary American cooking, so Marg got a chef, and I never had any appetite after that. That Swedish girl we used to have could make grand griddle cakes, but that was all over. We only had stewed up stuff in little casseroles, and everything tasted of onions. Marg said she loved his cooking, but I noticed she didn't eat much. But then she was in love, I admit. The Count came several times a week. He seemed to like the place, though I thought by the way he talked it was nothing compared to his castles in Hungary. He used to sit and smoke cigarettes out of a mouthpiece six inches long and tell us about his family. He told us that he was going to come into a whole lot of money when he married. He showed us a little miniature of his mother and another of a young countess his mother was trying to make him marry. That picture got Marg furious. She used to go and order a new hat 
and two or three new gowns after every time he showed it to her. Well, at the pace we were going, I didn't see how we could last. It was all I could do to pay running expenses, and I had to work downtown almost every night, figuring on new deals to put us through. What with wages and tips and things, at Witcherly Court, I was at my wit's end. Marg said it didn't matter if she only married the Count, because then we'd all have plenty of money, but all the same it worried me. Of course, Marg talked to folks about the Count, and naturally all our friends got pretty curious to see him. She gave several teas, but somehow he never managed to come to any of them. The first time he sent word he was ill, the second he had to go out of town, the third time he promised to come but didn't, and so it went. Her girlfriends began to laugh at her, and then they got nasty. They said she was awfully stingy with her old count, probably afraid that some of them would catch him. Some of them even said they didn't believe she had any count at all. I was kept busy explaining about him and apologizing and everything. Marg felt dreadfully upset about it. Well, one night she came into my room half crying and half laughing, and said that the Count had proposed to her, and she was going to marry him and be a Countess, and wear a coronet, and live in a ruined castle, just like in a story book. Of course, then I knew I was in for it. Her picture would be in the Sunday papers, and perhaps mine, and there'd be reporters and all sorts of things. It made me groan to think of it. Marg just loved it. She decided that she'd have to give a big reception to announce the engagement and introduce the Count. That would stop all gossip, and people would see that we were just as good as the Vanderbilts and Goulds and Astors, and wasn't I proud of my little sister? Well, I was proud enough of her, but I shuddered when I thought of the expense and the publicity and the style we'd have to put on. I only hoped that after it was all over I could get a big sunny room somewhere near 42nd Street and wear my bathrobe and slippers every evening I didn't go to a show. So I went in for it. I sold my mother's pearls and got an automobile because the Count said trolley cars and subways were vulgar. I mortgaged a little farm in Connecticut that had belonged to the family for a hundred years, and Marg hired a footman and a lady's maid and a valet for me. I used to send him on errands all the time to get rid of him, but her maid worked hard. The Count began to call me Stillwell and said, Americans weren't so bad after you knew them well. He also began to talk about my investing in Hungarian mines, and I considered it favorably until Aunt Jane's will was filed for probate. Marg and I were left $250 apiece, which I spent for garage expenses, and a portrait of her third husband, which Marg insisted on hanging up in the dining room. It was our ancestral portrait. The Count said he had em by dozens in his castles. We set to-day for the reception, and the Count promised on his honor he'd be there on time to meet all our friends. We invited about three hundred people, but all the week folks have been telephoning to Marg to ask couldn't they bring a friend or two, so that this afternoon, to be on the safe side, I telephoned the caterer to provide for seven hundred guests. Marg insisted on my hiring an empty suite below us for dancing and got an orchestra and a whole lot of gilt chairs. I figured it out today that I was about $37,000 in a hole up to date. The Count had come high, but Marg had to have him. And so long as she was happy and I could keep out of jail, I didn't care. Knowing that it was a love match and the Count wasn't after Marg's money, it didn't matter. I could stand it. That's the way it stood this morning. When I went downtown to my grind, florists all over the house, men nailing down canvas on the floors, footmen in everybody's way, a lot of extra maids and servants fussing about, and the caterers stewing things in the kitchen. I was glad to clear out and get down to my office where I could be quiet, worked like a Chinaman all day, and tried to forget we were marrying into the nobility. I was so nervous and excited, though, 
that I couldn't stand eating lunch in a restaurant where I would be likely to meet any of my friends. So I dropped into one of those little cheap quick lunch ham and egg places under the Brooklyn Bridge. I ordered some weak tea and milk toast and was trying to read the paper when I heard a voice that simply paralyzed me. It was behind a flimsy wooden partition in the kitchen and it was yelling, draw one, or something like that. Perhaps it was ham and over. Then a waiter in a dirty duck suit came out of the doorway with about sixteen dishes balanced along his arm and an apron on it was the count capricorni yes that's right that miserable waiter was the man that about eighteen servants and six hundred guests were preparing for up at witcherly court and i had spent something like thirty seven thousand dollars so that he wouldn't be ashamed of marguerite Morgan stopped and smiled sadly. I don't think he saw me at all. He turned to put some things on a table, and I bolted without waiting for my lunch. You see how I'm fixed, don't you? I thought that if he did show up tonight so that we would get the reception over with, I could get rid of him tomorrow, forever. But he didn't appear. Fenton shook his head. No, he answered, and I don't think you'll ever see him again. I guess he's done for, poor fellow. Morgan construed the remark according to his own lights, probably thinking that the Count had suspected that his real identity had been discovered. Fenton did not explain. He dared not say that he was virtually sure that the bogus Count Capricorni lay dead in an office on the thirteenth story of the St. Paul building. He wanted to forget what he had seen, at least until he had performed his duty. The reverie it threw him into was broken by Morgan. You see what I was up against. Must have been embarrassing, said Fenton. Embarrassing? Well, I guess. When eleven o'clock came and he hadn't come, I told Marg all about it, and she near went crazy. What are we going to do, she said, as if I knew. There we were again, without the guest of honor. Hamlet, with the prince left out. The place was beginning to fill up, and everybody was asking questions. Well, what did you do? said Fenton, beginning to be amused. Marg was splendid. She took right hold of it. She told me that I'd simply got to get somebody to impersonate the Count, or she would be disgraced forever. And meanwhile she'd tell everybody that the Count had been delayed in Washington, and would arrive at midnight. That would give me an hour to work it out. I confess I was frightened to death. I didn't like to deceive people. But what else could I do? Marg would be insane if I didn't save her reputation. Well, the only person I could think of was Harold Ringrose, a college mate of mine. We often played Bazique together. He's a manufacturing chemist down on Vesey Street. I rung up his house, but they said he was downtown. I tried his office. No answer. There was nothing for me to do but go down there and find him, and try to get him to play the part. I thought I could play the old friendship and family honor strong enough to induce him. He knows hardly anybody, and no one would ever suspect him. So I drove down there. There was a light in the sixth-story window, but I couldn't get any answer to the bell, and after I'd shouted as loud as I dared, a policeman told me to move on. So I drove back, not knowing what to do, till I met you. Morgan suddenly turned and grasped Fenton's arm with both his hands. Do this for me, for heaven's sake, he exclaimed, and weakly burst into tears. God knows I never wanted all this fluff and feathers, he sobbed. I'm a simple man, with simple ways. I don't like fashion and footmen and things. I want to be let alone, only Marguerite. Oh, brace up, old man, Fenton cried heartily. I'll save your face for you. Depend on me. It'll be a good joke on all these snobs. Is everything ready? Yes. Here, we're almost home now. Home. God, I wish I'd never seen Witcherly Court. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Find the Woman」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Find the Woman by Gillette Burgess. 
Chapter Ten Witcherly Court, in which John Fenton assists at a social function in high life, wears evening dress for the first time, and again sees Belle Charmion. They had been going up Riverside Drive, and as Morgan spoke, they approached a tall marble apartment house from which an awning stretched across the sidewalk to the curb. Here a line of carriages and automobiles were in line waiting to discharge their passengers. Morgan leaned forward and tapped his chauffeur on the shoulder. Round to the side entrance, he commanded. Here he and Fenton got out, and made their way rapidly in, and along a corridor to the back stairs. They climbed ten stories and arrived panting at the back door of the Morgan apartment, were led in by a staring servant, and conducted rapidly along the hall. As they passed, Fenton heard the continuous sound of gabble, the intermingled talk and laughter of many guests, inarticulate, confused, an unsteady murmur of voices. It sounded to him as if it might come from some monstrous, horrid beast with innumerable mouths. Servants of all kinds skeltered past him as he made his way. Waiters loaded with dishes, maids with ladies' wraps, men servants gossiping, loafing, gaping. A high, clear voice rose over all this subdued tumult. Marg's holding the fort, said Morgan, admiringly, and led the way in to his own chamber. Now, for heaven's sake, hurry, he exclaimed. Fenton had but time to see a wide white bed laid out with a complete outfit, evening dress clothes, shirt, tie, when two manservants fell upon him and tore off his coat, vest, and trousers with the fury of maniacs. As they held the dress trousers for him, a young lady put her head through the door excitedly. Has he come? she cried, and then, oh, there you are, thank goodness. Fenton took a leap into the black trousers and turned his back just as she burst into the room. Is he ready? she cried eagerly. For heaven's sake, hurry, you idiots. I can't wait a minute longer. Stillwell, put on his shoes, quick. Here, you crazy loon, you've got that collar upside down. For heaven's sake, let me do it, if you're all half-witted. And Fenton found himself suddenly confronted by a tall, pretty, blue-eyed girl with flushed cheeks all in white, with three ostrich feathers nodding in her hair. Hold your head still, she commanded. I can't do anything if you move that way. Here, you, put his gloves on, quick. A man attacked each hand. Stillwell Morgan still fussed at the bows of Fenton's shoes. Marguerite Manganel Morgan, in white gloves with orchids on her breast, her flushed face within an inch of his, worked over Fenton like a window-dresser with a wax figure. Her sweet breath was in his face. Her curls brushed his cheeks as she patted and pulled at his tie. He saw her pretty mouth working with nervousness. Then she stepped back and looked at him. Mercy, she shrieked. This isn't Mr. Ringrose. Who is it? She stared at him with big eyes and turned scarlet. I believe I have the honor of being Count Capricorni, said Fenton, bowing low. A maid tapped at the door, and entered halfway. Mrs. Gramson Davis wants to see you, Miss Morgan, she said. She has to go home, says she can't wait any longer. Miss Morgan grabbed Fenton by one arm. Come, she commanded savagely. I don't care who you are, you'll do. If I can only satisfy that old Mrs. Gramson Davis, I'm safe. And she dragged him out of the room into the hall. Here he asserted himself, offered his other arm tossed his head erect and stepped off with her. If he were to play a part, he decided it would be that of a man, not a puppet. Miss Morgan looked up at him with admiration. It was awfully good of you to come, she breathed. It's about time for something like that to be said, he replied haughtily. You treat me right, or I'll spoil the show. Oh, I'll do anything, anything, she exclaimed. Then dropping her voice, she added, I wish you were the Count Capricorni. With this exquisite compliment pleasantly ringing in his ears, he navigated his way through staring, whispering groups of guests, and entered the reception room. A buzz of comments greeted them. Everybody stared. They were immediately surrounded. Innumerable introductions began. Fenton, for the first time in his life in evening dress, 
with a foolish wild longing that belcharmion might see him played his part like a veteran as one eager curious person after another was presented he bowed shook hands uttered a pleasantry laughed and gestured and shrugged his shoulders as if he had been the petted hero of society all his life of all the remarkable situations he had found himself in that mad night this was perhaps the most dangerous the very peril of it however inspired him the gaiety of the scene went to his head like a cocktail his mind worked like an exquisitely adjusted high-speed machine the crowd elaborately dressed wove about him smiling pretty women and attentive men the lights of electroliers and cut glass and precious stones flashed in his eyes the perfume of frangipani and po d'espagne mingled with the wafted odours from the dining-room of oysters and terrapin the clink of glasses tinkled with laughter-laden voices the music of an orchestra sobbed and swelled with the voices of heartbroken strings and twittered with love-lorn wood instruments it all stimulated his imagination to the boiling point he talked as he had never talked before of things he knew nothing of things he didn't believe things as far outside of his life as chimborazo or cambodia it was the more easy when he perceived that nobody listened every one was hysterical hypnotized eager to add his or her nonsense to the general babel he talked wildly of bridge and golf of plays he had never seen of countries he had never visited but he might as well have said anything that he was dead and buried that he had forgotten to wear a shirt that his mother had whiskers no one would have noticed he gossiped of kings and princesses he mentioned at least seven new wonders of the world the ladies giggled the men said really and no one knew but that he had been speaking commonplaces you're doing fine fine miss morgan whispered to him at the first respite i'm proud of you she looked up under her lashes coquettishly what a pity we're not really engaged the poor count at that there came to him suddenly a flash of remembrance of the adventurer dead in the st paul building the memory swept like a chill wind over his soul and awakened him to his almost forgotten duty the jewels he had forgotten all about them at this minute he should be speeding up town to harlem to keep his promise what right had he here in this absurd disguise the charm of the adventure had gone to his head now he must be about his business without delay just as he was casting about for a pretext to go his ears caught the sound of a name miss belle charmion and he turned shocked and trembling to see before him the girl of his dreams there she was olive skin and soft hazel eyes whimsical mouth the pretty slender girl he had already seen twice that evening she was staring at him and her brows were knitted haven't we met before she asked hesitatingly as she held out her hand what could he say surely he could not disclaim her acquaintance neither could he stultify his hostess for a moment everything seemed to go black in front of him then that very feeling suggested an excuse for not answering he put his hand to his heart and dropped upon a chair i feel faint he murmured will you pardon me miss morgan if i you'd better go into still's room for a moment she suggested she beckoned to her brother who came crowding up take him out he's fainting she commanded this crush is too much for him you know he hasn't recovered from that attack of yesterday yet fenton staggered out on morgan's arm and as the crowd made way for him he saw miss charmion's eyes still upon him with a puzzled questioning expression he felt base and mean i must get out of here right away he exclaimed as soon as they were alone in morgan's chamber i've spent too much time already i've neglected a terribly important errand you've saved my life old man said stillwell morgan effusively i don't know what we ever would have done you've made an awful hit people are crazy about you why marguerite says damn marguerite where's that bag i brought fenton looked eagerly about the room i don't know who you are but i'd be glad to have you consider me your friend 
and if i can do find that bag fenton exclaimed excitedly lord man if you knew what was in it he groped under the bed why isn't it here say i'll call one of the men morgan went to the door if that isn't found i'm ruined cried fenton haven't you any detectives here morgan's valet came running up a bag sir what kind of a bag a soft bag gray ooze leather hurry find it right away what did you do with it by heavens i'll send for the police perhaps it was taken into the ladies room sir i'll see while he left to inquire fenton fumed morgan fussed about anxious and embarrassed was it really valuable he asked weakly fenton did not answer but opened drawers looked in closets overturned piles of overcoats looked in hats in frantic haste every instant he grew more excited at last as he stood flushed and tumbled trying to think what to do whether to call for the police ask that every one be searched or appeal to miss morgan the valet returned with the lost bag fenton grabbed it from him and tremblingly looked inside a blaze of color flashed up from its dark interior miss charmion had it sir the valet explained they thought of course it belonged to one of the ladies and she was there getting ready to go home did she look into it fenton demanded with anxiety oh no sir she just took it looked at it and said it wasn't hers she was too worried to pay much attention someone had just telephoned to her and she was rather upset over it sir fenton heaved a sigh of relief and turned to morgan is your automobile ready he asked the valet interposed ready at the door sir i've got to get away in a hurry then morgan laid a hand on his arm if you don't wish to wait to change your clothes mr mr fenton john fenton mr fenton you can send back the suit you have on when you find it convenient it's no importance really and i'll give you a silk hat and an overcoat even in the whirl of his excited haste even with the memory of the dead man always in the back of his mind even with the responsibility of the jewels keeping him in a fever of unrest even with the thrill of belcharmion's near presence disturbing him the offer tingled a pleasant fancy he had never worn a silk hat in his life how he had longed to now in evening clothes it would be a satisfaction to go forth robed as a gentleman clad cap a pay in formal garb he grinned blushingly accepted the hat and gazed at it he smoothed the nap against his sleeve perhaps he might catch a glimpse of belcharmion again but no how disappointing he had of course to exit by way of the servant's staircase it was too bad in two minutes he had slipped out and was running downstairs with morgan's valet the motor-car was not at the side entrance they went round to the front of the building in search of it they found it drawn up in the line of waiting vehicles and fenton was just about to enter when turning he saw belcharmion coming out under the awning he paused in surprise she looked eagerly to right and left catching sight of him she smiled faintly and walked rapidly up could you take me up town she asked i've ordered a taxicab but it hasn't come and i'm in a great hurry i've had an important message a relative is dangerously ill i must get up there immediately i'm awfully worried about it why i shall be delighted said fenton he was trembling in every limb the idea of being alone with her at last sent him into a fever of excitement he turned to lead the way right over here he said as he turned suddenly the bag he was holding in one hand struck sharply against one of the iron stanchions of the awning it fell to the sidewalk he looked down to his horror some half-dozen pieces of jewelry had fallen out a ring or two a brooch a bracelet and half in half out a confused pile of precious stones sparkling under the light he looked up to see miss charmion staring pale-faced at the revelation the next minute a uniformed porter ran up to her and touched his cap your taxi miss charmion he said and bowing pointed the way to where a green car waited at the curb fenton was too embarrassed to speak he stood foolishly staring as she looked at him coldly and said then i shall not need to impose on you count 
but thank you just the same and drawing herself up she walked proudly to the taxicab turned and gazed at him then got in and drove away not till her car skived the corner and disappeared did fenton take his eyes from her then with a sigh he stooped scraped the jewels into the bag as the porter stared and walked to the morgan's touring car where shall i drive sir the chauffeur inquired it was some moments before fenton could collect his senses enough to recall the address the octoroon had given him where was it the stirring events of the night had all but obliterated her words somewhere in harlem oh yes the norcross five o oh, five no five 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 west one hundred and forty sixth street that was it he gave the address got into the car beside carl the chauffeur and they whirled away he crammed his silk hat down hard over his ears and leaned back in the car to enjoy the ride the brisk mild wind ran merrily past him the winking lights on the jersey shore flashed brightly across the hudson his brain cleared surely he had much to think of much had happened since he left his harlem home a careless thoughtless boy but there was only one thing he could think of now he put all other things aside and revelled in his dream he thought of nothing but belle charmion he wanted no one but belle charmion belle charmion in low-cut pale blue voile belle charmion of the olive skin and whimsical smile who was belle charmion what fate had led him continually in crossing and recrossing paths towards belle charmion did she know or care what destiny allied them in this mysterious way john fenton and belle charmion he loved belle charmion could belle charmion love him when would they meet in peace in joy when would they talk and tell what he so longed to hear he and belle charmion oh the smooth soft contour of her cheek the exquisite gesture of her hand so he dreamed fancy free in joyous abandon of belle charmion belle charmion belle charmion say this is one great night ain't it fenton came down with a thud from the clouds of romance to the chauffeur's commonplace he gave the remark a mumbling reply fine yes it's the wrong kind of a night to go home in as ruby diamond used to say diamond fenton queried remembering the phenomenal blonde of the caxton do you happen to know miss diamond that's queer the chauffeur laughed know her i drove the front cab with her and young framingham when they busted up the yale funeral do you know a girl she runs with named millie something a little black-eyed devil millie st valentine well i guess yes she's the one that drove the hearse with john adams quincy the third the hearse what the deuce was the yale funeral anyway say i guess you'd better tell me about it if it isn't too long a story the chauffeur chuckled to himself it was lucky for quincy it wasn't a longer story he said it was short but it certainly was lively i'll tell you about it and as he gave the steering wheel a sharp turn and turned the car into ninety-fourth street he began the great yale funeral why this was thanksgiving day a year ago you remember the football game when harvard trimmed yale for the first time in nine years six to four the score was and every cambridge man in new haven went crazy i wasn't there but i hear it was like a matinee in an ancient roman amphitheatre after the preliminary orgies the harvard rioters went to boston to celebrate the pride and chivalry of yale was due in new york to drown their sorrows in a theatre party at the marrying mary show well there was one harvard rooter who was so spifflicated by the triumph that he couldn't box the compass any more that was john adams quincy the third he was genially kidnapped by some of the speedy sons of eli with no hard feelings and the first thing he knew they had him in the yale train pulling out for new york when he began to look out the window for new london he suspected that something was wrong but it was too late to do anything by that time he would have to miss the crimson fire and the gilding of john harvard 
and the Cambridge police after all. The Yale men gave him the ha-ha and told him little old New York would have to do. So he made the best of it and went, reminding them of the score and the snake dance every time he opened a bottle, which was plenty often. He was a thoroughbred, that Quincy the Third. He was a spender, and he had money to spend. He was fairly poisonous with greenbacks. Old man Quincy was a triple-dyed billionaire in the first place, and in the second young Quincy had backed the Harvard Eleven for about five thousand dollars at two to five. He had something like sixteen thousand dollars in his pants when he got off the train at the Grand Central Station. By that time almost every Yale man in his car was down and out, but John Adams Quincy the Third was walking on the atmosphere, shedding ten-dollar bills at the slightest provocation. I was running a taxicab then, and of course I never knew anything about his start till afterwards when Millie told me all about it. My first sight of the fun came when I was standing in front of the Abbots on 45th Street waiting for a fare, and young Quincy blew round the corner from Jack's. Now, I wouldn't want to say Quincy was soused, exactly. That's an ugly word for a gent like him. But you might say he was, well, glorified, like, exhilarated, transmogrified. I don't know what you'd call it. I never had fifteen thousand dollars between me and working for a living, and I ain't sure how it feels. But Quincy was happy. There was no doubt about that. His hat was dented in, and his collar was marked all over six to four, and he was singing his Harvard lay to the tune of Three Blind Mice. Yale is dead, Yale is dead, Yale is dead. Eli said, Eli said, Eli said. They might grow crimson, but we'd grow blue. They gobbled our money at five to two. We let them have it, then what did we do? Yale is dead. You know the Abbots? It's mostly a press agent's club. Theatrical men, anyway. Well, Johnny Hobbs of the Hippodrome was just coming out the door with Nat Goodwin and a bunch of actors. Quincy recognized the big chap, so he come up and slapped him on the back and said, Hello, Nat. How are you? Goodwin beamed. Why, I'm a hygienic dream, he said. Yale's dead, says Quincy. Then you ought to give her a first-class funeral, says Nat Goodwin. He took Quincy's arm and spoke confidentially. None of these cloth-covered pine boxes with two hacks at eighty-five dollars. You ought to have at least twenty-seven carriages and a band. By the jumping John Harvard, I will, says Quincy. But not twenty-seven hacks, twenty-seven hearses, and then some. Nat walked away with his bunch, laughing. Quincy stood, thinking it out. Johnny Hobbs looked him over thoughtfully. Do you mean it? he asked. If you do, I got an idea. Do I mean it? Ain't I alone in a great city after the first time we've busted into Yale in nine years? I'm certainly going to celebrate if it costs me my inheritance. And Quincy pulls a roll of yellowbacks out of his hip pocket and shows enough money to make Johnny Hobbs fairly sick to his stomach. You come right in here, says Johnny. I'll fix you for fair. Wait till I get to the telephone, and I'll have all the dead wagons in New York here in half an hour. You won't have to celebrate alone, neither. I'll present you to the smashingest little brunette in town, and if she don't drive that Yale hearse for you, she'll never get another engagement on the stage while I'm alive. With that, he pulls Quincy into the Abbots. My fare come out just then, and I clocked him to the Astor Hotel. Well, just as I was pocketing my tip, this young Framingham chap come by with a bunch of men with Yale flags, all as sizzy as skyrockets. Ever heard of Montrose Framingham? Why, old President Framingham's son, you know. The New York and Pennsylvania Railroad man. The man they used to call Gold Sox Framingham after he cornered that western timber pool. The old man had money enough to wrap up the Metropolitan Tower in and tie it with a gold string, and he never was stingy with Montrose. It was him give Yale that big ancient history building in his freshman year. That's why he never got fired. 
although he certainly was some lively round about New Haven. Well, as I was saying, young Framingham come up to me. I'd driven him all over town, once I took him to Richmond, Virginia, in my cab on a bet, and he says, Hello, squash. The fellows call me that because I like squash pie with a layer of red pepper on top of it. What in the name of Eli are you driving a red taxi for? I thought you was a good Yale man. I hear Yale's dead, says I, grinning. You yellow-eyed clockwork crook, he says. For two cents I'd drown you in cylinder oil. Who told you that? I got it from John Adams Quincy the Third. I says. And what's more, he's going to give Eli a funeral in New York right away tonight. Is that right? he says. Honest? I told him what I'd heard in front of the Abbots, and he called after his gang to come back and hear. When I gave them the tale, they yelled like Comanches. Get into here, says Framingham, and he gets up side of me, and the rest pile into the back, and I took em round to the front of the Aster. There Framingham got out and ran up to the cab starter. Order all the taxicabs you can get, he says. The starter was staggered. What do you mean, sir, he says. How many do you need? Anything up to a hundred. And have em here in half an hour, round the corner, says Framingham. Then he comes up to me and asks me who is the press agent for the Metropolis Theatre. I told him it was Abby Moonstone, and we started to look him up. What are you going to do? I asked Framingham. I'm going to bust up that funeral, he says, if it costs me my degree, and I knew he meant it. Well, it didn't take us long to find Abby at the Knickerbocker bar, and it didn't take Abby long to see what they was in it for him and the Metropolis Theatre. He hurried out and rung up Ruby Diamond, his first prize showgirl, and by the time we got round to the Woodstock Hotel where she lived, she was ready for us in a pale blue slippery skin-tight dress and a millionaire hat. The rest was jewelry and ermine. Say, you've seen Ruby Diamond. No man can look on her and live. She's the ultimate peach. Abby introduced the two principles of the anti-funeral crusade, and we proceeded to get out and look for a band. Well, there wasn't a blessed band we could get. Quincy had caught the only one for sale coming home from a schutzenverein hullabaloo and we was up against it good say says ruby what's the matter with a salvation army band they make a whole lot of noise and they wear blue you can't get em i says i'll endow a hospital says framingham i'll give em a million new uniforms i'll put up for the christmas dinner for all the bums east of the alleghanies you drive down to the headquarters and I'll fix the commander-in-chief if I have to deposit my gold-bearing bonds. I'm going to have a female band in blue, or I'll eat it. Ra for Yale. So we clocks down to see the general. I never heard what it cost young Framingham. They must have taxed him something savage. But he got three bands. They was on their way to the big Thanksgiving Day free feed and was ordered to meet us at the Flatiron Building. When we got back to the Aster, we found a procession of taxicabs about three-quarters of a mile long, waiting. There was red, green, yellow, and black cars, and a Yale man in each. Moreover, about every one of them had a chorus girl out of the metropolis. The curly girlies was running then, and the crowd was beginning to gather some plenty. The traffic cops was near crazy. I took the head of the line and led the string down 8th Avenue and across 22nd to where the three bands was waiting. Then we set out looking for Quincy's funeral and trouble. Our scouts had come in and located a line of about 33 hearses forming on 2nd Avenue and 34th Street. Anyone who had any sense could be sure that the procession would head straight for Times Square. John Adams Quincy the Third was no yap, and we were sure he'd calculate to hit the middle of New York City good and hard before he got pulled. So Montrose Framingham give the word to steer up Broadway. The Salvation Lassies struck up. Are you washed? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And off we went. There was some good yelling when we struck the Great White Way 
and you needn't think we didn't draw a crowd. It was about half past seven by this time, and the tenderloin was beginning to get busy. At thirty fourth street, we formed in line two abreast, and the cornets switched to onward Christian soldiers. It was going fine. The cops couldn't stop the Salvation Army because they had permits, and as for the taxis, ain't they got a right to the street? It was smooth sailing till we got to forty second street and we sighted the funeral. There it was, held up east of Broadway, with the Schutzen band playing the Dead March in Saul and a row of hearses as far as the eye could reach, and a crowd running up and growing bigger every minute. And what do you think? Driving every hearse was a hippodrome chorus girl in evening dress. Johnny Hobbs had certainly done it well. Abby Moonstone was wild. Our fares give the Yale yell, and it was answered by Harvard Raz from the Hippodrome Girls. Quincy stood up and begun to sing Yale is Dead, and then they got the traffic cop's whistle to cross Broadway. On they come. It was so funny you wanted to cry. By this time they was a million people spilled around there, and some fool pulled the fire alarm just to help it along. Now, whether the traffic cop at the corner got rattled and really did blow his come-on whistle, or whether it was a riot call or something, I never knew. The cop denied it. Anyway, we all heard a whistle, and young Framingham yells to me, By the seven pink salamanders of Shiraz, squash, go at em. If you'll bust that Harvard guy's hearse, I'll give you a hundred dollars and go bail. I turned back and waved to the line. Come on, I says, and on we went. There was a yell from the mob you could have heard to the flat iron, and I charged for Quincy. I caught his nigh hind wheel and busted it right to smithereens. Then a mounted cop galloped up and got me. Well, it sure was funny. The hearse keeled over on the hubs and spilled out Quincy and Millie St. Valentine. They jumped just in time and landed on their feet and in less than two minutes the place was so tangled up with hearses and taxicabs and schutzenvereins and salvationists that you couldn't tell which was which the crowd swarmed into the mess like flies and then come the fire engines two steamers from each point of the compass and after them the ladder trucks and the water tower and then two patrol wagons full of reserves then the police got busy well, I was taken to the station about that time, and so I missed it. But I got the story from Millie St. Valentine. The minute John Adams Quincy the Third struck the ground, he seemed to come to and wake up to the fact that he'd got in bad. By Jupiter, he says to Millie, this is going to cost me about four million dollars. Oh, it ain't so bad as all that, says Millie. It'll probably be only ten dollars or ten days. Don't you believe it, says Quincy. I know better. Why, I'm ruined. We've got to beat it. Millie said she thought he was a piker for fair then. She didn't have any idea that he'd more'n just got cold feet. He took her hand and ducked through the crowd with her and rushed her into rectors. Then she found out what he was worrying about. It seems young Quincy had been in hot water before, and his folks was sore. He'd been featured in the police news in Boston papers so often, in fact, that his old man had give it to him straight that if it ever happened again, he'd disinherit him. See how it was? Quincy had already kicked up a row that would make more talk on Broadway than anything that had happened since the Dewey Parade. The morning papers would be full of it. He could just see the scare heads. Young millionaire plays ghastly joke on the Rialto, and all like that. Millie kind of felt for him. Quincy was a nice boy, and she liked him. So she said, well, the only thing to do is to fix the papers. But it'll cost a lot. I don't care if it costs two hundred thousand, said Quincy. It'll be cheap at the price. Will you come with me, O oh Queen? She said she would. Well, if you know anything about city editors, you can imagine what happened. The minute they see the girl, it was all off, and the more money Quincy offered, the more stubborn they got. What, kill a story like that? Son of a millionaire and the prettiest brunette in N.Y.C.? 
Not much. Look at the pictures. Look at the society slush they could throw in. Think of the well-known clubman stuff and the strikingly beautiful brunette. It was too good to keep back. Quincy was no sooner out of the office with his grouch than the city editor was telephoning to the police stations, ordering photographs and sending for his star reporter. That was the tale all over town. Quincy was perfectly sick. Well, he took Millie home, and she tried to jolly him up, but it was no use. He figured that he was out three millions at least by his folly, and he left her reception room talking a lot about suicide. Millie allows she was pretty badly scared. Well, of course, all this time Johnny Hobbs had been good and busy. He phoned in the story as a friend of the paper to every city editor. He sent about a thousand photographs of Millie downtown by messengers, and then he waylaid the ten o'clock club, the theater details from the papers. He tipped them off with all sorts of fancy details he'd doped up, and then he went to bed happy. So did Abby Moonstone, who'd been on the same job with three stenographers. Of course, that was what saved Quincy. Them press agents done it too well. Every city editor in town smelled a plant and give orders at midnight to kill the story. So when John Adams Quincy the Third got up at five o'clock next morning at the plaza and sent down for the papers, expecting to see his name in a three-column scarehead, he spent two hours going through them with a fine tooth comb to find that the funniest thing that had happened on Broadway within the memory of man hadn't been so much as mentioned in a single paper. All the same, it didn't save him his money. Millie married him three weeks afterward and got most of it after all. End of chapter 10「ファイブアウトオブフォーのファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブアウトオブファイブ and gets a new name. The chauffeur had hardly finished his story before the car drew up to the curb in front of a brick apartment house on 175th Street and stopped. Fenton descended, felt in his pockets in vain for a tip, and bade the chauffeur an apologetic good night. He went into the vestibule and looked along the row of letter boxes for the name of Flint and pressed the electric button above. A muffled hello came, diminished and faint through the speaking tube. He replied, What the devil is it? the invisible speaker asked. I've got the jewels, Fenton shouted through the mouthpiece. A spasmodic clicking of the electric latch came in answer. By its nervous rapidity, Fenton could easily imagine that his information had caused some excitement. He pushed open the front door and ran upstairs. The halls were dimly lighted, and he looked in vain for any indications of a greeting. Up to the second, up to the third floor, and then, looking higher, he heard a man's gruff voice calling stealthily, One flight more! Up Fenton went with his bag. At the top, a man, unrecognizable in the semi-darkness, seized his arm and hurried him toward a lighted hallway, spun him round, and looked at him eagerly. Who are you, anyway? My name doesn't matter, said Fenton. I've got the stuff right here. Well, I'll be hanged, he ejaculated, and then he looked at Fenton again. Where in the devil did you get em? Fenton had by this time learned discretion, and replied only by a question. Is Flint here? The man stared. His expression changed, then he controlled himself. Yes, I'm Flint, he said finally. Fenton breathed a sigh of relief. Oh, then I suppose it's all right. You'll take em right back to the Brewster house, I suppose. You'll lose no time? Oh, that's all right. I'll get em back the first thing in the morning. Fenton handed him the bag somewhat reluctantly. There seemed to be nothing else to do. 
but it seemed a mild ending to his night of adventure. There was no doubt that it was Flint by the octoroon's description. He grabbed the bag fiercely and looked inside, then snapped it shut. Fenton became uneasy. Then I can tell Miss, you know, the girl, that it's all right, he said. Yes, it's all right, son. Flint held the bag behind his back. They'll be in the safe by nine o'clock before the coroner comes. But you'd better skip now. There's no need of exciting suspicion. Go home and go to bed. You've done well. He crowded Fenton to the doorway nervously and stood guarding it. Fenton turned hesitatingly. I hope I can find her, he said. She was awfully worried about this. But I've done all I can, I suppose. Good night, said the man abruptly and suddenly slammed the door. Fenton heard the lock click. Then, for the first time, he grew actively suspicious. Flint was a tall, gaunt, grizzled creature, wrinkled and weather-beaten, with deep-set gray eyes. As he turned for his final word, he showed a great misshapen ear. The lower lobe was split half in two. Suddenly, as if spoken by an audible voice, came the fortune-teller's words, Beware of a man with a split ear. Fenton's suspicions grew blacker, but he had done exactly what he had been asked to do. If there were any mistake, it was surely not his. He turned slowly to the staircase and walked down, thinking, well, it was too late now. Perhaps it was all right. Why should he worry? So thinking, he went downstairs and out to the street. Should he go home? He smiled at his costume. His dress clothes and top hat seemed to demand another adventure. He felt abstractedly in his pockets for a cigarette, and noticed for the first time that again his pockets were absolutely empty. What a night! He yawned and walked up 146th Street, thinking of Belcharmian. Just as he turned the corner, two men, walking rapidly, passed him. He caught but a momentary look, but that sight made him turn eagerly and gaze at them again. There was something familiar about both of them, by Jove. It was O'Shea and Elkhurst, or, as it appeared both had aliases, Nallery and Sproul. Neither had recognized him, fortunately. He stopped in a trance of wonder. What did this encounter mean? He could still see them walking rapidly toward the Norcross apartments. As Fenton stood there, gaping at the night, they turned up the steps and entered the building. Then, in a flash, he began to suspect them. Of course, both were after the jewels, and if they were going up to the apartment, either they would attack Flint or wait. Now he had it. Flint was probably a member of the same gang. It was as plain as a photograph at last. Evidently, Flint had been notified of the capture of the gems. Well, no wonder he had been surprised when Fenton had handed them back to one of the gang itself. Fenton cursed himself for his stupidity. But all this was surmise. He wanted to make sure, and hurried back to the entrance of the Norcross apartments, and found that by some accident the outer door had not latched. He crept up four flights, approached the door of Flint's apartment, put his ear to the keyhole, and listened. A hoarse burst of laughter greeted his ears. There was no doubt of it. Even now, no doubt, with blood on their hands, they were dividing the spoil. What could he do? Nothing, it seemed. And yet he would not leave the place. He walked downstairs trying to think of some plan to retrieve his blunder. On the floor below he looked about, saw a door without a nameplate, tried it, and found it was unlocked. He opened it and walked in. There was no carpet on the floor. It was evident the flat was vacant. He groped his way along the inner hall, a long straight passage toward the rear, and emerged finally, after bumping into several corners, into a small kitchen faintly illuminated by the moon. Through the windows he saw a fire escape. He left his precious silk hat upon the wash tubs, lifted the sash, crawled out, and cautiously ascended the iron ladder. The windows of the kitchen above, however, were dark, and they were fastened. There could be nothing done that way and he returned. Cruising about on a little voyage of discovery, he found a candle end and a few matches on the kitchen shelf. He struck a light and sat down on the top of the tubs to think. 
he had not waited long before he heard footsteps on the floor above then there was a rattle in the shaft and he heard the dumbwaiter descending holding his lighted candle in one hand fenton opened the sheet-iron door and saw the rope running he held the candle nearer and looked up the dumbwaiter was now visible slowly descending he watched it with his heart in his mouth it came to the level of his eyes and he saw that both shelves were empty the next moment he was surprised to see two feet patent leathered shining in the candlelight standing on top of the apparatus slowly the waiter moved down creaking pantaloons appeared a coat then hands carefully working at the rope another minute and the lower half of the body had disappeared in the hole and he was confronted by the astonished eyes of elkhurst alias sproule the little car stopped sproule looked as queer as an actor in a punch and judy show like some curious jack in the pulpit though too amazed too fearful apparently to speak fenton stood with the lighted candle dripping grease upon his evening coat with his tall hat rakishly ajar upon his head the moment was dramatic there was an instant of fine sustained suspense and then the gentleman who had seen the more of the world spoke by jove it's the chap i gave that tweed suit to for heaven's sake help me out and be quick about it there was indeed need of haste for above were now heard cries of rage and anger hurrying footsteps and finally a bang at the door of the shaft in the kitchen overhead sproule made a quick dive from his perch and landed in fenton's arms this extinguished the little light the cries meanwhile had increased in vigour and some one began violently pulling up the dumb-waiter sproule landed with stocking feet upon the kitchen floor he released himself from fenton's arms then silently shut the door of the shaft there was a riot overhead wait till i lock the front door are the windows bolted fasten them and we'll wait in the passageway is there a key to this confounded door yes all right now then come on quick fenton fastened the kitchen windows and joined sproule in the hallway the kitchen door was locked then sproule went to the door to the stairway and saw that it was also fastened the clamor upstairs had ceased or at least it could not be heard from where they stood but in another moment they heard men rushing up the stairs a pounding at the hall door above then a smash as it was broken in what's that fenton asked anxiously by jove i believe they're pulled said sproule i got out just in time the police fenton inquired breathlessly there has been a plain clothesman following me all the evening i thought we had thrown him off the scent at the knickerbocker before we came up here but he must be up there with the cops wait till they come down they waited for ten minutes without speaking listening to the excitement upstairs and finally the clumping of footsteps was heard on the stairs as a half dozen men came down as soon as they had passed sproule opened the door a crack and looked out and seeing that they were almost down the next flight ran to the banisters and looked over fenton joined him and saw the last of the group go round the corner it was the man in the shepherd's plaid suit whom he had already seen that evening at scheffel hall at the plaza and at the st paul building entrance jove that was a narrow squeak if they don't search the house let's come into the front room and look he led the way to a small front parlor and up to the window where they saw a patrol wagon standing o'shea and flint were being helped in and the man in the shepherd's plaid suit was talking to a policeman on the sidewalk as fenton watched these two also got into the wagon and it drove off he's been watching me for a week trying to locate the rest of the gang said sproule in a low voice by jove if i could only get out of here they wouldn't see me in new york for one while say boy he took fenton by the arm it may be hard for you to believe that i'm straight but i can prove it o'shea knows it by this time but luckily he daren't revenge himself on me for trying to queer this job with the brewster jewels for a week i've been trying to give him the double cross 
Fenton drew back suspiciously, but despite the evidence against the man, his manner had candor. It was hard to believe him a murderer, yet it was hard, too, to believe his last assertion. A week? I don't see how that can be, he said. Why, the jewels were stolen only yesterday. Yes, but they might have gone at any minute. Flint and O'Shea have been planning to blow that safe at the Brewster house for a long while. Before they had things ready, Brewster got away with the stuff himself. As he left the safe door partly open, of course, Flint discovered it. And when that girl brought home Brewster's body, he suspected where the jewels must be. He was sure when she phoned him about them, and promised to bring them up tonight. But O'Shea was suspicious of her. He judged everyone by himself. They were too valuable to trust to her care at any rate. So he watched her. She acted so queerly that I doubted her honesty myself, and was soon convinced that she was trying to get away with the stuff. Well, we shadowed her to the fortune-teller's house, and saw you go into the same place. After the raid you came out of another house, so I followed you, leaving O'Shea to chase the girl. When we found you two together at Sheffel Hall, we were sure that you had fixed up some game. In fact, we could see easily enough by the look of you, you were pretty scared, that you had the jewels. So we didn't take any chances. O'Shea and Phillipsborn went after you. I was half a block behind, watching for the police when they got you. Phillipsborn? Fenton queried. Why, yes, he was a waiter O'Shea had known for some time. Queer chap and clever, too. He had just about pulled off a queer game with a young chap named Morgan. He made up to Miss Morgan, posing as a foreign count, and got engaged to her. He was after a batch of pearls they had. O'Shea got him to help us follow the girl we suspected this evening, and as soon as that was finished, Phillipsborn was going back to the Morgans as Count Capricorni and close up that job. But he's dead, said Fenton. He must be the man I saw on the floor of Nallery's office in the St. Paul building. He drew away from Spruill with renewed suspicion. That's right, said Spruill soberly. And it was a pretty bad piece of business, too. Do you wonder I'm anxious to get away? But it was O'Shea that murdered him. And O'Shea will go to the chair for it safe enough. You see, as soon as we had the jewels, I took a couple of stones and pawned them for ready money as we were terribly short of cash, arranging to meet them and Flint at the Bartholdi to divide up the loot. Flint was to wait up at the Norcross here, in case we missed you. Well, after I got up to the plaza for my grip, so as to be all ready to leave town, O'Shea telephoned me that he was afraid that he was followed, and asked me to meet him in the St. Paul building, where he had his fake office as Nallery and Company. I went down there hoping to get some chance to get away with the stuff myself. At any rate, I was determined that this would be my last job with O'Shea. Phillipsborn stood out for a full quarter as his share, but O'Shea wouldn't have it. Phillipsborn pulled a gun, and then O'Shea went at him with a dirk, like a butcher. Phillipsborn went down with O'Shea's knife between his ribs. It was horrible. He was gasping and bleeding on the rug when O'Shea and I were terrified by a knock at the office door. It was I, said Fenton breathlessly. Well, we had to decide everything in a few seconds. We hadn't money enough to get away with. The only thing to do was to get up to Flint's and get him to give us some. I couldn't escape from O'Shea anyway. He was frightened white, and he clung like a leech. I knew that there was a detective after me. He had followed me from Sheffel Hall to the plaza and was probably in the St. Paul building, but I had to take a chance that he wouldn't arrest me till I had led him to the rest of the gang he was after. He was running down a New Haven burglary, I was sure, something we had pulled off a few days before. I could only hope that we could get up to Flint's, where I could get away from O'Shea, before the place was pulled. Well, I saw that plain clothesman out of the tail of my eye as we left, and we led him a chase dodging up one street and down another, in and out of saloons, into hotels, even into one theatre. He kept on our trail like grim death for an hour. Then I thought I had thrown him off the scent. By this time O'Shea was a pulp of fear and suspense. When we got to Flint's, though, 
and when Flint told of how you had handed over the jewels, O'Shea laughed like a fool. Flint didn't laugh, though, when he saw O'Shea in the light. The man's coat was streaked with blood, and his hands were red with it. Flint took the Irishman into the bathroom to clean up a little, leaving me in the kitchen. That's when I grabbed the bag and jumped into the dumbwaiter. He paused, rose, and looked out of the window anxiously. They'll want you as a witness anyway, won't they? Fenton asked. I expect they will, but they won't have me. They've got evidence enough. They'll convict O'Shea easily. This isn't the first thing they've got on him. Why, they're after him now for that Courtney kidnapping business, and that was seventeen years ago. Seventeen years ago? Fenton's mind had more than once that night gone back to O'Shea's part in his own childhood. He knew he must have been about four years old when he first knew O'Shea and the house in South Boston. Fenton was now twenty-one. He made a rapid subtraction and trembled at a sudden thought. He had begun to suspect that O'Shea was not his uncle. What if the mystery were at last to be explained? He tried to speak calmly, but his mind was whirling as he asked, What was that case? I never heard of it. I'll tell you about it while we wait, said Spruill Elkhurst. It was certainly a curious affair, the story of the biter bit, you know. So, taking a position where he could look out of the window, he began, The Courtney kidnapping case. Seventeen years ago, Mangus O'Shea was a petty crook who was ready for any odd job that would bring him in a few dollars. He had begun life as a plumber, but gradually drifted into evil ways and had already done a two years stretch in San Quentin, California, for sneak thieving. After leaving the pen, he came east, where his face was not so well known to the police, and worked off and on at his trade, trying to keep straight. You see, he was one of those uncertain, halfway characters whom you can respect neither as an honest man nor as an out-and-out -out crook courageously pitting his wits against the police his face was ugly red eyes and little black teeth a mongrel with a mongrel's temper he was pretty generally disliked in south boston where he lived well he picked up an acquaintance with a bunch of crooks that frequented the nucleus saloon on the point and they soon had him back in the game he was quick-witted enough cunning rather than clever though a good man to do their dirty work it was about this time let's see in ninety four it must have been that he met pye lemon pye they used to call him on account of his red hair lemon was a nova scotian and he was a genius bold and clever and versatile he was a big man every way he had a big body a big voice and a big laugh with a mind that could bore through things like a gimlet. Lemon was one of the finest confidence men in the business, and he put over some sensational jobs in his time. He had absolutely no moral sense. He believed the world was his oyster, and he opened it. He would have made a great general if he had had the chance. Well, Pye, Lemon Pye, tolerated O'Shea, because the Irishman could be so easily teased. Lemon would sit drinking with him, chuckling at O'Shea's temper, and every little while landing a jab that would make O'Shea writhe. I never saw two men who were not friends fraternize so. It seemed as if O'Shea sought Lemon's company all the time, always hoping to get even with the big man. But try as O'Shea would, Lemon always won and O'Shea grew surlier and surlier, which pleased Pye immensely. One night O'Shea read in his paper that a millionaire named J. O. H. Courtney, down in Jersey, had made a couple of millions on a big deal in copper, and mentioned it to the big fellow who was with him. Pye remarked that he'd like to get a slice of that profit. Then he rolled his cigar over to the other corner of his mouth calmly, and added that he intended to get it too why you fool said o'shea you don't expect he carries it around with him or keeps it in the dining-room silver safe do you oh something like that pye answered confidently 
I happen to know where he does keep one prize piece of portable property, and Lemon rose and yawned like a menagerie lion. I suppose you think you can con him out of his big money, snarled O'Shea. You'll find these big chaps know that game themselves. Well, if I start anything, I'll have a pretty good argument to make him come across, O'Shea. You ought to study psychology, but you can't teach a rat mathematics. He grinned down into O'Shea's angry little red eyes, chuckled, and walked out. O'Shea forgot all about the conversation, till one day, about two months later, he picked up a paper and stared, fascinated, at a three-column scarehead. Courtney's little four-year-old son, Bruce, had been kidnapped, and there was the devil to pay about it. Of course, you're too young to remember the affair, but it was the talk of the country. The story ran on the front pages of the newspapers for three weeks, and inside for at least two months more. Every sheriff and policeman in the country was trying to get the reward. Old man Courtney nearly beggared himself paying for detectives and the thousand expenses of the search. Now, as soon as O'Shea read the news, he made up his mind that Pye had the child. So, having inside information and a few hundred dollars laid up against a rainy day, O'Shea decided to have a try for the reward. So far, so good. But what had become of Lemon? O'Shea started to find out. First he located Mrs. Pye in a lodging house on Tremont Street, Boston, and took a room there. Then he began to watch her mail. Three days after he moved in, he noticed a letter addressed to her on the hall stand. He sneaked it up to his room, opened it with a knitting needle, and read this. Am holding the goods for a rise. Expect to make a good sale. Address H. C. Stevens, 325 Duluth Place, Chicago. O'Shea grinned and patted himself on the back for getting ahead of Pye at last. He considered his fortune as good as made. He resealed the envelope, put the letter back on the stand, and jumped on to the first train for Chicago. No police assistance for him. He knew that if he tipped them off, they would collect the reward themselves and give him the laugh. What he had to do was to locate the kid and then wire Courtney to come on. As matters stood then, there was a reward of $5,000 for the return of the child. Mr. Courtney had offered 3000 the city of Orange a thousand, and the police a thousand more. It was well worth working for. O'Shea was jubilant. He found that the address given in Pye's note was that of a small family hotel. O'Shea took a front room and interviewed the chambermaid who corroborated the note. Mr. Stevens and a young boy with black hair, not red, mind you, had a two-room suite on the floor below. O'Shea spent three hours at the window watching the street. At about four o'clock he saw Lemon coming in with the boy, and he was sure of his quarry. He ran out and wired Courtney to come on immediately. When he returned from the telegraph office, he found from the chambermaid that Mr. Stevens and his pseudo-son had already left. O'Shea was wild. Not only had the boy slipped through his fingers, but he had given Courtney evidence against himself, and he might be followed. There was nothing to do but get away and start on a new search. He cursed his indiscretion with the chambermaid, packed up his valise, and came back to Boston, determined next time he located Lemon to steal the child himself. Meanwhile, Mr. Courtney had raised his reward to $5,000, making 7000 in all. Mrs. Pye had moved. It cost O'Shea fifty-odd dollars, two weeks' time, and a lot of trouble to discover her. She was found, finally, in Plymouth, where she was living alone in the Samoset house as Mrs. Stevens. O'Shea made the acquaintance of the clerk, posing as a Federal Secret Service agent, and finally got possession of a letter from Pye, giving his address in Detroit. O'Shea was off again, mad and tired and anxious. 
This time, when he got to the address, he ran bang into Pye, who was coming out the door alone. O'Shea had tried to disguise himself with a red wig, some court plaster patches, and a bandage, but his little red eyes and his little black teeth gave him away. Lemon gave one look at him. Lemon's eyes bored in like a corkscrew, and he chuckled. Well, he said good-naturedly, was you looking for me, Mr. O'Shea? He was no more afraid of O'Shea than a bull would be of a puppy, and it made O'Shea furious. I'm looking for that Courtney kid, said the Irishman, and you'd better let me in on the deal, or I'll make it hot for you. Pye looked him over. Pye laughed till he shook. Oh, you can have the kid when I'm through with him, he said. I didn't know you wanted him so bad. I'll let you know when it's your turn. And Pye walked off as cool as a snowball. O'Shea nosed about a bit, found Lemon was living alone in the house. No trace of Bruce Courtney. Next day he got a clue that led him post haste to Minneapolis. Nothing doing. It was hard work. No chance for him to get his linen washed, economizing with his food, his money giving out, hot, tired, mad, fighting mad, but more and more determined to get that boy from Minneapolis to Charleston in a smoking car. He couldn't afford a sleeper now, and there the trail fizzled out, and meanwhile he was reading in the papers that the reward was raised to fifteen thousand. Sometimes he almost had his fingers on the kid. Next day he was miles off the scent. Why, Pye just played with him. It was a game of hare and hounds. After a month of this sort of thing, O'Shea stumbled against a woman named Lily Dean, Pye used to know. Lily said he had gone back on her, and told O'Shea, weeping into a lace handkerchief, that Pye was in Washington, up against it, and out of cash. O'Shea followed up the tip, and found it was straight. Pye was hiding with a little boy with red hair in the negro quarter of town. O'Shea pawned his vest, his watch, and his revolver, and went after the kid. He watched his chance till Pye left the house, then broke into his room and found a little boy crying in a rocking chair. O'Shea went wild. He not only had the kid, but he found forty dollars in bills in the top bureau drawer. With these he got to Wilmington, took a room in a hotel, and wired a red-hot message to Mr. Courtney again. Then it occurred to him to search the child for marks of identification. The kid began to talk about Lily, and O'Shea had a panic. Finally he found a note in the little boy's trousers pocket. It read, Not yet, but soon. O'Shea caved in and cried. It wasn't the Courtney kid at all but some boy Pye had borrowed for the purpose of throwing O'Shea off the track. Well, that broke up what was left of O'Shea's enthusiasm for the reward. He left the kid in the hotel and went home stone broke. His wife was away in Fitchburg with her sister, who was ill, and O'Shea sulked about the house, hungry, cold, and disappointed, till in despair he got a job at his trade and tried to forget the reward. Meanwhile, the reward had been increased again till it stood at twenty thousand dollars. O'Shea, knowing Pye had the child, was of course crazy to use that information, but his telegrams to Mr. Courtney and his stealing of the other child prevented his daring to use what he knew. Well, as I said, Pye was a genius. The way he collected ransom for Bruce Courtney has never been beaten. Of course, Mr. Courtney was nearly insane by this time, and ready to do anything to get his son back. The police seemed able to do nothing. One day he received a letter accurately describing Bruce and offering to give him up for $5,000. With the advice of his detectives, Mr. Courtney decided to accept the bargain, pay over the money, and arrest the one who received it. The letter directed him to leave the money in thousand-dollar bills tucked into the cushion of a certain easy chair in the public parlor of a New York hotel at a certain time. This was done, and the chair was watched. A stylishly dressed young lady, Pye's friend Lily Dean it was, sat down in the chair, took a letter from her bag, read it calmly, 
then arose and walked to another chair and sat a while the detectives watched her till she left the parlor then they nabbed her of course she protested her innocence but in spite of her anger she was taken to a room and searched no money was found on her and after some delay in the hope of identifying her she was discharged from custody do you see how the trick was done she had removed the money from the first chair gone over to the second and hidden it there in a similar place then during the excitement of her arrest another person had gone to chair number two got the bills and made off it was a daringly simple plan and succeeded perfectly the girl's confederates were never traced the money was obtained but the kidnappers did not return the child no doubt they were afraid of the risk it made a tremendous amount of talk when the facts were published the whole subject became prominent in the papers again o'shea read of it of course and his opinion of lemon's cleverness went up he was considerably afraid too that his own part in the business might be traced and kept pretty quiet he was desperately hard up now and kept his eyes open for a means of raising money more easily than by working for it his wife's sister meanwhile had died he had to pay the funeral expenses and send his nephew to an orphan asylum o'shea was not happy these days one day he was riding in a columbus avenue car in boston when two men came in and sat down beside him they were discussing something earnestly and o'shea always with his ears open for news listened for a while he couldn't make out what they were talking about but finally it developed that one was telling of a basket of silverware a large basket it appeared fitted up in compartments containing a complete assortment of solid silver dining plate this sounded good to o'shea he listened more closely the house one said was vacant the family being away in the country seems to me it's kind of dangerous leaving that silver there alone all night said one of the men oh it's all right you get it early in the morning and ship it down to marblehead i can't bother to stay out there all night said the other pretty handy for burglars though easy to get away with all packed up like that oh they never have burglars out brighton way it's a small house and don't look like they'd ever be anything worth stealing there on harvard street is it how'll i know which house it is why it's just the other side of the brighton road toward alston village don't you remember that little yellow house with the stable on a rise of land at the turn of the road oh i expect i can find it all right i'll call about seven o'clock where is it in the dining-room yep the first speaker handed over a house key you can't miss it be sure and have it insured it's all sealed up and addressed the two men got off the car and o'shea grinned he decided to go after that silver himself that night get it home and melt it up as soon as he could get a furnace he could easily sell it at one of the fences he knew that evening he hired an old covered wagon and drove out over the mill dam and out the brighton road to harvard street the house was easily found o'shea left his wagon outside slipped round to the back of the house and jimmied the dining-room window it was nothing at all to do he got in found a huge wicker basket tied up sealed and addressed as had been described and lifted it it was heavier than he expected but he opened the front door and got it out that way though it was a hard job he watched till he was sure there was no one passing hoisted the basket into his cart and drove back home in a high good humor it was two o'clock when he reached the little side street where he lived and got the basket into his house and called his wife she was anxious as he was to see the swag they cut the ropes and threw up the lid there resting on old bed quilts carefully arranged so that he could not be harmed was a child of four years of age apparently dead o'shea stared in horror his wife nearly fainted one look at the child told the story it was bruce courtney the boy o'shea had spent three months and his last dollar trying to capture his hair at first sight seemed black but at the roots it showed reddish proving that it had been dyed 
around his neck was a gold locket set with a star in diamonds pictures of which had appeared in all the newspapers if there had been any doubt about the boy's identity the note pinned to his breast would have settled it it was from lemon pie and said you can have him now i'm through with him l p you can imagine o'shea's feelings with the hue and cry after bruce courtenay it was like receiving a present of a stick of dynamite with a fuse lighted despite the fact that twenty thousand dollars reward had been offered for the boy his presence was the most dangerous thing possible how could o'shea ever explain how he had found him he could not confess to a burglary he was already in none too good repute with the police and his movements where the boy had undoubtedly been could probably be traced if he disclosed the information but worse than this what if the boy were dead it would be almost impossible to dispose of the corpse the case was desperate o'shea summoned his nerve took up the boy and found that he was still breathing but in a deep stupor at all hazards he must be revived if it were possible while o'shea hurried out for a doctor mrs o'shea undressed the child put him to bed and disposed of the blanket it was two in the morning when the doctor arrived he looked at the boy and looked again then he turned to o'shea is this your child he asked sharply mrs o'shea answered quickly as women will in an emergency it's my sister's boy doctor she died last week and we're going to adopt the poor little fellow will he live do you think she burst into tears well that settled it luckily she had talked with her neighbors of her sister's death and they all knew of the boy the o'sheas took the bull by the horns and made the best of a pretty bad bargain bruce courtenay became michael o'shea he recovered from the drugs had his head shaved and in a week was in a pretty fair way to grow into a south boston tough but when the reward was again raised for the return of courtney's son o'shea looked at his wife and sighed he's worth twenty-five thousand dollars as he stands he groaned and i dasn't claim one cent of it this kidnapping business ain't what it's cracked up to be you can't get no easy money in this world we'll have to put the boy to work he's a bad investment for them what can't afford him this thought was rubbed into him well by lemon pie who fat and complacent at the end of his victorious campaign one day met o'shea as he was going to work with his soldering iron and lead pipes you was in too much of a hurry for that silver o'shea he said we had bare time to feed the poor kitty the knockout drops before you was in at the window i would have come downstairs and helped you with a basket only i was laughing that hard i couldn't move i hated to part with the lad for i was growing fond of him but the detectives was getting too lively for me and besides you wanted him so bad i thought it was a shame not to let you have him long before sproule elkhurst had finished his story fenton or as he undoubtedly must begin to call himself bruce courtney had gone off into a reverie was he bruce courtney there could be no doubt of it everything tallied with what he knew of his own history and the evidence of the golden locket was alone sufficiently convincing what it could mean to him in the future he could not guess but it kindled his imagination and his pride if this could be proved he would be no longer the obscure unknown architectural draughtsman he would have a legal name relatives and perhaps money it came to him in a flash that above all this might give him a position which would enable him to meet belle charmion more easily he dared not trust himself to speak however he was not yet sure of sproule there were the brewster jewels too to be accounted for what had become of them should he still have to fight for them sproule who had given another long careful look out of the window now returned and interrupted fenton's daydream by a light touch on the shoulder do you believe i'm straight he asked seriously it was hard for fenton to reply he knew sproule for a pal of o'shea's a crook and perhaps worse might he not in spite of what he had told be an accomplice to the murder 
as he was undoubtedly an accessory after the fact. And yet the man also had candor that could scarce be doubted. There was something Fenton liked about him. He had charm. Oh, I don't know, Fenton stammered. How do I know you're telling me the truth? You say you tried to queer O'Shea's job, but here I find you with him right in the game all through. I think I can prove it, said Sproul calmly. He unbuttoned his coat, drew forth a soft leather bag, and poured from it a glittering collection of jewelry, sparkling with precious stones upon the floor. Fenton stared. For the third time that night he had come strangely across the Brewster jewels. It seemed impossible. Despite the seriousness of the occasion, he had to smile, as at some grotesque joke. It seemed that, despite all his blunders, he could not lose this mysterious treasure. He looked up at Sproul in wonder. Will you take this stuff back to the Brewster house? Sproul asked quietly. Fenton nodded still staring with wonder. Then he added, I'll try it again, but for heaven's sake, explain your part in all this. All right, said Sproul. I will. I admit that I have been a crook. For five years I have been a member of one of the cleverest and most desperate gangs in the country. But I've broken away, or tried to. Tonight, if I succeeded, was to end it all. Maybe I can do it yet. I hardly know how to make you believe what I want to say. If you only knew my wife, I think you might understand. I do know your wife, said Fenton. She came into your apartment at the plaza before I left. I had a long talk with her. You did? Sproul's voice trembled with excitement. Did she? But of course, you couldn't know. She'd never tell if she suspected. She knows that you're a crook, said Fenton quietly. Oh, God! Sproul buried his face in his hands. Fenton put his hand on the man's shoulder. See here, old man, he said kindly. If you're honest, if you want to be straight, the best thing you can do is to go right to her, if you can possibly get away. She's going to take the first train to Philadelphia tomorrow. You'd better meet her there. Oh, I can't face her. I daren't. You must. You'll find she'll forgive you. She'll do more than that. She'll help you to turn over a new leaf. I know, for she has said so to me. Sproul spoke between gritted teeth. If you knew how I love her, you'd believe me. My love for her has kept me in hell for a year, trying to break away from this gang. You don't know what a fight it has been. O'Shea is a devil. He has it on me for so many things I've done, in the past, that she doesn't know about. Oh, I'd have done my time and been happy enough in jail to get away from O'Shea, but I couldn't disgrace her. She loved me so, trusted me so. I've tried and tried to break with him, but each time he's pulled me back into the net, threatening to expose me. It was no use. So yesterday I decided to leave her. If I was caught, at least it wouldn't drag her name into it. I had an idea she had already begun to suspect me, so I decided never to come back to her and let her think what she would. Do you really think that she'd give me a chance? If you'd explain a matter of a ruby necklace, I think she would. Oh, God, did she tell you that? That was something I've almost died about since. It was a horrible thing to do, but I was distracted. I didn't know what I was doing, really. I knew I had to leave her and I wanted to give her something in remembrance of me. We had cleaned up a house in New Haven. I got hold of this necklace out of the swag, without O'Shea's knowing it, and I gave it to her. It was a crazy, horrible thing to do. I see it now. It might be discovered on her any time. But I was distracted, I tell you. I didn't think. I only knew I loved her, and I had lost her forever. I had to do something. That necklace has been her curse. But you can make it her blessing if you want to, said Fenton. Go to her, and she will tell you something about it, and something that should make you two love each other more than ever. I'll try, said Sproul. If I get out of this safe, I'll take her abroad somewhere and begin all over again. It was nearly four o'clock by this time. Fenton, cramped and stiff, rose and walked about the room, and looked out for the first signs of dawn. 
while Sproul Elkhurst reconnoitred from the hall door. After fifteen minutes he came back. Well, I'm going to try it, he said. Goodbye, and if they get me, I want you to do one thing for me. I know, said Fenton. You want me to tell your wife that you had tried to be straight. For love of her, Sproul added. Then he wrung Fenton's hand and slipped down the stairs. Fenton watched from the window, saw him walk with an apparently careless, leisurely stride along the street toward Broadway, and disappear round the corner. Then Fenton brushed his silk hat lovingly, put it on, buttoned the bag of jewels inside his waistcoat, and walked downstairs. End of chapter 11「Find the Woman」「Find the Woman」Find the Woman by Gillette Burgess Chapter 12 A Harlem Lodging House Describing Fenton's Return Home in a Top Hat and How He Was Welcomed by a Friend and a Letter and How He Profited by Each of Them The sky was streaked red with the flush of dawn when John Fenton emerged from the Norcross Apartments and set out at last for his home. There was no hurry now. He had no further fear of pursuit. O'Shea and Flint were in custody, and Sproul had proved his honesty. So with the leather bag of jewels buttoned snugly under his waistcoat, Fenton decided to walk. He had much to think over. The events of the past night passed before his eyes like a dazzling, incredible, moving picture show but ever in and out of its fantastic scenes appeared and disappeared a mysterious fascinating heroine belle charmion would she ever re-enter his melodrama some intuition told him that she would that in some strange way their lives were entangled and the threads of their destinies must meet again the fresh cool air revived him and he strode along with as much spirit as if he had but just awakened from a restful night as the sun rose it grew warmer there was a touch of spring in the air it sent his spirit several degrees higher he grew more boyish and swung along whistling a lively march so down broadway boulevard all the way to one hundred and twenty fifth street and then eastward as he approached his boarding-house one of a row of dreary-looking wooden buildings with high stoops painted each one a separate colour lead and molasses yellow and brown he saw with surprise that someone was sitting on the front steps drinking from a milk bottle who was it the figure was familiar and something about the jaunty audacious attitude still more so fenton stopped to watch the man rose and waved a newspaper it was jack richmond the star reporter of the item fenton's heart sank for a moment he was inclined to turn and escape rather than encounter this persistent news-gatherer he feared the reporter's inquisition once on the scent of a story fenton knew well enough that the man would not soon let go but richmond could not easily be evaded fenton knew that well enough too he could run and he could fight as well as he could question fenton's momentary indecision settled the question at any rate for richmond came running up before fenton could flee well by jove you've decided to show up at last have you richmond called jovially i've been waiting two solid hours for you and i'm nearly frozen stiff if a milkman hadn't happened past i'd have been starved as well say you seem to have gone up in the world some old man some different from that highlander costume with broken egg-shells for stockings and he tapped fenton's white tie where in the devil have you been i'd like to know he took fenton's arm familiarly and walked toward the boarding-house where have you been fenton asked i have as good a right to ask as you he tried to shake himself loose but richmond held him close what are you chasing me for anyway he demanded sullenly because i want that story said the reporter the jewel robbery you know oh that was all a fake fenton began bosh but how about that locket fenton stopped suddenly well so far as that goes how about belle charmion who is she where is she 
What do you know about her? Where is the locket? What have you found out? Where did you go? Where can I find her? Richmond laughed and laughed. Say, you ought to be a reporter, not me. You could beat Li Hung Chang for questions. See here, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll swap you story for story. You tell me what you've been up to, and I'll tell you where I've been. Fenton hesitated. I'm afraid I can't, Richmond. You see, it isn't my story. It mustn't get into the papers. It's a question of honor. See here, old man, Richmond drew him down on the doorsteps. You don't seem to be on to this newspaper game. I'm as keen for news as anyone in the business, but I'm a gentleman as well, and when I give a promise, I'll keep it. Not a word will be published that you don't consent to. If you know anything about the ethics of the profession, you ought to know that any information is safer with a good newspaper man than with anyone else in the world. Why, the President of the United States tells things to correspondents in Washington that politicians would give their heads to know, and that confidence has never been violated in the history of journalism. I'll just remark that I'm straight. The reporter's manner put Fenton's mind at rest. After all, it would be a great relief to get such a man's help and advice. All right, he said. Go ahead first, though. Tell me about Belcharmian. Good. It isn't too much, old man, but here goes. It's this way. Early this forenoon, we got the tip from police headquarters that a man named Gordon Brewster had committed suicide in his house on West 72nd Street. There was something funny about it, and I was sent out on the story. The coroner had viewed the remains, and he had had the body removed to an undertaker's place on Broadway, because there was nobody there in the house. That's the first queer thing. The caretaker had skipped out while the cops were there. The only relative was his half-sister, your beauteous friend Belcharmian. What's the matter? Belcharmian is Gordon Brewster's half-sister, Fenton cried. Why not? Didn't you know it? Why shouldn't she be? Like an electric shock, the thought swept through Fenton's mind. The jewels, then, were perhaps Belcharmian's, stolen from her by her half-brother. But he dared not speak yet. Go on, he said. But he was almost too dazed, too occupied with this new light on the mystery, to listen to Richmond. Well, said the reporter, Miss Charmian was missing. Why? At first I scented some mystery, but it was simple enough. She and Brewster never did get on very well together, and they quarreled about two months ago, and Miss Charmian went with her maid to the Hotel Plaza and took a suite there. I found this out from a Harry Hay, who was Brewster's most intimate friend. Hay had heard that Miss Charmian was interested in settlement work down on the east side, and so I hiked down to see my friend, the middle-class girl I told you about, Mrs. Petrovsky formerly Miss Bessie Baker, for a tip as to Miss Charmian's probable whereabouts. Mrs. P. knows the whole east side, especially the uplifters connected with the settlement, and I finally caught Miss Charmian, as you saw. Now comes the funny part. You saw me meet her. I began to speak of her half-brother, but before I had a chance to tell her what had happened, and what I wanted, she asked me who you were. She wanted to know who I was? Fenton could scarcely believe it. Yes, and she took your address as well. I walked along with her, and we talked as we went. She said she was in a great hurry, going up town. But all the same, she had time to pump me about you. Well, I knew very little but your interest in the locket, which I showed her. She got excited when she saw it. I couldn't understand why, but I had no time to figure it out. I told her that her half-brother had sent me down to find her, and he wanted to see her immediately. She said that was impossible. She had an engagement that night. Going up to a reception at the Morgans, she said. Lucky I caught the name. Well, I didn't want to blurt it out that her half-brother was lying dead in an undertaker's shop on Upper Broadway. So I thought I'd break it to her easy. You know, let it out a little at a time. So I walked along, and she kept asking about you. We went down the subway entrance, and I bought two tickets just as a train came along. We ran for it. She had just time to slip in, and I was following right behind her, when a big fellow, 
came along behind me like he was shot out of a thirteen-inch gun. Bing! He bowled me over and my hat fell off. Bing again. The door was shut by the guard and the train pulled out. What do you know about that? Pretty lumpy work for a star reporter, eh? She got away? With the locket. Fenton stared at the reporter thoughtfully. And she wanted to know about me. Do you wonder I wanted to find you again? So you haven't seen Miss Charmion since? Fenton inquired, ignoring the remark. You wait. I telephoned to the office that I had fallen down on the story, and there was some rough talk from the city editor. He said he'd try to locate her somehow, and meanwhile he ordered me to look up a girl Gordon Brewster was supposed to be engaged to. One of our hotel men had phoned in that he had seen her in the King William Hotel, where she had registered as Miss Green. That looked funny, too, so I went after it. Say, I'd like to have omitted that. He passed his hand across his forehead. Fenton's heart sank with foreboding. He remembered the last glance the octoroon had given him. It was tragic in its despair. It could mean but one thing, he knew, and the question leaped to his lips. Suicide? For heaven's sake, how should you guess that? Richmond demanded. Oh, I knew her. Tell me about it. I asked for her, and the girl phoned up. No answer. Well, I had to see her. They rang again and again, and then I went up on the elevator with a cab driver who said Miss Green had cheated him out of his fare. The minute I reached the door, I smelled gas and suspected what had happened. I went down, got the hotel detective. We went back with one of the clerks, and they smashed the transom and put a boy through. Well, I've seen dead bodies enough. I ought to be used to it. But she got me some way. You say you knew her? Yes, said Fenton quietly. She was a wonderful woman, I think. Yes, I wonder if Brewster knew. You mean that she was not white? For God's sake, did you know? Richmond demanded. Nobody else ever did, so far as I can find out, in the wide world. She told me that she had Negro blood, Fenton replied. Yes, well, some people might have thought it merely ridiculous. The hotel clerk did. But somehow, she did have a fine face, you know and the expression was beautiful, exquisite somehow. I don't know, it made me feel like a kid. The old story, no color line in heaven, and all that sort of thing. Rich and poor alike in his sight. Confound it, I tell you, I couldn't think of anything but that, thank God, it was all over for her. The contempt and the scorn and the, oh well, everything. No, I couldn't laugh when I saw that pretty blonde wig twisted off her head, showing the nigger kinky wool underneath. I don't know, it was a piece of symbolism, I suppose, and the star reporter of the item, in his embarrassment at such sentimental confession, delved in his pocket for a cigarette. Fenton himself had too much to think about to speak. Richmond lighted his cigarette and blew out a cloud of smoke. Well, I wrote the story and sent it down to the office. There wasn't much that could be said. And as we couldn't find out anything from her about Brewster, it became absolutely necessary to get hold of Miss Charmion. Luckily, I remember that she said she was going to some reception at the Morgans. But what Morgans? Do you know that there are exactly thirty-five Morgans with residence telephones, not to speak of those in apartment houses whose names are not in the book? Well, I eliminated about twenty, and then began ringing up the other fifteen. It was after twelve that I found the right one, and had a talk with Miss Charmion. I had to tell her right out what was up. You can't mince matters much over a wire. Of course, she was terribly agitated to hear her half-brother was dead while she was at a reception, and she hung up before I could ask her when I could see her. I didn't have the nerve to call her up again, and I decided to wait till this morning to interview her. Now, Mr. Fenton, I'm ready to listen to your yarn. Let's come up to my room first, said Fenton, and he opened the front door and led the way up two flights of narrow stairs, past alcoves decorated with dusty plaster casts, along smelly, shabby little halls where they could hear lodgers still snoring, to a small bedroom on the third floor. As he threw open the door, he noticed a note on the floor that had been pushed under the crack. He stooped and picked it up, read it, then handed it to the reporter. 
Well, what do you think of that? he said in surprise. Richmond read it aloud. Will Mr. John Fenton be kind enough to call at number 300 West 72nd Street at his very earliest opportunity and greatly oblige Miss Belle Charmion? Well, he said, I thought she seemed remarkably interested. I suppose she wants to return the locket. Fenton shook his head. I'm afraid it's more serious than that, he said. By Jove, I can imagine what she thinks of me this time. See here, Richmond, I've got to tell you the whole thing now, anyway, and you've got to help me out. She wants to see me because she thinks I've stolen the Brewster family jewels. Richmond jumped off the bed in triumph. Aha, then that tale of yours wasn't a fake after all, he said. Well, did you steal them, old man? For a moment Fenton hesitated, studying the reporter's face. In it he saw, with all its sharpness and eagerness, a rare kindness and sympathy. He felt confidence in the man, and he needed a friend. With a quick gesture he took the leather bag from its hiding place and emptied the contents upon his table, out rolled the jewels, and spread in a glittering mass before the reporter's eyes. There, said Fenton calmly, how's that for circumstantial evidence? Richmond gasped. But I thought you said they had been stolen from you. Richmond, you may not believe it, I can hardly believe it myself. But I found these jewels three times this night, and lost them twice. Then, as the reporter's brown eyes drew together in an expression of incredulity, Fenton began with the story of the eventful evening. He told of his visit to the fortune-tellers, and of the raid, his discovery of the octoroon, and how she had confided the jewels to his care his escape to Sheffield Hall, and the story she had told him there of Gordon Brewster's death, how she and Harry Hay had carried the dead body to West 72nd Street, and of their subsequent discovery of Brewster's theft of the jewels. Then he narrated his own promise and attempt to deliver them, and his failure, the description of how he was chloroformed, robbed, and left in the pigeon loft, brought him to the Liars' Club, where he had first met Richmond. Ah, said Richmond, that restores my faith in my own powers of observation. I was sure that first tale of yours was true. You see why this story can never be printed, though, Fenton asked anxiously. I'm not a cad, Richmond replied simply. But go on. That's a pretty lively start. See if you can keep up the pace. Fenton smiled. Keep it up, he said. It isn't over yet. I won't wake up, probably, till I see Belle Charmion. He went on to tell of his visit with Elkhurst, alias Spruill, to the Astor Hotel, and of Mrs. Elkhurst's appearance and story, proving her husband to be one of the gang that was on the trail of the jewels. Her information had led him downtown to the St. Paul building, where he discovered the jewels with the murdered body of the bogus Count Capricorni. By Jove, Richmond cried there's a story anyway. I'll wire that in immediately over the phone. There's a good chance we can get a scoop on that murder for the first afternoon edition. And he was off downstairs to the telephone while Fenton restored the Brewster jewels to the velvet bag and pored over Belcharmian's note. At Richmond's return, Fenton completed the night's adventures with an account of his meeting Miss Charmian at the Morgan's reception and his afterward innocently handing over the jewels to the very gang that had been after them. Spruill Elkhurst's escape and his confiding of the jewels again to Fenton's care finished the narrative. And now, he concluded, what am I to do? I must return the jewels to Miss Charmian immediately, of course, but she will have to know that her half-brother stole them. I wish I could spare her that, for the sake of that poor girl who has just committed suicide. Richmond thought it over. Let's see, he began. You say that the caretaker, Flint, discovered the safe door open. Did he lock it? That's the question. He may have just shut it without locking the combination, and so it's possible for us to open the door. I don't say it's probable, but it's worth trying. See here, suppose I go with you to see Miss Charmian. I've got to talk with her anyway, and I'll see what I can do about it. We'll just wait our chance. It may come, or it may not. At any rate, you can trust me. He grasped Fenton's hand and shook it warmly. But if Miss Charmian should know the jewels are gone, 
She may have looked in the safe already, said Fenton. That's unlikely. Why should she suspect anything? She's much too disturbed, probably. Fenton pointed to the note. She's not too disturbed to write to me, at any rate. What else would she want to see me for? The locket, of course, said Richmond. There's some mystery there. You'd better tell me something more about it. Fenton briefly sketched his own remarkable biography, his life with the O'Sheas, and later with Dr. Hopbottom. Finally, he mentioned Sproul's story of the Courtney kidnapping, and his own memory of the little girl on the ferry boat. That's it. You are Bruce Courtney, and that little girl was Belle Charmian, of course, and she suspects, somehow, who you really are. By Jove, let's hurry. It's eight o'clock. She'll surely be up by this time. I want to see the denouement. Fifteen minutes afterward, Fenton, having plunged into a cold bath and changed his evening clothes for his own modest business suit, the two young men set out, blithe and enthusiastic, for West 72nd Street. Richmond discoursed upon the events of the night and the material he would find therein for stories for the item without violating the confidence of the dead octoroon. Fenton did not listen. His thoughts were only of Belle Charmian, whom fate, after having tossed across his path so many times, was perhaps now preparing to link still more closely to his life. He had gone far with his emotions that night, and now he found himself thinking of her as actually his. What else could mean that mysterious attraction he had felt when he first saw her portrait, at the thrill the first sight of her gave him, his agitation at the first sound of her voice. Belle Charmian, the name rang in his ears like a bell. Why, it seemed as if he had known her always. It seemed as if, when he saw her, words would be unnecessary, as if she too must know that they too were made for one another. And so he walked as if on air. Richmond's talk had turned to baseball and theatres. Fenton heard not a word. End of chapter 12